Hi, I'm Lynn Gray, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through our adults in our workforce program. Hi, I'm Dr. Stacy Hahn, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. We are diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are streamed on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archives. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They're posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of October 5th, 2021 is now called to order with co-chair Stacy Hahn on Teams. Member Snively, will you now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the pledge? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be filling in person for Member Hahn this evening. So um, please join me in a brief prayer and a moment of silence. Almighty God, as we continue to take steps in the direction of our purpose, we ask that you give us wisdom. We ask in faith that you will help us in very small and large decisions. We thank you for your continued guidance toward our purpose. Please align our hearts, our ideas, and our will with yours, for your ways are higher than ours and your plans are greater than ours. And nothing is impossible with you. Amen. <clears throat> Pledge of allegiance. Okay, let's go to the, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Please stand for the pledge. Okay, we have one withdrawn item today, <clears throat> 619, the piggyback uh, of the agreement between Kerasoft Technologies and Region 4 Educational Service Center. Um, right now, we need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Snively, and I have a second by Member Combs. Will there be any discussion? Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. And uh, Member Hahn? Yes, I approve. Okay, thank you. It's unanimous. Let the record reflect that all board members are present either in the boardroom or on remote. We have two sets of minutes today to be approved. August 24th, 2021 School Board Workshop. September 21st, 2021 School Board Meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Perez, a second by Member Washington. Will there be any discussion? 
Seeing none, please vote when your lights appear. Okay, uh, and Member Hahn? Yes, I approve. Okay, thank you. It's unanimous. <clears throat> Board members, I would like to go over the format of today's meeting. For precautionary measures, we are limiting attendance to 50 at this time, and we are practicing social distancing as much as possible. So we ask that guests in the boardroom keep one chair open between families. As a reminder, we are a nonpartisan board who believe all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Snively, will you now read the board guidelines? Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon's meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Um, first, please silent all, uh, silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind us that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on the live webcast on cable TV and on video monitors here in the auditorium. And I believe we have a video monitor outside as well for our um, public comment speakers this evening. Um, it can also be viewed with closed captioning in the online video archive. Thank you, Member Snively. <clears throat> we have one uh, item to be scheduled for time certain, 6 p.m., uh, employee input. Public comment. The board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and we'll keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking your time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board, comments are not direct, uh, directed personally against a board member or a staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. As a reminder of our way of work, we have allotted uh, 45 minutes uh, <clears throat> of public comment. At times like today, when there is an issue of great in interest, we, choose, we could choose to extend it to an hour. This afternoon, each speaker will have one minute. When there are 30 seconds left, you will see a yellow light at the lectern, on the lectern. A red light and a chime will indicate when your time is up. I will now call the first five speakers, and I do believe you're all ready. So, um, and good afternoon. Uh, Paula Castano, Damaris Bridges, Jessica Cohen, Dr. Kevin Stillwagon, and Holly Dillman. Oh, begin. Good evening, Paula Castano. Have you ever dreamed of winning the lottery? Do you know what winning the lottery for this district will look like? Community schools. We have schools that need our help. COVID has exacerbated the pre-existing issues, food insecurity, transient families, behavior issues, absenteeism, et cetera. When you have seen one community school, you've only seen one community school. But Gibsonton is a clear winner. Ms. Gilmore is a dynamic community school coordinator. Did you know Gibsonton has not lost one student from moves during COVID. This is not an accident. Hillsborough Public School Advocates was accepted to a National Community Schools Coalition a few days ago. Our partnership will bring thousands of dollars to these schools. The U.S. Department of Education said our funding can support these schools. Please create two to three more community schools, excuse me, <clears throat> demand our ESSER money. Please create a lobbyist sign-in just like the BOCC and set it as policy. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Damaris Bridges. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. One of the greatest tragedies I see of, of the COVID pandemic is that 
we've become increasingly more divided because instead of coming together to address a public health emergency, we have politicized it. I do not envy at all the position that you are in today as you reconsider the mask mandate and you consider extending it for another 30 days. But I do want to emphasize that masks do work. You yourself have seen data and it's been proposed and, and, ex and before the last board meeting, we know that it is effective. In addition to that, we know that our youngest members of our schools do not have access to vaccines yet. And so that still puts them at risk and it opts those parents out of the choice to protect their children at an additional level. And in spite of the fact that we are threatened with funding, I would say that you need to shout that from the mountaintops because our Board of Education our government is failing to apply for the funding that has been put before us in ESSER dollars. So I would focus on that as opposed to, yeah, sorry, I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jessica Cohen, followed by Dr. Kevin Stillwagon. Hey guys. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Cohen and I'm here to address the board. First of all, you should be very sad for the sign that you put out front stating that masks are required in the lobby in the boardroom. Based on what I see right now, that is not being enforced. Um, I have three children in the Valdrigo district with vaccines not available for children under 12 and how your new loose quarantining protocols, you are violating the rights of students with disabilities. Section 504 prohibits schools from discriminating against children like mine that are severely immune compromised. It is your job to make reasonable modifications that are in line with universal masking and social distancing. Once again, I urge you today to put yourself in my shoes. I ask you the question, if you had an immune compromised child, would you vote any differently today? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Holly Dillman. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Kevin Stillwagon, you are correct. And good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Kevin Stillwagon, I can't believe anybody would still be wearing a mask at this point. Clearly, masks do not stop the spread of an infection. Just read the box the masks come in. You have 380 trillion viruses inside of your body right now, and you will breathe 100 million viruses every day, whether you wear a mask or not. This virus infects you by attaching to what are called ACE2 receptors in your upper respiratory tract. Okay, It does this by using what's called a furin cleavage process, which works much faster and easier in the low oxygen environment created by wearing a mask. And prolonged mask wearing actually increases the number of ACE2 receptors. I would take these masks off the kids immediately if I were you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jessica Dubois, uh, Virginia Morrill, Michael Devine, and then James S. Ray Sr. And good afternoon. I'm Holly Dillman. I'm the wife of a combat wounded veteran mother and concerned Hillsborough County resident. I'd first like to thank Melissa Snively and Stacey Hahn for respecting the rule of law and my parental rights and entrusting that it is my sacred role as a mother to fully overseeing the health and wellness decisions for my child. Five board members are in gross violation of Florida state law, the parents' bill of rights, and Florida sunshine laws. You've abandoned your own oath and you have chosen to put your own personal and political positions and interests above the laws and above the rights of parents to choose what they know is in the best health care interest for their children, not what they feel. In closing, I leave you with this. This is my five-year-old son during dismissal two weeks after the start of the school. The school had unlawfully and without consent placed a covering over our son's airways. This is assault under the conditions of which you are directly responsible for facilitating. School employees cannot so much as even give my son a cough drop without my prior written authorization. You're in instructing our educators to enforce an unlawful mask mandate which essentially covers the mouths and noses of our children without our consent. My husband and I do not consent and we implore to Commissioner Cochran that the five board members who are in gross violation of Florida State law and my parental rights are removed, heavily penalized, Thank and you. stripped of their ability to serve in this capacity. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jessica Dubois. And good afternoon. My name's Jessica. I'm here representing Hillsborough Public School Advocates. 
Last school board meeting, I spoke about how COVID has exacerbated the inequities already present here in Hillsborough County. Today, I'm here to share some ideas and solutions for how we can close that divide. After speaking to and hearing from the Community Schools Coalition, there's a vast network of people in schools that have undergone the same struggles we're seeing here. Many people think wraparound services are the only need, but that's just one of six pillars. Leslie Hugh, one of the organizers in San Francisco, shared the most important ingredient is co-creation. Parents and students have a seat at every table, including conversations around curriculum and restorative practices. We have a lot of resources at our disposal, so let's stop postulating and assuming, and let's start listening to those parents and students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Virginia Morrell, Morrell, and then Michael Devine. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm a medical administrator by um, degree, and I can honestly say we've seen an increase in children visiting their pediatricians as well as ER visits over illnesses related to wearing the masks. We weren't made to breathe in carbon dioxide. This is what is happening to our little children. Their bodies are still developing. If we get sick, imagine them. And it affects them and their sight is dimmed. They're, they're, they're reduced hearing. They're experiencing shortness of breath. In their muscles, they experience tremors. Um, they experience drowsiness, mild narcosis, diagnosis. Uh, dizziness, confusion, headaches, and in some cases unconsciousness, but also they are, they, they experience an inability to focus. And these are children that are bright, that can focus. They're experiencing this. Imagine the children that already have illnesses that they're combating. So in that behalf, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll hear from Michael Devine, and then we'll have James S. Ray, Sr. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Devine. I have a son, Michael Devine, also. He's five. He's autistic, gifted. He has a gifted IQ, and he's um, registered at McKittrick Elementary in the regular classrooms. Um, t today, many school districts across the country have increased their funding for autism. Unfortunately, Hillsborough County has reduced their funding. You can look at CABS, you can look at FACT, so on and so forth. This has impacted a lot of children, including my own son. Unfortunately, I got some real bad news. Uh, my son was recently assaulted by two adults working for Hillsborough School System um, at McKittrick. Child Protective Services and the Sheriff's Office currently have this under investigation. Also, my son has been segregated away from his regular classroom and is forced to sometimes be with an aide by himself, even though it violates his IEP and his civil rights. I'm asking our school supervisor to step in and help. There's a huge problem at this school. He's been assaulted. He can't even go to school. It's unsafe. I, I'm begging you. He wants to be educated. Can you help? Thank you. Uh, I give you my business Jim card. Davis will we'll, uh, respond. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from uh, J.S. Ray and then follow. following that, we have them already lined up. Thank you. Uh, James, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to do this. I have developed a sanitizing program that will decrease the incidence of people catching uh, coronavirus and the flu, and the inhaled virus, most of it, and uh, probably between 30 and 60 percent. And it will save each school that's put in approximately $4,000 per school per month. And I would like to put that in one school to show what it will do and uh, let, let you be the judge. But this is based on hard data. I'm an engineer, I'm an ex-teacher. I've taught in, both in uh, science and, and uh, high school, physics in college while I was getting my Georgia Tech degree. So I am a combat vet veteran and I would just like the opportunity to, to talk to someone to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Anna Rivera, Luan Talbert, Amberlynn Rhodes, Pat Metcalf, and then Anika Verhijan. Um, 
Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as a retired teacher, after 38 years in education, all Florida, Puerto Rico, Las Vegas, Nevada, I'm just here to tell you that I am completely 100% opposed to those masks. The only thing those masks are uh, killing is the joy and the fun of the teaching and uh, learning process for teachers, students, and parents. And let me tell you, the day of judgment is coming. I know on what side I am. I'm asking you on what side you are at. Please think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Luan Talbert. Good afternoon, Luan. My topic today is not masking, excessive testing. As I mentioned weeks ago, our district is requiring that baseline and mid-year progress monitoring via computer. Computer-based tests take weeks to administer versus the days required by a paper pencil test. Ninth graders, for example, have already spent five hours taking baseline tests in computer labs this fall. They will spend another five hours in November and December taking mid-year prog progress monitoring right before semester exams. It remains to, to be seen what will pl play out in Tallahassee about our state mandated testing guidelines. But as public school advocates, we will fight against DeSantis' bogus testing plan because this plan benefits private testing companies, lobbyists, and will dismantle public education. High stakes testing, especially nonstop computer based testing, is just another nail in the coffin for public education. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Amberlyn Rhodes, Pat Metcalf, Anika Vahitian, and then Angie Smith. And oh, there you are. Good Hi. afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see all of you again. My name is Amberlyn Rhodes. I'm with Hillsboro Public Schools Advocates. And I'm here to talk about student and parent morale being low and simple solutions that we can think about to help with this. Um, first, you know, let's start with parents. Uh, we could send out a quarterly or monthly survey to understand the needs of parents at home. What are they struggling with? What's working? What's not working? Come up with solutions at home. We help the household and then that helps the student propel success as well. Secondly, our student morale is low. We know mental health has taken a hit due to COVID. An easy solution to help kind of get that started is doing infomercials, 30 second to minute infomercials talking about mental health during the morning talk shows. Again, easy solutions that we can implement to help. Lastly, middle schools are struggling. You know about Greco. I know we've already directed resources, but what about staggering the class release times and also doing block scheduling? This could help reduce conflict among students. Thank you so much. It's nice to see all of you. Take Thank care. you. <clears throat> Next, Pat Midcalf. Hi, my name is Pat Metcalf. Um, my background is in nursing and pharmaceutical sales, and we all have a common goal, and that's to eradicate COVID. I know we're all agreed on that. So let me ask you also a very important question. If there is a proven safe effective cure for COVID-19, would you agree to promote it and stop the mask mandate? Um, the logical answer is yes. There would be no need for a mask mandate. Um, I have news for you. There is an effective safe treatment for COVID-19. Did you know that a state in India named Uttar Pradesh, it's almost the size of the United States, has declared their state to be officially COVID-free? How did they do that? They eradicated COVID with a drug that has FDA approval for other indications, a 40-year safety profile, no known drug interactions, no kidney or liver issues. The drug is called ivermectin. I urge you to not choose to go on this, this mandate merry-go-round. If our goal is to eradicate the giant of COVID, we need to hit Goliath with a stone and cut off his head, and that stone is ivermectin. I ask you to vote for Hillsborough County to be the forerunner in stopping COVID by giving out free ivermectin kits, just as India did. The need for masks will be eliminated. Masks and experimental vaccines have not shown to eradicate COVID. Stop the vaccines. Vote for ivermectin. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Monika Vernagin, and then Angie Smith, Pat Hall, Laura Coulter, and Kelly C. And uh, good afternoon. Hi. Well, thank you. I'm here to ask for an extension of the mandatory mask mandate. Masks really work. It's two weeks ago, I received a phone call from the school asking to pick up my son because he had been exposed to COVID. I immediately went to the school, picked him up, and we went to the test facility. And tons of questions were racing on our mind. What if, what if, 
and my child was crying in the back of the car. What if he's positive and he has to go to the hospital? So yes, mask work because he was testing negative. And days later, we tested again, he was negative. And also the other children who were quarantined were negative. So we lucked out. And also the CDC tells us to continue to wear a mask in, indoors, whether we are vaccinated or unvaccinated to prevent the spreading of the highly contagious Delta variant. AAP is requiring universal mask of children in schools and the educators. So uh, we have to remain diligent. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Angie Smith. And good afternoon. Hi. I went to a football game last Friday at my daughter's high school. It was amazing to experience such a classic, honest-to-goodness American tradition that doesn't just happen anywhere else. It's kind of one of those things that's existing in Florida, going elsewhere. Um, this morning you spoke about the budget and how many students we've lost to charters and vouchers. The fact is the state legislature has created a parasitic system where charters and vouchers are allowed to suck dry our neighborhood schools. The schools with the marching bands and the cheerleaders that root for the whole neighborhood, not just the school itself, if they have a team. Private schools and charter schools don't contribute back to neighborhoods, but neighborhood schools have to cover their costs. How is this reasonable or fiscally sound? Privatization is handing our neighborhoods over to folks who refer to K through 12 as an industry. It makes us soulless. At the end of the day, we want to love our schools and our neighborhoods. As much as we love the Bucks, we love our school teams even more. So give our kids the stability, quality, and not just the choice to leave with their money from their own neighborhood. So our economy is... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Hall. Thank you. Um, I am here to sympathize with the coalition of no's that you're going to hear today. But what is much more important and much more critical is the bonfire of educational crises affecting children, parents, and teachers. No money from the state, not enough teachers, bus drivers, not enough space in crowded classrooms, student discipline issues in some schools, extreme poverty and food shortages in the district, and on and on. Diverse voices must be heard and respected. It is a difficult time to be a school board member nationwide. There's way too many bullies. Prioritize the varying needs of children throughout the district. The Board of County Commissioners, the cities of Tampa, Temple Terrace, and Plant City should have dialogue with the school district as we plan for the future with redistricting and boundary changes affecting thousands of children and people. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Laura. Laura Coulter, and good afternoon. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm not going to waste time or mince words. You know what you're doing is wrong. The science is on our side, and the burden of proof is on you in mandating such absurd, unscientific, and obviously detrimental strategies for a virus which boasts a more than 99% recovery rate. What you're doing is as delusional as putting a helmet on every kid every day to protect others from something randomly falling from the sky. You do not get to decide how I manage my child's health. I'm much better at it than you. Masks don't work unless your goal is to make people sick, destroy their dental health, which makes them more sick, and make them afraid of others and willing to comply with the next anti-science strategy. Lies and propaganda are just that. The case numbers are misrepresented and manipulated, and we all know it. The tests are not valid, and that's well known, too. Those who want to use those strategies should do so and feel protected. But forcing will not be tolerated in a free society. You are liable for causing untold physical, emotional, and psychological damage to our children. You are guilty of violating the laws and our constitutional rights. You are not doing this for any reason other than control and funding, and you should be ashamed of your actions. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, Kelly C., Cato, Tricia Dwyer, Jessica Schwindman, and then Elizabeth Thomas. And good afternoon. Hi, my name is Kelly Carling, and I'm a graduate of Harvard, as well as a full-time stay-at-home mother of four children attending Hillsborough Public Schools. And I just would like to say that the mask mandate is creating a really toxic environment in the school system. 
Um, we now know from data in Pinellas and Pasco County that didn't have a mass mandate versus Hillsborough that did have a mass mandate that these surges are cyclical and they recede on their own. So they naturally recede on their own. Um, what isn't reversible is the emotional and psychological harm that's being inflicted upon the children for long-term mask wearing. Now, my daughters are medically exempt. However, that seems to turn them into a target for bullying and harassment by students, teachers, and staff. Um, my daughter was asked to be to, asked to move her seat to the back rear of the classroom. No explanation provided, and other such abuses. <clears throat> oh. Time's up. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Hello, my name is Cato Carling. I'm. I am in third grade at Mabry Elementary. Please end the mask mandate today. Although, although I have a medical exemption, uh, it is difficult to hear what my classmates and teachers are saying when they are wearing a mask. Kids and teachers both pull their masks down, which completely defeats the purpose. Masks uh, cover up people's mouths, and half of communication is facial expression. How am I supposed to learn to... Um, and be an effective communicator when everyone's faces are covered up. Lastly, a covering kids' faces without studying the long-term side effects are, is reckless. We are not little adults. That's why we have our own pediatricians. My mom and dad don't co-parent with the government and the mask mandate today. Never bring it back. Follow the law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Okay, next, Kelly C., and then Cato. Is that correct? Oh, that was Kelly C. Sorry. Cato. And then Trisha Dreyer. And then Jessica. Come on up. And good afternoon. Hi, I'm Trisha. I'm not here as a parent today. I'm here as a, I was a registered nurse and I moved into holistic healing and I work with kids every day. And what I've seen in the last year has been like beyond disturbing with the anxiety and the self esteem issues, eating disorders, just to gain some kind of control in their life. This masking is not only a violation of the executive order of the governor, but it's child abuse. It's child abuse. That's what's happening here. And I'm just asking you all to really like look within and do what's right for the future of our country and our world. Um, you know, we all know that this is not about logic and science because masks do not work and Fauci has said it himself and we all know it. So this is nothing but a mandate for I don't know what. And we're watching politicians gathering and no masks and Met Gala and all these things happening with no masks. We're forcing them on our kids. And teachers are literally forcing them on kids. So that's a lawsuit. So this has to change. This has to stop. I cannot watch this anymore. It's horrible. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Trisha Dreyer. Oh, that's OK. I'm one behind. All right, Jessica. All right. Did, which one? Tina you, oh, yeah, she's going to be later on today. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you, Trish. Uh, my name is Jessica Twineman. Uh, my daughter is a student at Coleman Middle School, and I can say I'm here to speak for her. She is struggling more this year because she, it's distracting. Having the mask on is causing anxiety between all the students and all of her friends. Um, you know, it is my job to protect my daughter. It is a do my doctor's job to keep her healthy. And it is your guys' job to provide her with an education. I think you are overstepping and not staying in your lane. And I believe we should all have the choice whether or not we should be wearing the masks. Sorry, I'm really upset about this. So, um, My doctor even confirmed that Children are poor hosts of the virus, and lack of oxygen is destroying their brains and not helping them learn. Um, I just am asking you to do your job. Okay, thank you very much. Next, Elizabeth Thomas, and followed by Priscilla Vega, and there's two children with her. And good afternoon. Thank you, Jessica. 
I'm Elizabeth Thomas, a parent. I am here along with several others representing mothers, fathers, guardians, children, and voters who value parental choice regarding medical interventions for our children. You took an oath. I hereby solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Florida. Several of you compromised that oath when you chose to infringe on the rights granted by the U.S. Constitution, Florida's Par Parental Bill of Rights, and the Department of Health's requirements. <clears throat> We the people expect you to uphold the highest of standards when it comes to parental rights. Every parent and guardian should have the right to navigate harms and evaluate risk based on their health situations. Your removal of parental choice from the mask policy is an affront to the rights granted to us and our youngest citizens. I urge you to reconnect with that solemn oath and the laws you as elected officials agree to uphold in order to maintain public trust. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay, next we'll have Priscilla Vega with two children and come on up. Almost three. Almost, oh, whoa, Isn't yes. Who goes first? My no, turn. no, you, you go right ahead. We might have to pull the microphone a little closer. Okay, sweetheart, go ahead. Hi, my name is CJ. I'm a third grader. I want to tell you how much I hate wearing these masks every day. They are uncomfortable and I can't breathe in them. My teacher yells at me if I pull them down. I've been yelled at for the type of mask I have on my face by many teachers at my school and bullied for not wearing it outside in the car line. I even got an infection on my face from having to wear this thing all day. It makes me angry and it makes me sad that this is now supposed for us to be wearing this thing. I can barely understand what's being taught in my class, not being able to see my teacher's face and expressions. I am tired of getting in trouble for not wearing a mask like a criminal or something. Yesterday, I told my principal no more mask. I refuse to put this mask back on again. And thank you. Excellent job, ZJ. Next, we will have Mia. And Hi. <laughs> Go ahead, sweetheart. Hi, my name is Mia Nathaniel, and I want to tell you to get rid of this mask minute now. I have been bullied since the start of school for not having the mask on, and af because in the first week of school, I I got my mo my ma <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I got my desk moved away because I didn't have my mask on because I was too close and I wasn't being safe. After the we had to get the mask mandate. And so if I um, had masks with holes and, um, and my teacher, I got in trouble for not having the mask on and um, I got told on by one of my classmates and so they told me to put on a different mask but I refused and I got sent to the principal's office and I think this mask mandate is ridiculous. So I'm asking you to get rid of this mask mandate now. Thank you. Thank you. And next it will be mom who will speak. Yeah, I know. We have some great speakers tonight and their children. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> My name is Priscilla. I'm a parent here advocating for parents' choice. I brought with me today several parents that are fed up with every one of you that have been working against the best interest of our children. I am demanding all of you get into compliance with the current emergency order and eliminate the mask mandate immediately. Science has nothing to do with the decision to make our children comply with this. I come to tell you that we are now gathering together, we are filing suits and doing all we can legally to get you to either comply with this or we're gonna demand resignation immediately. Masking children in school for seven hours with no break while the rest of the state is free is preposterous. Football games have thousands of people and not one person is distancing and wearing a mask. In fact, none of you leaving this place in our open state are wearing your mask. My kids, in the name of science, must comply, comply with this. Pasco and Pinellas haven't had a mandate this year, and yet children aren't dropping dead in the streets, and their numbers are relatively the same as ours, due to the high recovery and ineffectiveness of masks. I'm more concerned with the depression and the suicide increase among our children, the psychological effects, interference with their ability to learn properly, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, next, we're going to have a little bit of a different order here. We'll have Joel. Come on up, Joel Murray. We have Cindy Vilches, followed by Christina Sullivan, and then to Sandra Meyer. And there we go. Uh, and good good afternoon. Check in to see if it's evening yet. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Joel Murray, and I'm advocating for a parent's choice with masks as well. I'm just asking the school board to use common sense when it comes to considering getting rid of this, okay? As my wife said, um, you can go to a Bucks game, you don't have to wear a mask. You, the kids can go to their football games, they can go to their dance, they're not wearing a mask. But when they go to school, it's quite a different story. Now they have to put a mask on, which does not make them feel comfortable about going to school, having something covering their face all day. It's not natural for us to wear a mask. God did not create us with a mask on our face. Apparently, it seems that some people feel like they're superior to the governor, the surgeon general of the state, or the superintendent disobeying their orders. And most importantly, they're much smarter than parents because parents are not allowed to make the choice whether their kid wears a mask or not. It's violating our rights. It <clears throat> needs to stop. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Cindy Vilches, Christina Sullivan, and then Sandra Meyer. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, board members. I'm here today as a parent who is concerned with the board's freedom to override state laws and parental rights. Mask mandates were implemented by this board under the rules of health, knowing that kids are having lunch unmasked, are partaking in their everyday extracurriculars, and sports unmasked. You made quarantine a parental choice because it looked bad on your records that children weren't being educated based on your irrational isolation rules. So why are masks not a parental choice as well? By voting to mandate a mask, you are telling your constituents, I feel entitled to overrule your parental rights. No one should have the authority to impose their will on someone else's child. And that includes this board. To be clear, I am not anti-mask. I am anti-mandate of any kind, whether it's masks today or vaccinations, tomorrow, or vaccinations tomorrow. I am pro-parental rights. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Christina Sullivan, and then followed by Sandra Meyer, Lisa Schaefer, Aubrey Dunlap, and good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, board. I'm here to respectfully ask that you vote to rescind the mask requirement in direct violation of HB 241 and 64 DER 21-15. I was here a few weeks ago when you voted to mask our children again. The next morning, I gave my boys the choice. Why, while I fight for parental choice, I will not impose my choice upon what goes on their bodies. One chose the mask, the other did not. Both went to school knowing how medical freedom works. I'm here for another reason today, too. The last time I was here, I said, quote, today we're discussing a mask mandate. Tomorrow may be the mandate of a faulty vaccine with a high degree of immune escape and adverse reactions. Well, guess what happened in California last week? They mandated the COVID-19 for children to attend school, phasing in with FDA approval by age group. Zero parental choice. So it begins. Parents listening, a government will always create an emergency, emergency to impose their agenda on your babies. We need a backbone to keep our children safe, not government mandated face coverings and injections. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sandra Meyer, then Lisa Schaefer, and good afternoon. My daughter got COVID two weeks after you put the mask mandate in place. This is not because of those who opted out, because it was too soon for anyone to have those medical opt-outs in place already. She got, the, uh, she got COVID because she was forced to handle a mask all day long, taking it on and off to eat or drink or um, whatever she, task she had to do. And there's no time for students to wash their hands properly in the classroom. There's rarely any soap in the dispensers. I was a former teacher. I resigned this summer because I don't agree with the way things are handled. Do you understand that many of these students who are forced to wear a mask for months will develop severe anxiety orders? I already see it in preteen girls and teens. They wear the masks as a security blanket now to hide how they look. You're going to see big behavior issues in the future if you continue this, if you don't, uh, compared to what we already have. Also, cases have gone down across the entire state, whether there's been a mandate in place or not. So don't use that tonight as a reason to vote to extend this, because they've gone down equally the same across the state. It's done its time. The virus has passed through. It's time to give us our choices back. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Lisa Schaefer. 
Aubrey Dunlap, Allison Fernandez, and then Sharon Graham. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am also here to speak up for parents' rights, my right to make decisions for my children, medical and otherwise. The mask mandate needs to be brought to an end and never reinstated ever. The kids still get COVID, even with a mask. There will never be zero risk in life. Only about 10 counties have imposed this on their children in Florida. The data is out there. You choose not to look at it. Burying your heads in your politics instead of looking around at the real life evidence is shameful at least and downright catastrophic if we look at the cognitive and psychological damage. My children have been brave in fighting this mask mandate every day in their schools, but they shouldn't have to. They are doing their part to fight your illegal abuse of power, and so I come today to speak up and do my part in this fight. Remove the mask. Stop the damage you're causing. If not, we will continue to fight you through every legal avenue available. We're watching you. You have shown us that you're not to be trusted with the well-being of our children, and we say no more. Thank you. Next, Aubrey Dunlap, and then Allison Fernandez, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of Parents' Rights. My son has an IEP and was in speech. The ability for his teachers and peers to see each other's faces and social cues is pivotal for his and all children's development. During each IEP meeting, I am asked for my input and consent for every implementation of his education plan. They do not get to override me or suggest medicating him or make any other medical decisions. Masking should be no different. Thank you. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Allison Fernandez, followed by Sharon Graham, and then Deborah Seltza. And good, evening, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Allison Fernandez, also here for Parental Rights. Um, I want to know, you have been told over and over again, oh, just wear the mask, it's not a big deal, if it saves even one child, et cetera, et cetera. But what you're doing doesn't save anybody, it doesn't stop any transmission, and it actually does cause very real harm. And I am concerned about that. If we're actually looking at the whole student and preparing students for life, we need to be looking at the pros and cons and doing what's in the best interest of the student. Um, we've got an enormous budget shortfall of $61 million we're trying to bridge with ESSER funds that won't be here in a few years. We've got issues at various schools, uh, Greco Middle School comes to mind, that we really need to be addressing. And this, we please can we let this go now? Let parents have the choice. We're not saying don't do it, let them choose. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Sharon Graham, then Deborah Seltza, and then Tina Williams. And good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and school board members. I'm Sharon Graham, a therapist, and I began my private practice here in 2012. You have a sacred obligation to uphold evidence-based protections for the children and staff in your care. Masks are working. Don't remove this effective policy, please, because the numbers are beginning to decrease. That's the reason we should keep it in place until public health officials determine we can safely lift it. You have a sacred obligation to make difficult and unpopular decisions, to be courageous in the face of opposition to science and corrupt leaders who are withholding taxpayer funds from our children. Please stand firm. You have a sacred obligation to uphold public health in the face of those who value their own convenience more than the lives of others an obligation to follow research that shows this variant to be more highly transmissible and more prevalent among children than the original strain. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah Sitzer and then Tina Williams. And good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. I'm a parent and I have a PhD in psychology. Thank you for mandating masks and for listening to medical experts like the CDC and AAP. We need a mask mandate extension especially with a voluntary quarantining policy. Masks are supported by the Florida Teachers Union and 60% of Florida parents, according to the Quinnipiac University poll. No legitimate study has found any harmful mental health effects of masking children. The CDC has shown that masks are effective in school. Community transmission rates are still considered high by the CDC. While hospitalizations are falling, they're still higher than our last peak in January. We need to keep the mask mandate in place 
until we're at 5% positivity for at least two weeks, according to the World Health Organization. The CDC states that the most effective strategies are vaccinations, masks, physical distancing, and screening testing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tina Williams, followed by Alan Brewster, and then Matthew Kenna, uh, Tegan Kenna, and then Megan Collins. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. Once again, I come before you. Today I want to talk about IEPs and the lack of implementation. I have spoken to everyone from the regional area superintendent, the ESC coordinator at the district level, the principal, the assistant principal, the case manager. I have been fighting this fight for six years now. I would like someone to address, I filed state complaints, district complaints, why a plan that was put in place for my child is blatantly being ignored. My daughter is on the autistic spectrum. She's very high, she's very smart. There are things put in place and no one is following. I've, you know, once again, Mr. Davis, I've asked to speak with you. My concerns require more than a minute, more than two minutes. You still have refused to speak with us. I'm a parent, I also have a master's in psychology, social work, I've done the work. I gave it all up to be a stay at home mom and my daughter's IEP, even to this day, still is not being followed. Superintendent Davis, can we go ahead and uh, have a discussion with her? Thank you. Next will be Alan Brewster, followed by Matthew Kenna, Tegan Kenna, Megan Collins, and good afternoon. Alan Brewster, board members, superintendent. I want to once again talk about leadership in the schools, ineffective leadership. Students should not feel apprehensive scared, stressed out about going to school, bullying, erratical behavior from other students in the classrooms preventing learning. Once again, where's the district leadership? I've called them, I've spoken with them, where is it? There needs to be some accountability with the principals at the schools making ineffective decisions. Come on, where's the leadership here? Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Matthew Kenna. Hello, my name is Matthew Kenna. I'm under no false pretense that the comments here actually do anything is regarding affecting the board's decision. I already know your decisions are made on the mandate. I firmly oppose that mandate. When a government becomes tyrannical, become ungovernable. That's kind of the lesson that we've really learned this year. And how do we do that? That's through nonviolent civil disobedience. Simply don't comply. This unlawful mandate, it starts with parents. It starts with us. We can put an end to this. And having courage for our, our children is contagious. For my children, when they don't wear their mask to school, my hope is that they provide courage to other students to take off their mask, mask as well. And for parents, I urge you, please, they're taking away parental rights. They have, they have no ability to do this. Please stand up and show courage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, uh, Matthew Kenna. Oops, sorry, Tegan, sorry, out of order. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Tegan Kenna, and I'm here to address the school board on the mass mandate that is directly impacting me. This school board has been forcing teachers and admin staff to enforce an unconstitutional mandate to requiring every student to wear suffocating fabric on their faces for eight hours a day. Because heaven forbid they see our faces, right? They have produced and delivered stigma, and now whenever someone like I goes into their classes with an uncovered face, they believe I am unhealthy and they believe I am a harm to others. Not only that, but I feel like teachers try to gang up on me and use public humiliation in an attempt to make me give in to their beliefs. As if that wasn't enough, they send me to the office, just like many other students, to make me wait 30 more minutes just to get ridiculed even more and told by an officer, shame on you. Does this seem like a good environment for kids? This is your job to make sure you're protecting us and making sure our mental health and our physical health is a top priority. This is my body, not yours. Keep your hands off me. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Megan Collins, Christy Domboski, and then Bianca Mize. And good afternoon, Megan. 
Good afternoon. My name is Megan Collins, and I'm here advocating for parental choice. First, I'd like to again thank Ms. Snively and Ms. Han, Vaughn, Han for not breaking the law and protecting our parental rights. I've been at almost every single board meeting since May. I feel like every time I come, myself and several others are asking for the same thing. For you all, sorry, not all, most of you to stop breaking the law. By you mandating masks, you're in violation of Florida state laws, the Parental Bill of Rights, and Florida Sunshine laws. But you guys already know that. We're no longer asking for our rights back, we're demanding them back. We will not comply, and I have not complied since the start. Please let me leave this building today, go home to my seven-year-old, and let him know his rights are protected. I say this to every parent out there sending their kid in a mask that does not want their child masked. Stop complying. We are done. Thank you. Next, Christy Dembroski, Bianca Mize, Jacqueline Muir, and good afternoon, Christy. Good afternoon. I'm here. Uh, as a parent and a teacher to remind this board that you work for the we the people of Hillsborough County and we the parents expect you to honor our rights. We will no longer tolerate your unlawful irresponsible decision making. We demand that you stop pretending you have the authority to continue this child abuse under the pretense of health and safety. The truth is you know this is wrong. You know there's no data to support it. You know that you don't have the authority to continue this, and you know you're in violation of the Parents' Bill of Rights. Furthermore, you are in direct defiance of Governor DeSantis, Commissioner Corcoran, and other state officials that have told you over and over again that it's parents' decision. You don't have control over what happens outside of school. Parents make the decision for their kids' safety, so why do you think that you should make these decisions during the school day? Also, I am for it peaceful non-compliance. My children are in high school and they are non, not complying, but this is really harmful to the young children who are afraid to not comply and want to please their teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Bianca Mize, Jacqueline Muir. And good afternoon. Hello. The Florida Department of Education in September updated their COVID-19 protocols stating that mask wearing for students is to be at the sole discretion of the parents. Florida Department of Health came out recently stating that there was no difference in cases between masked and unmasked counties. Hillsborough County is the only county in this area still mandating masks for children. Practically every place you go in Hillsborough County, there are no mask requirements. Stores, restaurants, malls, and sporting events have hundreds to thousands of maskless individuals. Kids literally leave their mask classrooms and go straight into the sporting events, and they're standing shoulder to shor shoulder, breathing uh, on each other, sweating on each other even many times. Constitutionally and ethically, parents have a right to choose what is best for the children. Adults are maskless while our kids have to sit for up to six hours a day, not able to breathe in oxygen, which is the most fundamental right. The ability to breathe freely, and it is being denied by you guys. Masks have grave negative impact on children, including physically, psychologically, and developmentally. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Mura, Michelle Fava, Shannon Aitkins, and good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Muir. I spoke last time. I let you know that I went to Hillsborough County Schools. I worked in Hillsborough County Schools, and I own an after-school program that serves the schools. I wasn't going to talk mass because we got enough of that. But if you want to do, like, an example of my program, we've had many, many kids go into quarantine and, like, miss multiple days of school, and then guess what? None of them ever test positive. And you know what? At my after-school program, I'm not a mask police. If they wear it, they wear it. If it falls off, it falls off. Sometimes it goes in the toilet. I'm not giving them a new one. But guess what? We're surviving, we're thriving, and we're meeting the kids where they're at. That was not my point. My point today is 437. Do you know that number? That's how many teachers you need in Hillsborough County. That's a bigger problem than the mask. 437 teachers. We're on week six at Walker Middle School, and my daughter has had no teacher. She's now on Florida Flex, learning Spanish virtually. Starting today, 437 teachers. How are we going to get solutions? We need solutions. This Apple track, trying to apply through that, people are like annoyed. They just want to go to the principal, meet the principal, shake hands and say, hey, I'm good people, hire me. Thank you. Next, Michelle Fava, Shannon at Aikens, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm back. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I really don't want to be here. I actually left my mother at the hospital, not COVID related, to be here. I transferred my kids out of school uh, to a different school so they didn't have to wear a mask. And that's why I keep coming back. 
I feel very passionately about this, okay? And it still shocks me that the board arbitrarily stripped parents of their rights. It's shocking, okay? What I would like to do here is hopefully wake up some of those parents who don't have the wherewithal to be here right now and say to those parents who say, well, it's okay because my, my child's getting used to wearing a mask. That's the biggest problem. If you're okay with your child getting used to wearing a mask, that's a problem in our society and we don't want, don't want our kids to be used to wearing masks. This has got to stop. You have no rights. These are our rights to make these decisions on behalf of our kids. You guys cannot do this. We have the Parents' Bill of Rights for this purpose. So you need to stay in your lane and worry about the educational needs of our kids and let us parent our children. Thank you. Next, Shannon Aikens, Jennifer Hart, Luke Larat, and Sarah Edwards. And that will conclude our public comment. Shannon. Hi, my last name is Adkins. Adkins. Um, I just wanna, I, I think you guys have heard it from everybody, but I do wanna at least talk to you about um, the toxic environment that our kids are in. in. You know, um, my son is in high school and there is a teacher that he specifically has that has shower curtains around her desk mm. the, and she still wears a mask. So in that particular class, nobody's learning anything because there, there's no classroom management. Because of this mask mandate that you think that you're keeping our kids safe, which isn't the case, because it COVID attacks inflammation, kids don't have inflammation, kids are getting tuberculosis because they're wearing masks, but it has nothing to do with that. So stop the toxic, toxic environments and allow our kids to be kids. Let the teacher smile at them. Let the kids smile at the teacher. Let them build that bond. Right now, there isn't any of that happening, zero. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Jennifer Hart, Luke LaRote, and then Sarah Edwards. I did not plan for one minute, so I'm just going to talk fast. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm here today, although it's during public comment as an HCPS teacher, as well as a parent. First, I'd like to quickly address the mask mandate. I've been teaching third graders wearing masks since January, and I have to say that really the kids are okay. They're fine. They're all right. They're getting along. Wearing a mask all day can be annoying and uncomfortable, but it is not traumatizing. We need to stop saying that asking a child to wear a mask is abusing them. What an untrue and harmful thing to say. Um, so please continue with the mask mandate. It's keeping students healthy and in school so they can learn. Next, I'd like to talk about the real number one cause of learning loss right now, and that's the systematic underfunding of public schools in Florida. The Florida Department of Education is still sitting on millions of dollars in ESSER funds that were meant to be dispersed to us. They are literally starving our school district of resources. I would encourage any of you that have not already to take a strong public stand about what the Governor and Department of Education are doing with these ESSER funds. We could also be educating parents and public, sending calls to action to teachers, engaging all these voices we have access to to put pressure on Tallahassee. I think it would mean a lot to teachers. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your service too. Um, Luke LaRote. Madam Chair, members of the board, distinguished colleagues. My name is Luke LaRoe and I have the privilege of representing scores of parents challenging the mask mandate that you're considering here today. It's been a long time since I've ever had the privilege of working with so many people that exhibited the level of passion that I've seen in these parents that are vehemently opposed to what you adopted. And I say that because I see all the different arguments, all of the different concerns, but from my perspective, all I want you to do is follow the law. The most important thing we can teach our children is that our country, no matter how uncomfortable or unpopular or scientifically challenging it may be, we still follow the rule of law. And I've been following all of the developments related to these particular issues, and I know that coming up on the 7th, and I just printed this out today, uh, there's a meeting in Tallahassee, and essentially it says that you... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Edwards. Hi, I'm a public health specialist and mom of two kids in the Hillsborough County Schools. Thank you for your efforts so far to keep our kids safe. We are so close to being able to vaccinate our young children and give them the same chance at reduced infection and hospitalizations that we vaccinated adults have enjoyed for months. 
My ask of you today is to hold steady and keep choosing the health and safety of all over the personal preferences of a few. Keep mandatory masks in place until these kids can be vaccinated. While the downward trend of cases is a relief, we are by no means out of the woods. According to CDC, the county remains in the high category for community transmission. And this means, and I quote, everyone in Hillsborough County should wear a mask in public indoor settings. Masks work, and not only do we have a large controlled trial that's now proven this, but we have seen masks work right here in our county schools. In quoting your own communication of September 9th, we saw a 58% decrease in impacted students and staff from August 20th when masks were mandatory. As you know, AAP and other experts have not found any psychological or developmental impacts of masks on kids. Please listen to the science and keep masks in place. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this concludes public comment. This concludes public comment, and now we will go to recognitions and proclamations. Um, and we want to thank the public also for their commitment and their values in sharing with all board members this evening. Um, <clears throat> AO1, Adoption of Proclamation Global Diversity Awareness Month, October 1st, 2021. Madam Chair, yes. may I make a um, request? Absolutely. Um, may we move 501 up to the front of recognitions and proclamations? I think I know why, because... Please. Go ahead. Absolutely. All right. Pretty please. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, well, here we go. Approved... Thank you, um, <laughs> Member Snively. <clears throat> Approved the naming of the King High School baseball complex after coach Jim Macaluso and I believe Superintendent Davis and Shake Washington will present this proclamation. Yes, Mayor, the chair. Thank you so very much. This is an opportunity for us to name the King High School baseball complex after coach Macaluso. He is a native of Tampa. He has been in, he also was an educator educated in Tampa and Hillsborough County Public Schools. He graduated at, uh, from King High School. I think it's 1966. At the same token, he went on to uh, obtain his bachelor's deg degree in physical education and his master's degree in education from the University of Tampa. You know, Coach Nay was named the head coach at King in 1976, and then he worked as assistant coach at Hillsborough High and also at Brandon High School in Florida College. Uh, coach Mascaluso has also been at uh, King High School, and he, while he was there, he did so much. And I, and uh, you know, board member Washington's going to talk about all the accolades. And while he was there, 163 athletes went on to play collegiate baseball, I believe. So uh, at this time, uh, member Washington, if you'll talk about some of the highlights, as this recommendation is for a awesome man and a great coach. Thank you, Superintendent. I tell you, he is a very awesome person. Uh, during, during the past 46 years at King High School, Coach Michael Lucid teams have compiled a record of 640 wins and 440 losses. His teams have won 12 district championships, three regional championships, along with one Western Conference championship, one sectional championship, three Tony Saladino championships. The Lions advanced to the Florida High School Activity Association State Championship Final Four for three three times. Something else, 167 former players played college baseball. 53 former players have played professional baseball and four have played in the major leagues. And I've had the opportunity to work with Coach Mike all, over all these years. And I can, I can tell you, he is definite for students. Because if, I, I tell you what, all if you if you were in a Coach Michael Lucer class, raise your hands. <laughs> it speaks for itself. All all those in this class. So, Coach Michael Lucer, I'm, I, I am proud and honored uh, to have this bestowed upon you because you have done a great job for 46 years, and I've known you as a person of of character, integrity. So, I, I really appreciate this, and I'm very happy for you, Coach Mike. So, well, let's give a, <laughs> obviously a big round of applause. And I, I believe, uh, would you like to come forward, Mr. Michael? The first we need to, oh, okay. Uh, board members, I need a, a motion and a second. No, you can start getting up. I need a motion and a second. 
Yes. I have a motion by Member Perez, a second by Donia Cohn. Any discussion? And here we go. For first, we want to hear from you. You come on up. Jake, do you want to go up there with him? And uh, no? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I thought. First of all, that big fan club he brought this evening. Man, I see it in the crowd. First of all, I want to thank Superintendent Davis and honorable board members for this recognition. I would also like to thank my family, <clears throat> friends, colleagues, players, all my former administrators for supporting me in the last 47 years of coaching at King High School. I would like to recognize the efforts of my present principal, Arlene Costelli, for spearheading this endeavor. Thank you. Also, special thanks to my assistant principal and athletic director, Mr. Michael Warren, and both of them have done a tremendous job at King High School. A special... <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Special thanks to board member Shaky Washington. Uh, we taught together for 16 years and were personal friends and family. I'm also grateful to all the community of Temple Terrace and the Keene Heights District. And I want you to know that this is a tremendous honor and I thank you. I spent 47 years teaching and coaching at King High School and three years as a student. So a big portion of my life is King High School. So thank you all very, very, very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your commitment. We do have a board comment. Um, a member Perez? Oh, okay. Oh, that's a second? Oh. All right. So we're going to go ahead and vote at this time. Board members, please vote when your lights are on. Member, I'm sorry to interrupt, Member Gray. Um, I think d uh, that Sheikh Washington really should be the person to make the motion since he was so involved in this. I think he should have the opportunity to make the motion to approve this item. And Member Perez, who attended King High School, I believe, wanted to support him by seconding that motion. So um, if, if could we please uh, change the record or update the record to reflect that? Could you just withdraw your motion? Okay, Ms. Perez, oh, who made the motion? I'm not sure who made the motion originally. Might have been Member Perez. Okay. okay. Are you okay with Member Washington making the... Ms. Perez, may I so Ms. Perez withdraws her motion, Mr. Washington. Okay. Yeah, make a motion. Uh, make a motion to to approve this agenda item. I would like to make a motion to approve this general, general, <clears throat> general item for Coach Michael Lusa. Okay, and, and, and I will second it. Okay, now we're good to go. Um, all right, uh, board members, let's vote when your lights <coughs> are on. We'll get through this. Okay, and Member Hahn? Uh, yes, I approve. Okay, it's unanimous, so. <laughs> and uh, not that we want to get rid of you, but if you'd like to be adjourned, you certainly. You can? You want photos. you want some photos? Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, photo op. So let's go ahead and do a photo op. Uh, yep. Member Washington, would you like to go up there and make a photo? And, and any, uh, any comments, uh, board members? Member Perez? Yes, I remember you from high school. I, I, I was a student, <laughs> actually. Um, I was a student of your, both yours and um, Shake Washington. So, you know, if you guys bring up any more, I'm going to have my whole, um, you know, all my teachers here. Uh, Some time with you, Coach. But, yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you've done for our students here. Um, you know, thank you for, for you know, the, the professionalism that you've brought to our, for, with the future because I know my um, fellow students, we have 
um, believe it or not, we're coming up on our 40th um, of a high school reunion. And, um, you know, when we look back at the teachers that affected change, I know your name comes up. I know um, we talk about you um, in a good way. And so to see you here today, you know, I'm really excited. I'm excited for this to happen, for um, for this, this your name to go up as part of King High School. And um, But thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, uh, Member Perez. Uh, heartfelt thanks from the board members to each uh, each year that you served and your commitment to children. You changed so many lives. Uh, we, you know, you did. Coaches are such great teachers, and teachers are such great coaches, and you've been both. So uh, we are we're just enamored. Uh, a pleasure to be here. Would you mind uh, that we take a photo uh, at this time? I think. Uh, Sheikh, the best way, I think, because you tell me, would you like your family in the photo to the best of your ability? Because we can make this work. Yeah, so let's go ahead and get them up. Everybody and who wants to get in. Everyone who wants to get in, let's get this. What are we going to do? We're going to do that. Let me go outside with him. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Where's uh, Addison? He's got to go to the bathroom. Yes, do a recess. I got to go to the bathroom. Uh, we're going to recess for two minutes and then we got to get on with the show. Recess for two minutes.
Board members, Member Combs. Oh boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to go ahead and initiate. I know I, my wife said that. She said, you better not cry with Okay. <clears throat> you know. Uh, our next a great guy though, really. part of the program he really is a nice guy. Is the recognitions and proclamations. Um, and first off, we have the adoption of proclamation, the Global Diversity Awareness Month. This will be presented by Member Combs. And Member Combs, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Gray. Global Diversity Awareness Month honors all the ethnicities, heritages, languages, customs, abilities, and life experiences of our students and staff in Hillsborough County Public Schools. Recognizing Global Diversity Awareness Month helps our school community grow and appreciate the diversity around them. It also helps them contribute to a global and multicultural world. To fully embrace our mission of preparing students for life, it is imperative to engage the cultural capital and the rich diversity that each learner employee brings. Some of the ways our district celebrates Global Diversity Awareness Month is by connecting with people from different places, learning about another culture, and making a concentrated effort to stay informed about what's going on around the world. Thank you, Member Combs. <clears throat> I need a motion and a second to approve the Global Diversity Awareness Month, October 1st, 2021. I have a motion by uh, Member Perez, second by Member Washington. Will there be any discussion? Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. And unanimous. And uh, Member Hahn? I approve. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Adoption of Proclamation National Bullying Prevention Month. Uh, Member Snively, will you present this proclamation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Bullying is unwanted aggressive behavior that involves a real or perceived power imbalance. Bullying can include making threats, spreading rumors, attacking someone physically or verbally. It can also take place through technology, which is known as cyberbullying. Hillsborough County Public Schools takes bullying very seriously. The school board is committed to providing an educational setting that is safe, secure, and free from harassment and bullying for all its students and staff. A reporting system has been created to identify, report, investigate, and respond to situations of bullying and harassment in our schools. You can find the anonymous online form to report bullying at hillsboroughschools.org backslash bully prevention. Our district tries to prevent bullying through social and emotional behaviors like social and community circles, seven mindsets, and restorative practices. Our amazing student services teams at each school provide individual counseling and support to students and start with Hello Week, which was in September, helps to address bullying and teach compassion to our students. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. I need a motion and a second to approve this proclamation. I have a motion by Member Snively, a second by Member Combs. Will there be any discussion? Amen. Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. And uh, Member Hahn? Approved. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, board members, uh, AO3, adoption of proclamation. This is the World Mental Health Day, observed on the 10th of October, 2021. Member per Perez will be presenting this proclamation. Member Perez? Thank you, Madam Chair. World Mental Health Day is observed October 10th every year with an overall objective of raising awareness of mental health issues around the world and mobilizing efforts in support of mental health. This year's theme is Mental Health in an Unequal World. This theme allows us to focus on issues that perpetrate mental health inequality locally and globally. Hillsborough County Public Schools will recognize this day throughout the month by promoting mental health awareness, by encouraging student-led activities such as creating posters, wall art, sidewalk chart displays promoting kindness, mindfulness, and mental health awareness statistics and information. Schools are encouraged to plan time for wellness or mindful, mindfulness activities. 
Thank you, Member Perez. I need a motion and a second to approve this proclamation. I have a motion by Member Perez, a second by Member Combs. Will there be any discussion, any comments? Member Perez. Especially today, um, right now, with our with what's happening and our children um, acting up, you know, a little bit here in Hillsborough County Schools, this is going to be a great way to engage our children with um, their mental wellness. Um, you know, with the schools planning activities, um, you know, bringing our students closer together and creating that bond with their with our students making them aware of not only their own mental wellness, but the well mental wellness of their st uh, fellow students. So I look forward to seeing what each school is um, putting forward and promoting and what the outcome is um, this month with mental health awareness. And Member Perez, perhaps we can get a video as uh, you visit schools or as we do uh, to, to share these observations. Uh, board members, uh, please vote when your lights are on. Okay, um, and Member Hahn? I approve. Okay, thank you. Thank you, board members. It's unanimous. <clears throat> okay, uh, the proclamations and recognitions are completed. And um, at this time, I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Washington, and I have a second by Member Perez. Please vote when your lights are on. Okay, and Member Hahn? I'm sorry, Member yeah. Hahn? I'm sorry, I approve. Okay, thanks. Oh, your light went on, just so you know. All righty, thank you, Board. And now we're going to go into the, uh, well, the consent agenda has been approved. And Superintendent Davis, uh, you are next for your comments. Yes, Mayor of the Chair, thank you so very much. Uh, this evening, there's a number of uh, topics that I would like to discuss. First one was to provide an you know, overview of what our strategic plan is presented this evening to the board and what the plan is to engage the community. Talk about COVID response update, where we are with COVID numbers, transition to be able to talk about where we are with human resources, talk about quarantine instructional supports that we're providing for students, at, you know, from pre-K all the way to 12th grade, and then address some suspended agenda items and then provide a district updates of, of some initiatives that we have going on. So first and foremost, tonight we have on a discussion is to launch and approve the 2021 to 2026 five-year strategic plan to accelerate Hillsborough. This plan has been de designed uh, to be able to not only identify and support our vision and mission, but to identify key core values that, uh, that will allow us to move forward in, in an efficient manner. And also being able to unpack priorities and initiatives and objectives that will go ahead and move this district to, um, to continue to drive and address and be innovative with our efficiency overall. Uh, in this, we have focused on uh, four big pillars, and those four pillars are one, to ensure that we have academic excellence. Also, the second one is for us to create a supportive organizational culture, which now more than ever we definitely need. The third one is the transition to make certain that we have exceptional talent to be able to retain, attract, and recruit you know, the best talent that we can within our school district and every position that we currently offer. And the last one is to be able to address the fiscal and operational responsibility. And overall for those, uh, you know, four pillars and priorities, we have objectives embedded within. And so the overall purpose of the strategic plan is really focus on, uh, is to build a, a blueprint that really defines our focus and our goals as an organization. And what this blueprint will allow us to do is to inform, you know, our, just every decision that we make related to allocations, related to resources, funding, inclusive of time, money, and, and human capital. And then so the action steps that we have before us if approved this evening is to actively engage the entire organization to discuss the priorities of our school district and what the strategic plan will focus on in the years to come and to host small group interactive sessions with stakeholders to be able to talk about initiatives, talk about key performance indicators because there are analytics involved in the strategic plan. And then also in continue to engage the finance committee, the citizens advisory committee, um, CTSA, CTA, 
PTSA and also STACK to be able to review every element to talk about how we will have a coordinated effort to be able to implement. And then for me and staff to be able to transition and board members potentially to transition throughout this community, to have listen and learn tours, to be able to interact and discuss our strategic plan and how we will implement our priorities and key indicators to be able to help our students and also the same token create the best environment for all in working condition environment for every one of our employees. And then alongside being able to continuously engage our business partners, our advocacy groups, our chambers, our rotaries, and other organizations to be able to talk about the, the blueprint in the way in which it exists. So that will be able to, um, you know, I think all of our staff, uh, you know, for initiating this process, I know it's been kind of lengthy due to some of the o other barriers or interactions that we had. I know that uh, Dr. Monica Torado started this initiative to be, to be inclusive with the task force for our community and all the cab members and senior staff and board members. We've had retreats. And then Van Ayers really bringing this home to be able to bring it to the board tonight. We thank him and his efforts and all the board members for their continued, um, you know, uh, feedback to be able to refine this where we get to a comfortable place to be able to implement. We know that a strategic plan just like a school is a living document. So anything that we want to be able to change and adjust, we can do so. And we'll come back and any adjustments we have for uh, put it in front of the board for potential uh, approval again. Also COVID, you know, one of the biggest things is, is keeping COVID in front of us. This is a seven day average case rate in Hillsborough County, uh, Pasco County, Pinellas County, and compared to the state. What this, what this graph uh, identifies is our low, moderate, high transmission rates. This has been, you know, per 1,000 residents. This is, goes all the way back to August 2020 and looks at where we are from a snapshot of September 27th of 2021. As you can see in December of 2020, there was a spike in January as well, right after the holidays. And then we had a downward slope. And then we see back once again when the Delta variant hit us, we started to see an uptick just the time that we thought we were going to be able to open up schools in a normal fashion. We were hit with a variant. And once again, we see through a number of mitigation strategies in our community, a downward slide of where we are today related to September. Um, this is another seven day analysis from where we started school in August of uh, first, uh, around August 1st, 2021, to where we are with September 27th. Once again, we see the number of cases uh, per 1,000 residents going, going down in a downward trend and just wanted to bring that uh, information to the board. And then also we talked about the number of individuals that are impacted. One thing we have with our, with our COVID data dashboard is we look at and we identify all the number of employees and alongside our students that are totally impacted. We know that we started this on August 18th, but we looked at our, our high point, which was August 20th, when we had over 13,000, uh, which is 5.61% of our uh, students and employees impacted to where we are today on October the 4th. We've had a 93% decrease since that number um, on the 18th and a 72% decrease from uh, September of, uh, in September the 20th. And now we're less, we're at a 0.3% overall impact with a number of 780, 718 individuals within our organization. And in all, we look at August 20th, over 13,000 of our employees and our students were impacted at that particular time. Hence the reason the board made a, a decision for us to move to, to mask. Also looking at the student cases, we also, once again, this is a comparative 86% decrease in student cases from August uh, 18th, 62% decrease from uh, student cases from September the 20th. So we had an all-time high at August 20th, 23rd with 601 po uh, you know, students were positive cases to now we're looking at 55 student cases of positive um, within our school district. With that said, we're, going, we're at a part now where we, uh, we're thankful for the Department of Health, Florida Department of Health, ordered and, lo and local Department of Health providing Hillsborough County Public Schools with 47 um, 47 uh, home testing kits, 47,000 home testing kits. We'll be able to take that, uh, we'll be able to take these 47,000 home uh, COVID assessments being able to put through every one of our schools, inclusive of charter schools. We'll be able to put them out with a plan where uh, students or employees in need who want to and need to be able to take a uh, an immediate assessment. These home tests and assessments will be distributed to them so they can be able to, to leverage. The good thing about this, there'll be an e-med platform that provides a live certified guide to be able to help parents 
uh, for students to be extended this, these home assessments to interact with those so they know how to read them. And we're just trying to find an expedited way to be able to determine whether or not a student is positive so that we can be able to take the necessary steps and keep that learner home and get them uh, immediate assistance. So we really want to thank the Florida Department of Health and local departments for our, their assistance in giving us 47,000 kits, uh, home testing kits, to, to be able to distribute within with our organization. Also one of the ask uh, was, you know, do some a comparison from a positive rate and also a case rate. If you look at Hillsborough, Pinellas, and Pasco, you can see that there's been a overall downward slide since August 10th looking to uh, September the 27th. And when the board made this decision related to masks, we were over 23% positive rate uh, within, our, within our community. And now we sit at a 7.9, which is lower today, a 7.9% was as of September the, the 27th. Today, we, I think we're at a uh, 7.84 as related to, to COVID implementation. And looking at the case rates continue to have a downward slide at a 75% decrease of where we are related to the COVID analytics. And this is hats off to our, to our teachers, our community members, our students, and our employees all being able to take this uh, as, as serious uh, within our community and also being able to provide more accessibility to vaccinations and then also being able to follow protocols you know, to the T related to implementations of our quarantines within our school district. And then also human resources. We continue to talk about where we are related to a number of open positions. Today we have 396 instructional positions that are currently open within Hillsborough County. That's almost double to where we are historically, where we are as an as a organization. We see the majority of the, the positions that are open with 35% of our positions are in the, in the K-5 core. This is K-5 being able to uh, continue to recruit, and, and of those, the majority being kindergarten positions, which our students need us the most in that particular area. Um, hats off to our Human Resources Department and all of our departments to be able to open up a job fair that we had on September the 29th. We had a, uh, 641 individuals that pre-registered. Of those pre-registrations, 202 attended. And then we had 108 walk-ups for a total of 310 individuals that we were able to interact with. I know over 100 of those uh, positions were, were given on the spot due to for qualifications and the interviewing. And we'll continue to look through credentials to be able to move the needle to be able to address the current uh, vacancies that we currently have. And at the same token, we want our community to know that our next job fair will be on October the 27th. Um, that'll be from 4 p.m. to 6.30. We'll go as long as we need to to interview. It'll be held at Silo Bend, which is located on 9036 Brittany Way in Tampa, Florida. So more information will be forthcoming. We will leverage social media to put that information out to talk about uh, all the jobs that we are open within our school district. And I want the um, and I want our school board to know as well. I've been uh, yeah, I've had a conversation with the Commissioner of Education, also a conversation with uh, Chancellor Olivia, and at the same token, uh, talk to Alex Kelly today, the Chief of Staff for the Governor, about potentially removing or creating a state of emergency or creating a legislative language to remove the one-year pause for hiring, uh, you know, being able to inability to hire um, uh, for individuals that uh, have already retired last year. There is a protocol for one year that you have to sit out uh, so it does not impact your FRS. So what this allows us to do is potentially move the needle to, um, to relieve that for one year and allow us to start hiring individuals to potentially come back to fill these positions. And we think that's a strategy that will help us as we move forward. And then quarantine instructional supports. One thing we knew that we had a number of a large number of quarantines that uh, students were, were missing. And when students miss, we want to make sure that we have uh, instructional momentum. Um, now available, we launched yesterday for elementary from pre-K all the way to fifth grade virtual quarantine supports. It is the first of its kind throughout the state that we know as in-house resources where we have hired academic services as hired qualified, uh, certified teachers. We have eight teachers, uh, you know, we have, sorry, seven teachers that we have hired to provide core instruction or assistance to our students in, in pre-K to fifth grade. These are state certified individuals and they are, may, they are available for any of our students from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. 
within uh, within the the school day, and they continue to provide uh, ongoing assurances and, and assistance for the, for academics for our students in need. And uh, so we want our students to take advantage of this. This is format is being held through Microsoft Teams, which is also linked through Canvas. And then also anyone that needs to assistance throughout the phone will be able to to make that a reality. We had 14 students so far in the last day and a half that takes to our last two days to take advantage of this. And as we continue to market in our elementary sector, we, we know that this will continue to grow. And thank you for our, for our parents for trusting and the teachers who have committed to be able to serve our students in this capacity. In the secondary quarantine, as we always oh, launch paper. And uh, to date, we've had over 4,600 learning moments that have been our, our students have been taken advantage of. We have uh, over 2,000 students are actively engaged in paper. And one of the things, over 4,400 4, sessions and 130 essays have been reviewed to date. So, um, you know, thank you for our teachers for allowing this, uh, you know, for pushing this. Thank you for our students for, uh, for engaging in this process. This number will continue to, to improve. And so upcoming initiatives that we'll have, we'll continue to have reoccurring webinars for school-based administrators, site administrators, and our teachers. We will continue to focus on low use of sites to be able to push out information to let them know that it is readily available for them to interact with. And at the same token, we'll have parent information sessions and we'll continue to have, um, you know, uh, subject area leaders and department head meetings to talk about how paper can be an active solution to help them w within their classrooms to help students who may need additional assistance. And then also we'll have webinars. For every second Tuesday, we have webinars that will be in English, and every second Thursday, it will be in Spanish to be able to make certain that parents are actively engaged for this 24-7 tutorial that we're offering within our school district and that we thank our academic services for making this a, a priority within our district. And then also suspended agenda. You know, one thing we continue to talk about growth management and planning. We look at, uh, we've had a successful joint meeting with the BOCC on September the 29th. We're grateful for that time to be able to interact. We've, you know, we, in the last, uh, you know, four or five months, we've really moved the needle to be able to address some really pressing needs within our school district. The biggest next step for us is to be able to revise the local, uh, you know, interlocal agreement to be able to remove any barriers that exist so we can start building schools and having, a, you, know, add, you know, proper additions. And then we'll continue to make certain that our operations department continue to provide updates to the board on those continued interactions. As we talk about proposed construction projects, this year we launched in open additions at Spoto High School, my mama, and related to school additions. And as you talk about the years to come, we'll continue to, to uh, next year for the 22-23 school year will be a new uh, pre-K through eight in, in the area of Watershed to be able to com compete and offer solutions for the, for the students in South County. And then also being able to, uh, you know, address additional seating for Robinson High School. And then also look at Dorothy Thomas ESE Center and to give them a more conducive environment to learning, move them, remove them from portables and bring them to student stations for interactions, proper interactions. And then we know that a number of our middle schools in our county, we need additional assistance. And then Collins Middle School to be able to add additions to those, uh, to that particular site will allow us to, um, to add an additional seating, which is around 594 seats at that particular location to alleviate any crowd in, in that particular area, particular to Barrington, to be able to serve um, students definitely in need. And then a four-year plan is also to open up a new pre-K-8 in Manhattan site and then other elements in, in a plant city. And then year five to be able to open up a uh, high school UUU, which will be located in the South County as well. T together, all these will add over 8,000 student stations within our school district, which is definitely a need as we continue to grow in, in South County. And then project renews. We will have a, a total number of uh, projected construction and maintenance revenue. We have $2.2 billion with our school district from a number of listed revenues within our within our county that we uh, we have obtained locally and throughout the state and then also well, that would be a transition to address one be over one billion dollars of major maintenance and new construction will be three hundred seven million dollars and other expenditures to be able to to purchase property and uh, in conversions and buses and address address debt services will be in that five-year plan and then information technology last last month we had some of our educators speak about where we are from technology um, it is really important to us, as we see from the wireless de devices in our schools, we've replaced the wireless devices in 56 of our school sites. 
4,700 devices we have, uh, you know, replaced to date out of the 27,000. And then please know that this is going to be at no cost. And this was an initiative that was implemented in 2017 and 2018. And being able to go back and replace all of them to have better connectivity is a priority for, for us, and that will take place. And on the same token, we've done the same thing at our district sites. While we have 12 district sites in total that we need to address, six have already been completed, and then we'll continue to make that a priority within our district. And then also student computers. You know, we've ordered 62,000 devices leveraging multiple federal funds. Approximately 15,000 have already currently, other 62,000 have been deployed. And overall, in the last 18 months, we've ordered over 108,000 of the devices to be able to put in our schools to make sure we help and address, uh, you know, continued work and uh, the digital divide. And then we are looking at currently 28,000 current being deployed to eliminate the oldest devices, which are five years or older, and with 10,000 immediately going to Title I schools. Um, and you'll see 18,000 devices to be able to expe expect to hit our schools in the next two or three weeks. And then staff computers. We have so many uh, staffing. You know, when, when we hire staff, we don't get, we give them a set of keys. We, we don't give them a computer. We've got to get to a point where it's a standard operating expectation is that when we hire our staff, not only do they get keys to a classroom, we give them a, 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 a device where they can interact so they don't have to use their personal devices. So we've, uh, we've ordered 8,000 devices, approximately 2,000 have been sent and deployed currently, and we'll continue to order to make sure we address this leveraging internal and uh, federal dollars to, you know, to be successful. And then lastly, to be able to celebrate, uh, as we know, Laura Meehan at, at Gaither High School was recognized as USF Extra Yard a teacher recipient. She received $1,000 for her efforts, and at the same token, she will be recognized at a USF football game, and then she was given a customized jersey just to recognize her hard efforts as an educator within our school district. And at the same token, as we move forward, we'll have that we launched this week the Accelerate Hillsborough Recognition Program. Thank you to Anne-Marie Courtney, who continues to help spearhead these efforts, and this recognizes our teachers, support staff, leaders, business leaders, and community leaders for everything that they've done. And we're just trying to find ways to, to really help morale, to really recognize our, you know, our employees. They'll be recognized uh, not only at school, at, at schools, but also at board meetings as well. And anyone can be nominated through a share link within the organization. So to date, we, we launched it. We have, I think, close to 200 already within the first two days uh, of nominations. And we look forward to going through those and recognizing individuals for their hard work. And thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Um, Sorry for a lot of long. great information. Uh, board members, it looks like we have a few comments uh, with regards to this um, update. Uh, member Vaughn, followed by Member Perez, followed by Member Combs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, you talked about the 47,000 home testing kits that are going to be distributed. How do people qualify for those? How do they access them? How do they get them? What does that look like? So, so through the Chair, right now we're working through that process. Once we get the, you know, with our teams and Department of Health identified how we disseminate them to the schools and how they are going to be uh, disseminated to students, we're working on finalizing that information. Once that information is, is, is worked through through our COVID team, I'll share with the board and at the same token I'll share with, um, with our school principals. I appreciate it. And then next, can you give an update on the Achieve 3000? I know that we decided that that wasn't coming before the board because it was a multi-year contract, but where did we land on that? Yes, ma'am. So this was a uh, you know piece that I know you've been briefed individually as a board member. All board members have been briefed through uh, Terry Connor. This is a, and I know that Mr. Porter is in and Jeff Gibson have engaged in that process as well. So it's a three-year process, a three-year agreement that we agreed with Chief 3000. One thing we did not do this year is we launched the 21-22 school year. We did not force or expect that to be a tier two solution within our school district. We did see there was movement last year within the organization of movement. Lexiles uh, related to literacy. Um, this year, what we, we told schools is that if they wanted to implement an Achieve 3000 within their schools, because it wasn't going to be mandated by the district as a supplement material, that, that, that school based leaders needed to go and leverage their instructional leadership teams and be able to have a vote with their staff who are going to use that and bring that vote back to a positive over 50% within their schools of individuals who are going to be able to use those and leverage it and then transition and bring it back 
to academic services. To date, we had, uh, I believe it's 62 schools that have elected through their instructional leadership teams to use this uh, product. And one of the things I'll say, we spent millions of dollars of training our teachers uh, and our teachers, if they want to use it, this is the best way for them to make and use as a sounding board. So being able to bring that back uh, this year, 62 schools will be implementing the Chi 3000, and that is the will and decision at a school-based decision. And we will leverage SAI and potentially ESSER funds to be able to to implement and, and pay for that cost uh, to uh, for the um, the contract. The contract was over four million dollars for a three-year contract. We now reduce that annually, reduce that to 1.2 million dollars that will be used and leveraged through SAI, which is a categorical used to be able to address an ESSER as well to address the achievement gap. So, um, you know, biggest thing is one thing we didn't want to do is just selectively abandon it, but we wanted it to be a school choice where you had buy-in, and this is where we currently sit right now. Thank you. And then when are we going to get the update? I know you sent a, a survey out for parental input on the ESSERS fund. Um, as a board, are we going to get some feedback on the survey results? When are we going to get some information about that? Yes, ma'am. I'll let Ms. Brown, you can address that. Thank you. Thank you. The survey closes on October 10th, so we will get that um, information gathered and get that to the superintendent so that he can get it to each board member. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that you addressed the technology needs up there because I'm getting constant complaints, especially school-based, about with the onslaught of computer programs we have, our technology not being caught up and that causing huge lag time and delays with teachers trying to access technology. I, I really appreciate all the, the information, but time-wise, timeline, I know we have new computers going out, I know we have some technology things going up, but timeline, just what are we expecting, how long sure. before we, we have teachers who are able to, to use technology and not have a 10 to 15 minute lag time on computer programs? And so I'll let Mr. Weeks uh, address that. One thing I will say is that uh, the majority of, of the delay is related to twofold, related to COVID to be able to get devices into our schools, and we've ordered it being able to leverage federal funding. And the second one is the old devices. We had, what is creating the, the bog down now is we have, you know, really old devices that are five, eight, ten years old, you know, of age in our schools, and the new sophisticated updates and systems that we're, we're trying to implement is slowing it down. But I'll let Mr. Weeks address that. Uh, member Vaughn, to uh, to address that, basically, uh, as Mr. Davis pointed out earlier, part of our effort is to replace all the oldest devices that we have within the district. Uh, we will have enough devices within the next three weeks to actually accomplish that, replacing all of the devices that are five years or older um, throughout uh, all of the student devices, and then we will have enough devices uh, from a staff perspective to replace all of those. Uh, we expect those to be deployed um, over the next um, probably two to three months. Uh, we, we're hoping to have the majority of that uh, in place prior to the start of uh, the new calendar year. Some of this is contingent upon the fact that uh, we may still see some challenges with supply chain constraints. However, most of the devices that we're speaking of are already um, purchased and sitting with our vendor and are awaiting shipment to us. We have received a large number of them, and um, so some of it is basically just in transport. But, but those devices should be enough to at least get us to a point where the age devices are out of um, the district, uh, our, our schools, and our, our uh, teachers and student hands. Um, so that's really you know, the biggest thing that we're focusing on at this point. Um, age has a lot to do with, with the problems that we're seeing you know, at most of the sites. Okay, so two to three weeks, but definitely by the end of the year is the, the time. By, by the end of the year is what we're planning on for the uh, actual replacement for the majority of those devices, yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, member, uh, excuse me. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, member Perez. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, we, we all have um, a sticker here on the side of our monitor that says we believe all children can be empowered to learn to succeed. So I'm going to go to your growth management and planning. Um, so I, I requested that um, I be provided with information on the students being bused across the county. And the, the schools in our transformation network area that continue to remain virtually empty because our students are being bused across the county to fill seats. 
in other schools. So, um, and I get, I totally get that why Mama and South Tampa are busting at the seams. But my concern is that a lot, a lot of them are busting at the seams because the children from the Transformation Network area are being bused to fill seats in other schools. Now I've said this several times from this dais, and I'm gonna continue saying it because it's a concern to me. When I look at the amount of money going into new construction, and we still have not addressed looking at the near empty schools, schools in disrepair, and the students who are continue to be bus. Um, our students are being denied. When they're bus across county, they're being denied participation in after school athletic programs. And let me emphasize why that's a problem with me. Because this affects potential future scholarships for these students and careers for these students. Also, they're not able to attend support study groups, join clubs, or support possible sibling groups that they may be part of in helping their parents. And I know that this may not be a, just this, this is just not an issue, but it's a waste of money and we absolutely do not have this money to waste in this county. So I, I'm gonna continue asking to find out how many of our students are being bused away from the schools that are virtually empty and live around those areas and why can we not fix those schools, bring them up to working conditions, looking great, you know, where our children don't need to be bused across this county in order to have the same, the same services, the same technology, the same everything that other students have. I just need that question answered and I need those statistics. If the chair, Mr. Farkas. So we have that information. We just got together and actually got emailed to Mr. Alming to put him on that spot, but just today was when he got that information. So I'm sure he <laughs> hasn't you. had a chance to review that, Thank you. but it took a little bit longer to, to do that because where we bust is, is different. And I'll give you a couple examples real quick in the area of, of, of where you live. So Wharton in theory is a school where we bust about four or 500 kids up to Wharton. Um, it's, it's what we call a satellite boundary, meaning that it's not connected. Um, however, Freedom, actually buses from that same area, but it's connected because it's contiguous. So finding that we work with transportation and with growth management and planning to get those numbers. It took a little bit longer than we thought, but that did get information to him. I assume that we'll be out to the board by the end of the week. I want to make sure Addison looks at it before we, uh, Mr. Davis looks at it first, but we do have that information uh, for you and you should get it in the next uh, 24, 48 hours. So not only would that information impact um, our students, it would impact the transportation that we have that is so critical in this in this county that's really affecting we don't have drivers so looking at all that information really digging into how we could make this more effective it's going to help this district um, not hurt it and it's going to help these students that are being affected by this whole thing i agree with you and that's a big part of what mr davis pushed with the uh the then you all supported the RFP boundary change because it is holistic. Um, that's going to be part two of that conversation as well. Absolutely. Uh, Member Perez, are you okay? Uh, and um, yes, uh, questions needed to uh, need to be answered certainly. Um, Member Washington, after uh, you, then we're going to write to employee comments. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question. Um, we are having the digital divide, and I know we are passing out, we are, we are doing technology in the district. Can you give me an update how we're looking in technology in District 5? Because that's where my digital divide is mainly located. 
Dr. Weeks will come up and uh, address that. One thing we see is that, you know, when we have the, uh, you know, the 18,000 devices that we're currently going to implement in the next couple of weeks, 10,000 will be dedicated to Title I schools. The majority of those will be implemented within within District 5. So it is a priority. One of the other questions was, was the with the 4,700 Wi-Fi replacements, and we have 20,000 to go, that, will, that project will be completed by the end of the year as well with making certain that Title I schools are a priority as well. Dr. Weeks. Uh, Member Washington, thank you for the question. Uh, as Superintendent Davis stated, um, our priority at this point is really replacing all the oldest devices. Um, Title I has 10,000 devices that are guaranteed to go out to Title I schools at this point. Um, all of the additional devices that we're purchasing beyond um, the initial um, 18,625 that we've, we've just recently submitted an order for, all the additional devices is actually going to move us towards going um, pushing us towards a one-to-one -one initiative at all of our school sites. So not only just District 5, however, uh, we're looking at really accomplishing this through all of our schools, throughout all of the district. Um, we are trying to hit the highest needed areas possible, areas where we do not have enough computers for students. Uh, we are trying to focus on those, replace the oldest equipment, supplement those um, supplement that equipment in those schools with newer devices and then work ultimately towards that one-to-one -one initiative okay sound good so we're not we're doing we're not in the mode of refreshing computers like we used to do we're trying to get new computers in that technology right, right? At, at this point we are trying to get to the point where our average age is approximately two and a half to three years old which puts us on a four-year refresh cycle meaning that our oldest devices will be approximately four years old. So we will start looking towards uh, a refresh after we go through this initial round of replacing everything. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Member Washington. One thing I wanted to uh, ask the board uh, for a remark and Superintendent Davis, I was looking at the uh, paper, P-A-P-E-R, and the acronym thereof. I know that the remote learning is, uh, is here to to stay to some degree, hopefully less degree than now. Could we not put this on the suspended agenda, the usage? Yes, ma'am. I'd be very curious um, because I think that's that's some information that we need to know. It was a big investment. Um, you do that? Would that be okay, yes, board members? Are you agreeable to that? Okay, thank you. Um, and next we have employee comment, um, and we have four. Uh, employees, if I, uh, if you will, I'm going just to read the guidelines. <clears throat> we will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at 4 p.m. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we are creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We are setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or this district. Each speaker will have three minutes. Um, Mr. Crete, then Ms. Glick, then Ms. Lewis, and then Ms. Deneka. And at this time, it's good evening. And good evening. Good evening, honorable school board members, Superintendent Davis, staff. As if the school year has not had its own share of trials and tribulations, now we see that there are social media challenges wherein students are encouraged to damage their school or worse, bring violence to their sites and teachers. Teaching the standards using the appro approved curriculum is super challenging for our, our teachers. Finding time to teach about responsible use of social media is yet another thing falling on the shoulders of our teachers. Parents, we need your help in helping our, our students know how to use social media responsibly. And school board, we need your support in tamping down these student behaviors that are incited by anonymous social media sites. Violence brought to our teachers and schools cannot be tolerated. We alerted our members last week about these challenges, and I won't dignify the platform or the challenge here today, but we ask for your support against all of this nonsense. I will, however, offer a few other challenges for students. How about no tardy October? Everybody gets a class on time. I like that one. 
I have a take a supply, leave a supply in November. Right? This is great. Um, I'm going to go really out of the box here. Read a book in December. Okay? If you haven't read one before, now is the time. <laughs> um, I can go on. I really could. Um, we could have some fun with this. But really, we do need help with these social media challenges. We hope that we have your full support in tamping these down. And I got one other uh, challenge, I guess, for board members. Let's settle the contract in November. Or by November, even. How's that? Let's uh, be safe, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crete, for your educational um, fun facts or fun to do do list. Um, we appreciate you. We we really do. Um, okay, Miss uh, Heidi Glick. Good evening, Miss Glick. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to address the computers. We got new ones at Alonzo. Mine was 15 years old, and instead of taking me 30 minutes and wanting to throw it out the window. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds, and I am very excited. And um, people, it, the w people from IT were great at my school. They were laughed at all my jokes, so right away they were my favorite. Um, but things, but there were some things, honestly, that they did not know how to do, but teachers did. So I got help from them. And last night at the CAC, I mentioned how excited I was about putting out people to be nominated. I think it is every single person that works in this school district. We show up. We do our job. You guys know, I mean, I work late. Everybody works late. I was sitting in the back grading papers and listening at the same time. Just perfect timing because I finished the last one when you called us. So um, what I'm doing here tonight as an elected member of the Hillsborough County Teachers Association Executive Board, it is my job and my duty to represent my members. Um, unfortunately, one of our members could not be here this evening, so she wrote a speech. You guys have handouts, um, and I'm just going to read it. Bo Dear board members and Superintendent Davis, I unfortunately cannot attend meetings as I have to work one of my second jobs. I appreciate your attentiveness to my representative. I am horrified at the direction the district is going regarding printed materials for students. Never before has it been so clearly evident that a decision was made from a business mindset rather than an educational one. Yes, we have bills and cuts need to be made. But to wholeheartedly throw out all research and hinder learning is the opposite of sense. It has been stated that we as a district are moving away from paper copies to all online materials. I cannot find a single source that supports this move based on research or pedagogy. I love technology. That's definitely not me saying that. And I incorporate it regularly. However, study after peer-reviewed study proves that students do not learn best by typing. If you are surprised to hear this, then have no fear. I have provided copies of analysis on studies from NPR, The New York Times, inside higher ed and an abstract from a world famous published study. Everybody got a packet, right? Okay. I implore you to read these materials so you may better understand how imperative it is for students to have tangible work in their hands. They need to text mark, they need to manipulate and alter, they need to work collaboratively. You are gutting our ability to teach effectively. When my last school was down, the only copier for a month, I spent $300 out of my pocket to make copies on Nickel Fridays at Pro Copy. When this district said that students do not need color copies for maps and diagrams, I purchased my own color printer and ink to supplement their learning. Make your budget cuts as needed, but do it so intelligently. I, this is blank. And shows a total lack of understanding to the classroom. Remember back in 2019, all the chatter that teaching was changing to all online and 100 students in a room? The pandemic proved that that was a laughable belief. Please do not wait for lower test scores to prove this newest initiative wrong like so many others. Please read the research and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Glick. Next will be Audra Lewis and then followed by Carissa Denica. And I see we have some guests. Okay. All right, so. Um, I've never done this before, so I'm very nervous. Just take it easy. That's, it's, you're in a good take place. A deep deep take breath. a deep breath, yeah. So I'm Audra Lewis from Hillsborough High School. And first, I want to thank um, Nadia and uh, Ms. Perez for donating through uh, Adopt a Teacher Facebook group. Um, Ms. Perez funded by Donors Choose on the last day of school, so these students have devices to take home um, to continue their work through quarantine and such. And um, my kids are getting fed through that group, through all the donations. And then I also want to thank Addison Davis for bringing paper because it has been a game changer. Um, okay, so Nadia came to my school and 
did, walked my walk for an entire day and um, taught my students about the decision-making process that you guys do on a regular basis because we're learning how people and businesses make informed decisions. So I want to address two concerns within my school. They were wanted to speak, but obviously they can't speak because there was like 50 people already signed up. So I'm bringing the faces of hungry children. I want to speak of regards to student nutritional services and the lack of water at Hillsborough High School. Mm. Okay, so, yeah. So because the late bus situation, which, you know, is a district problem, my children, our students at Hillsborough High School, are not able to get breakfast. And because the lack of staffing and the small amount of time for lunch, they do not get lunch. They can stand on line almost the whole period and not get lunch. Because, so what they choose to do instead is just skip lunch because they do want to have time with their friends and that's the only time they get to eat. So through my Facebook group, they get breakfast every day, periods one through three from all the donations. As not, I saw my breakfast box. Very passionate about the food. Sorry. <laughs> so my second concern is for Area 5, and I, I don't know if the board is aware of this or not, but our most vulnerable population was taught summer reading camp by Kelly Services. I found that out, and I was angered in July. Why is Kelly Services teaching Area 5 students summer reading camp? Where in the nation does any uncertified reading teacher teach our most vulnerable population? That needs to change. And no way that should, sorry. No, no, no. You, you, have, you have 30 seconds. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So in no way should we have Kelly Services instructing our most vulnerable positions. We're talking about these kids don't have teachers right now. That's where our biggest vacancy is. And are we going to repeat that for the summer? That's not acceptable. I say no to Kelly Services, at least for Area 5. And your points are very well heard and very important. And Superintendent Davis, I know that uh, he's heard each of you, and I, I know you haven't spoken, but we hear you. So they want to thank sign you up for, for your courage day. and your commitment you. this evening. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Carissa Denica. And good evening, Ms. Denica. Hi, I'm Carissa Denica. Um, I'm exhausted. Um, I'd rather be home right now with my own kids. Um, but I'm here to speak for those who can't. Um, and I think you should listen to me because if things continue on, me and others like me aren't going to continue to speak to you. We're just going to quit. I love teaching. Even through all of COVID, I love teaching. But we continue to be asked for more and more without anything given to us. There are less adults on campus, and we're told we should give up our time to watch the hallways. There are less substitutes, and we're told we have to cover multiple times a week. There are more gaps of knowledge in our students, and we're told we should accelerate their learning, but we are also told that this is a typical year, and all the presentations and the pep rallies and the club days that interrupt learning are going full force. I don't hate those, but there's too many. They're multiple times a week sometimes. Some possible solutions. We need more time with our students. One way is a policy, uh, one way is a policy holding schools to only one day a week that interferes with our classes other than testing. We need substitutes or we need a different contract with Kelly services if they can't provide them. We need adults to monitor students during classes and during lunches. I don't, I can't tell you how many times I have to interrupt my classroom because there are kids in the hallway acting up. There are, we had another at my school, we had another soap dispenser missing today in a boy's bathroom. There's so much that could be handled with just adult uh, being able to see be in the hallway. We need a date to set up for bargaining for the instructional unit and we very badly need to set up uh, something to go back to the table for our ESPs because that's ridiculous. I am getting tired of being tired. Something has to give, and you don't want it to be your employees. Mm -hmm. 
Value us with your actions, not with your words. Thank you. <clears throat> Very well said. Thank you. At uh, this time, board members, uh, we have concluded our employee comment, and we want to thank our employees and encourage them um, to come and speak with this time allotment. It's very important for us to hear from our teachers and our staff and our ESP and down the line it goes. Thank you, Mr. Crete. Uh, at this time, we're going to have the following agenda items to be heard. C-605, C-611, C-612, C-613, C-614, C-615, C-616, C-621, C-702, C-1102, and C-1103. 1103, discussion regarding the Commissioner of Education's September 23, 2021 letter regarding protocols for controlling COVID-19 in school settings, including mandatory facial coverings. Uh, first, we'll hear from our attorney, Jim Porter, and he will highlight this item. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Board members, you'll recall that on August 18th, this board held an emergency meeting to consider the number of uh, students and staff in quarantine and isolation and the number of students and staff that were affected with COVID-19. At that meeting, you heard from a panel of medical experts from Tampa General Hospital, as well as from the Department of Health Hillsborough. At that time, the board acted under its emergency rulemaking powers to supplement the mask mandate policy in effect in Hillsborough County uh, by requiring a medical certificate along with uh, the parental opt-out. You'll recall that prior to that, the superintendent had initiated a mask mandate but allowed for a parental opt-out. You also recall that the State Department of Health, the governor and the State Department of Health issued an emergency rule that uh, required uh, districts to provide for a parental opt-out uh, for mask mandates. The initial uh, emergency rule that was issued by the Department of Health was silent on whether a medical certificate was allowed. Therefore, Hillsborough, along with 11 other school districts, have taken the position that that emergency rule adopted by this board was legal and in, in compliance with the law because the emergency rule was silent about a medical certificate. Subsequent to that, on September 22nd, the Department of Health issued a new emergency rule that specifically stated that a, uh, the opt-out for a mask mandate must be in the sole discretion of the parent. Uh, the board also will recall that you extended your 30-day mask mandate with the medical certificate until October 15th. So where we are poised now is your uh, mask mandate with a medical opt-out uh, provision is set to expire on October 15th. We have received communication from the state along with the other school districts that have taken similar positions that the State Board of Education meeting will be holding a meeting this Thursday on October 7th. The Commissioner of Education has indicated that he intends to recommend that Hillsborough and other school districts that are uh, providing for an opt-out with a medical certificate are not in compliance with the emergency rule. In the past, when this has happened, Broward and Alachua counties, who were similarly situated, received notice that they would uh, be penalized or receive sanctions in an amount equal to school board members' salaries. We received communication today that, the, and I want to read it to you because I think it's important that it be on the record, that in addition to withholding salaries, this is what the Commissioner of Education is recommending to the Department of Education for those districts who still have the medical certificate as a requirement. In addition to withholding half of all school board members' salary, uh, withholding funds equal in amount to any federal grant funds, excuse me, in um, amount equal to any federal grants fund awarded to the school board for noncompliance with the emergency rule. So the board has several options today. You can choose to allow the uh, current um, mandate with the medical certificate to sunset on October 15th. If you do that, there is a considerable risk to the district that this board and this district will be found to be not in compliance with the law and there'll be financial sanctions levied against this board equal to the amounts of half your salaries plus any federal dollars that result from you uh, defying the state order. You can also choose to have the 
excuse me, the um, requirement to have a medical certificate ended today or tomorrow, um, and, and that way it would be before the State Board of Education met. Um, what needs to be understood is we're only talking about the elimination of the medical certificate. Before this board even acted, the superintendent imposed a mask mandate that allowed for parental opt-out. That is in compliance with the governor's executive order and the state rule. So it's important to understand that regardless of what the board does today, whether you choose to end the medical certificate requirement today, let it ride until October 15th, um, there will still be a mask mandate in Hillsborough County, but there won't be a medical certificate needed. It will be a parental opt-out only. That is in compliance with the Department of Health emergency rule and with the governor's executive order. I just gave you a lot of information, but those are the options in front of you today. You'll also recall that you originally adopted your rule under your emergency rulemaking powers, which you can only have an effect for 90 days, and you're at the 60-day mark at this point. Um, it would be challenging at this point to extend that because of the new emergency rule. We have taken the position and we've consistently taken a position that your action on August 18th and subsequently when you renewed was the, the, the requirement was completely in compliance with the law, the Parental Bill of Rights and the order because it's significant to note that that initial rule was silent about a medical certificate. It's also important to note for the record that other districts felt the same as you did and acted similarly and the state felt compelled to issue another rule because they used the term clarify because the initial rule wasn't clear about what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. So I want you to understand that our position has been you've been in full compliance with the law. The state might disagree with that, but that's been our position and you acted in good faith based on the evidence that you were presented both from the healthcare experts and from the hard data presented by your staff. Hmm. Mr. Porter, um, and I know that there's a lot of information uh, that we just heard from you, um, and, and we don't want to uh, make any mistake in our vote and in uh, and our comments. So when we have motions being made, uh, it may be very helpful for you and Superintendent Davis to enunciate again if there are any penalties, uh, just so we are very clear about what we're voting for. And Superintendent Davis, did you want to go ahead and make some comments on this? Yes, Mayor, the Chair. You know, one thing as we, if I provided COVID impact data along the side with the student data, we see that there's 93% decrease since the mask implementation to currently on October the 4th. And at the same time, we had 86% positive cases with decrease as well. And in the community, we see that the positive rate when we made this decision was over 23%, and now it's down to, um, to, to to around 7.84%. So with this said, and, and really learning what's happening with the Department of Education with financial penalties, I go back to my original recommendation to be able to mandate masks with an opportunity for parents to opt out because not only are they going to take uh, the financial side of the salaries from school board members, but Broward County just got penalized $420,000, and Alachua got penalized $147,000. I can tell you where we are in a financial situation, we need every dollar and every cent that we can. Not only are we advocating for SR3 APR funds, but we cannot afford to lose any additional funds within the school district. So as we move forward, I have no problems going in front of the board on October 7th and back in the board's decision. But from financial decision, my, my ask would be to, to allow it to stop immediately and then tr let us transition um, as we uh, move through with the parent of opting out. And, and Madam Chair, the other piece I just need to advise the board, although I've previously done this by email, um, one of the speakers tonight was Luke LaRoe, who's an attorney in town. He is representing a group of parents that are uh, suing us, challenging our mask mandate and asking the courts to um, make it uh, to, to um, to, to restrain us from enforcing that as well. So that is another element of your decision making that you under, need to understand there's a lawsuit pending against us for the mask mandate. Yeah, and we're also reminded that these lawsuits cost us a lot of money. So, yeah. um, and money we have not, not much to spare. Okay, with all the facts given, and I know board members, if you're like me, we'll still have to have some clarification on your maneuvers, but we do have uh, member Combs and then Member Snively. Oh. Excuse me, just for a second. I, um, I'm sorry, Member Combs. 
Um, we may want to also configure into this decision-making process that the superintendent, if I'm clear on this, you have made a recommendation. Is that clear to the board? To yes, ma'am. I have made a recommendation. It remains okay. the same as originally when we started this process. Okay. So with that recommendation, board, we can have also a motion to support the superintendent's recommendation. So that can be done at this time. Board members, I have a, a member Combs, is that a motion to support? Well, I have, a, I have a motion that's a little bit different than that, but very similar. Okay, well, I have a motion. So, so we'll have to get your name off. Should we, should we go in order as we are, yeah, Chair Gray, that we press? Well, I made a motion. I mean, we're having, that's I need a motion. I, I, I should be, I should, I should, well, allow me to speak and then I can make my motion, please. Okay. Um, so the recommendation is one choice, okay, and Member Combs? I would like to make that motion. Okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, um, let's go in order, Member Snively. She asked for an, a rec or she asked for a nominee. Um, excuse me. She asked for a motion to support the support superintendent's, superintendent's recommendation. recommendation. So we can have discussion after a motion in a second. Is that correct, Mr. Porter? Well, okay. So the chair asks for a motion. Ms. Combs is on the uh, thing, and I think she, I don't know what she's. going We can to go in order. Yes, we can go in order. But to discuss it, to make a motion, I'm trying to make right. a motion, and I press my buzzer first. So I'd appreciate an opportunity for that. Okay, so let me let me just say what I feel is the right thing to do. First off, we see and hear your rec we don't see it. We hear your recommendation. Second, I want to hear from Member Combs uh, next because she has a motion, no doubt, and then Member Snively. Member Combs, proceed. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, first of all, you know I did make the initial motion to have the 30 days mass mandate, and I supported the extension. My goal and the only reason I'm on this board is because I'm always going to do what's best for children and what's best for our district. You know, I was very concerned about the safety of our, our students when we had a 25% positivity rate. As we look at now, um, you know, the intention was never, at least I can say personally, was never the intention for children to wear masks throughout the year. That was never my intention. We are well below um, the 10% threshold. We're at below 8%. If you look at the decrease in positivity across in these counties, the 75% in positivity has decreased. Our hospitalizations, ICUs are 74% decrease. Um, you know, elective surgeries are back. There's, there isn't a wait in the emergency rooms. I have to look, you know, when I come home and I see football games, I see hockey games, I see a lot of individuals who are in locations inside without masks. A lot of that doesn't make sense when every week we have 65,000 people right here at the Buck Stadium. Um, I'm also concerned about the mental health of children and what that's like long term. We know that teen suicide with girls alone has doubled in the last two years. So long term, when we look at we're below 10%, I mean, what do people want? When we talk about waiting for vaccinations for elementary children. When you look at the rate of, that, of students who, are with, who have COVID in high school compared to elementary, even though vaccinations have been readily available for a year and a half, there is no difference between the rate of COVID between elementary and high school. So I do believe that we need to support the superintendent. I do not want it to sunset today. We need 24 hours. This is unfair for the schools over and over to have something that occurs immediately. Um, schools, principals, administrators need an, at some time to make sure that if there is a parental opt-out that they are getting that information. So my motion is I move that we allow the board's requirement for a medical certificate to opt out of the district's mask requirement to sunset on October 6th, but to keep the parental opt-out. So that would be my motion to basically sunset it, but tomorrow, so we would still be in compliance with the State Board of Education, but that would allow the schools to have an additional 24 hours. Yeah. No, she wanted to do it immediately. Well, <laughs> okay. we'll see. Okay. Yes, Member Snively, what I'm talking about is not immediately today, an additional 24 hours. So it would be prior to the state board meeting, but we would have an additional 24 hours. So that is different. Okay, there is a motion on the floor from Member Combs. We need a second before we discuss. Board 
Right. Member, we, the, uh, we, we got to clear the board so I can see. Okay, uh, uh, Member Washington has seconded your motion. So right now we're into discussion and clarification. Perhaps will be needed. Discussion um, starting with Member Vaughn. Excuse me, I was next in the queue. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, Member, that you're correct. Member Snively. Thank you. So I am very glad that, to hear that you're making this motion, and I agree with all of the points that you've made as far as the validity and uh, the reasoning and the rationale for for removing the mask mandate with the medical requirement. What I um, what I have a little heartburn over is when we, as the board voted to instill or to uh, implement the mask mandate, it was the next day. It was the next morning we required students to wear masks the next morning. So I, that's why I was hoping that when you said immediately that tomorrow morning, like when we mandated the masks, tomorrow morning we could say students could go to school opting out of masks, to be fair. So that's, I, I, that was the, the, my intent, and to get the clarification from, from Member Combs was, I would like students to show up tomorrow morning and parents have that that uh, opportunity um, to to not have to put a mask on their child. I, and and just as a side, I do want to thank all the speakers who came, um, who have come to the meetings over the last several weeks to express their concerns about this particular situation. Um, there were several great points made today by very many individuals. Um, I think that parents are already overwhelmed. Um, I know that we've got the lawsuit pending. I agree that we should be able to send our superintendent to the school, uh, state school board meeting with, without the binding of having a, you know, a mandate in place. So I agree with that. Um, I agree with making sure that we don't add any a, a, a burden to our parents as far as getting medical certifications or certificates and really following the parent bill of rights so i would ask for a friendly amendment to consider a friendly amendment we can have more discussion before you consider a friendly amendment because i'd really like to hear from other board members as well um, however i would really appreciate the fact that we could send our children to school tomorrow without masks on if the parents choose to opt out, just like we forced them to when we mandated masks the last time. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, there's a clarification. Uh, quickly, Mr. Porter, will there be a financial differential if we wait 24 hours? I don't know if there's any way to predict that. So oh, we get, all right, so that's still in the, yes. we can't predict. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, I have to say, you know, I'm a little frustrated and disappointed to even hear this discussion. Uh, we assured parents we were they were going to have till the 15th of this month. Um, a lot of parents have made decisions on that again. We continually tell parents one thing and then we change our minds. Um, from the beginning, I have advocated for our youngest and smallest children who aren't able to get the vaccine to have a layer of protection when they go into our schools. It's one thing to talk about students who can get the vaccine if they need to, but for our youngest children who absolutely have no layer of protection other than those masks, I find this conversation about because the state, once again, is doing things that may or may not decided by the courts be allowed to be reactive based on them threatening to withhold money problematic when we're talking about looking out for the welfare and the safety of our district. We're supposed to have home rule to make decisions based on what we think holistically, the seven of us and the superintendent, is best for our district and not to constantly be knee-jerk reactive to the state who is once again bullying us and not looking out for the welfare of our students. What I would like to do is make a substantive motion, um, essentially where I ask for the mask mandate with the medical opt-out only option to continue for 12 and under for an additional 30 days past the October, 5th, or the October 15th to, would that be November 15th or 
13th, whatever the 30 days are. Hopefully by that time, the FDA will approve the temporary or the emergency use of the vaccination for 12 and under, and parents who choose to will have that layer of protection to offer their students. And then if we want to go forward and move the mask mandate with the medical opt-out completely, we can do so. But I, I want to make a substantive motion. Yeah, that would require a second, and I will advise the board that uh, that would create a greater risk because of the new emergency rule that was issued that says a decision needs to be in the sole discretion of the parents. So you are taking a great risk if you do that. Are we talking a financial risk? Yes. Thank you. Okay, a second is needed. Board members, do we have a second? Okay, seeing none, that vote uh, or that motion will uh, fail. All right, we're going to go ahead and continue on the conversation. Um, excuse me, Member Vaughn, did you want to continue? Um, if we're back to the friendly amendment or the original amendment, obviously I think the more time that we have for us to make changes are better. Um, I understand Member Snively, you know, she's passionate about this and she, she wants to keep it the same way that we had it, but I honestly think, you know, if we're going to go ahead and we're going to take it away altogether, arguing over 24 hours really doesn't make much of a difference, especially if I think it gives our school staff more time to prepare. Thank you. So you're committing to the 24 hour Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Member Perez. Okay, I just want a clarification. Uh, so, <laughs> we're keeping the mask in place, but removing the medical opt out. Okay, so the parents still have the choice of sending their children to school in a mask. Correct. But we are honoring parent choice. Okay. Just needed that clarification. <laughs> Member Perez, um, is that it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Member Washington. That was a show in sweet, uh, Member Perez. <laughs> I was waiting for something else here. I'm putting really? my school okay. card here. So <laughs> I'm putting on my principal hat now, okay? So as a principal, I would want to have 24 hours at least to let my faculty and staff and parents know about the change. Because if, if we say, okay, in the morning, if we say it in the morning, when you come to school, it would be confusion. I would like for the principal to be able to get on his, his or her intercom and say, this is what we have decided, the school board have decided, so as of tomorrow, as of to the next day, which is tomorrow, whatever, the next day, you would have an opt-out option. Because I think if we just say, just come to school with no mask tomorrow, some people don't look at the school board meeting. We, we would not have gotten this inf information out properly. And my, my concern is communication so everybody could understand the decision that we make. Okay? Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Hahn? Member Hahn? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to Yeah, We'll have comment. to get a little bit louder on the volume. Okay, stand by. Okay, just stand by or sit by. Okay, give it a go. I don't know if that's go. on my end. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh -huh. Getting a little feedback, so it's a little echoey. Um, so I do appreciate my colleagues' comments. I am a little surprised about um, the request for uh, a 24-hour um, delay if this, in fact, passes tonight. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, because, as Member Snively said, that consideration certainly wasn't um, provided when we put this in place. And I would think if you're concerned about staff and principals, I, I don't know why that concern wasn't thought about when we put this in place and principals and staff were scrambling to message it and uh, get, a, get procedures and protocols in place. So um, it just um, seems surprising to me. Uh, I would like to know from the superintendent 
what the criteria would be to remove the mandate altogether. Is there a transmission number, a uh, community number that you would be looking at? Uh, because, you know, we had this discussion a few months ago when you put the mandate in place with the parental opt out. It's really a hollow mandate, but you're making parents go through an extra step to opt out. So I, I guess that makes people feel better, but I, I would like to know what criteria you're using to, to eventually remove the mandate, to recommend removing the mandate. Yes, Mr. Chair, it's a fair question. Last year we tried to look at under 5% positive rate within our community. And I think we were we were trying to get there, uh, you know, as soon as possible. Then we would remove it. Um, so that would be the threshold that that I have in place right now. Um, we could circle back with some of our medical experts to to get uh, additional information. But right now, it'd be f less than five percent in a positive rate within our community. I appreciate that, and I think that's an important piece of information, no matter where you are on the side of this discussion, because I think at least people know where they stand. I think a lot of parents on both sides feel like they're on these shifting sands and never know what's going to happen. So, five percent, um, whether you you know whether folks agree with that or not, at least they have that understanding that that is you you are tied to a criteria in your decision making, and I think that's important. Um, I would certainly support a. Um, a supplemental amendment to the motion to uh, Ms. Snively's point to implement this immediately starting tomorrow. Again, the consideration was not given last time. I think that, you know, we could message this immediately. We could send out a parent link. Matter of fact, perhaps or that might already be in motion given that the staff knew that we were going to be um, discussing this this evening. Maybe that's already, I don't, I don't know if the superintendent know, wants to share, if that's already kind of on standby based on the outcome tonight. But um, I would absolutely support an amendment to the current motion. Thank you. Yes, Mr. the Chair, I will say that we are prepared for, for either way. We, we are prepared to be able to send out communications to our community and to the media. Okay, I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. It, it, my, uh, Member Combs, if you don't mind me, I say a few things before we start the second queue. Um, <clears throat> the reason, uh, and I'm going to get to the point, but we have a 93 decrease, decrease of the spread of the virus to the extent that now we have 7.8% spread. And the reasons uh, are very clear as to why this occurred. We did put in a mask mandate. Uh, we also advocated social distancing to the best of the ability you can do in a school. We did promote vaccinations and will continue. We do a lot of the cleanings uh, to sanitize uh, the classrooms and the hallways and the lunchroom. So there's a reason why we got to this point. Now, <clears throat> I would have liked to me, it makes sense to let it sunset because this is a board that has made up of seven individuals, uh, seventh largest um, district in the nation. I would like to think that we have a sense of our own community, our kids and the public, enough to afford the very first premise of a school board member's job, the safety and well-being of our students. That's our number one priority. It makes sense to me that we would sunset it at the 15th, uh, and it would make also good sense that <clears throat> that we don't keep, um, that we, we even extend it to the end of October with the hopes of our children having access to the vaccinations. That makes sense. What doesn't make sense is that we are now being, uh, let's just say, um, with great mitigation, uh, and a financial threat that will behold the uh, really a drastic consequence for our district uh, financially doesn't make sense to me as an individual board member. It makes it, it it's it's very hurtful and harmful, 
and I, I have great uh, misgivings in having to vote because of the money part, but the children need our district, the children need our services within the district, the children need our teachers, the children need our social services, the children need strong board members to be in place, not to be punished, the children need our Superintendent Davis. So with all that being said, I, I, I am being, you know, if we have an arm wrestling contest, you know, we're, I'm actually having to say like a little surrender, uh, you know, I can't do that. So I, I, I am very, very obligated to say that I'm sorry uh, to, to constituents, to the public, but for the financial well-being of our district, I cannot, cannot put us in that situation where we might be punished, and we probably will be definitively, because I also spoke or heard the Chancellor uh, Olivia the other day. So with that being said, uh, and, and in terms of 24 hours versus um, right away, I mean, it, it's, I, I think we're splitting hairs, to be honest with you. I understand the principals have to know and all the other things, of course, but we're just really keeping the policy. It's optional and all they, it, tomorrow will just be whether they want to put masks on or not. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not, ready to say commit to either one, but I'll listen to the board members on their second uh, round of queue. Um, <clears throat> thank you, um, member, uh, excuse me, member Snively. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank member Combs, I'm sorry. You know, I, I wanna say that when I initially came here this afternoon, I, I had all intention to let it sunset on the end of October. I had a lot of data with me on comparing Pinellas and Pasco and other districts and other districts around the, the country and that was my intention but then when I found out that there would be a financial you know basically a financial loss for our district then I realized that we can't wait until October 15th however I, I like many board members I'm at schools every day and the reason why I wanted the mandate initially immediately was because we were at a 25% positivity rate. We had schools where 14, 15 teachers were out. It was necessary to do that immediately because we were in, an, in, an, in a position where school board members, cabinet, they were covering lunches, they were covering classes. It was chaotic. So we had to do that mass mandate immediately because every day put thousands of kids into quarantine. This is not needed for 24 hours. We need to create less chaos in our district. It's not about what you did before and let's not do it again. That's not what it's about. It's about what's gonna be best for our schools and our principals. And I know as a principal or an assistant principal, and we can ask our chief of schools here, they would prefer to have 24 hours to cause less chaos. That is just, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. This is not political. This is about keeping our schools open, keeping our students safe, thinking about what's best for our district financially, looking at the positivity rate, and looking at common sense. Not, hey, you did it last time immediately, let's do it this time immediately. It, that makes no sense. We, need, we are here in our homes. We are not in the schools when we get a text at nine o'clock at night, and now you have teachers and parents, chaotic. You need a day to at least Look at that. I mean, th this is the part that really frustrates me that we talk about, well, we did it last time. Not, let's not do it this time. Let's look at each situation individually and see what's best for our schools. So I absolutely think we need to wait 24 hours. And I'm going to ask you, Superintendent Davis, two questions. Does that 24 hour fiscally put us more in danger? And as a superintendent, do you think it's best for schools to wait for 24 hours? So those are the two questions I'm going to ask you. Yes, ma'am, to the chair, I don't know about the fiscal impact it will have if we wait 24 hours, um, you know, sight and unseen. But I can tell you right now, the way that the uh, the Board of Education has been moving forward, they've been moving forward in an aggressive manner. And through our collective conversations, uh, that will continue. And, you know, Ms. Chair Gray was with me the other day when I had one of those conversations. As it relates to what we did last time, we did implement it immediately, and I gave, uh, it was on a Wednesday, and I gave... Thursday and Friday for a grace period for that implementation. 
to be able to, so schools would, wouldn't have to be able to chase, because what we were doing during that process was uh, trying to capture opt-out as much as we could and knowing that it was going to take time to be able to do that and have grace periods for, for the implementation. If I was to poll principals today, they probably would say any additional time would, would help us. Um, however, I believe that once we make this decision tonight, you're going to have many students that will come to school tomorrow with, without a mask. However, you know, from a, you know, and I know that we can't control, we can address as often as we can, but anytime you look at a leader, they, they will be, uh, they would appreciate the grace in that perspective, but knowing that tomorrow will be a part where individuals will transition and elect not to, to wear them. So I see both sides of it com completely. Um, from, from, from our perspective, my perspective, I do believe making this decision right now is, uh, will, will protect us financially and also allow us to be in compliance with the law in which I, I view it as. Mm. Uh, Member Combs? Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, one more thing. Oh, sorry. sorry, one more thing. And we have to understand that FTE week is the dead certain is October the 15th. So being able to make a decision now in the sooner it will be able to allow us to potentially recruit students back. We heard tonight that parents left because of the mask being implemented. To have that opt-out option, we may be able to regain students back to our organization, which is equivalent to how we get funded for, for that calculation. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, very valid and important point. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, Member Perez. Oh, excuse me, Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also had a couple questions for the superintendent. And all, all very good points made by, by, by colleagues, um, by my colleagues. So what, as far as the opt-out situation, Originally, you had this electronic form, and you were collecting data and and distributing it to teachers, and it was uh, somewhat troublesome to many parents. Is that the same type of strategy you're going to use again, or could it be understood that if your child shows up without a mask on, you're opting out? Yes, ma'am. Through the chair, we when we implemented this, I think only 15% of of our students elected to use and identify the opt out form. We still can have that available, but openly when a, a child elects to, to come and he or she doesn't have a mask, we should take that as that individual will be opting out um, because it, it just became too too cumbersome for us to st stop instruction, check Addison every single day with, with, you know, with that mask uh, implementation. So we had a number of parents. We knew that more than 15 percent who completed the, more than 15 percent were opting out. They just weren't, com parents weren't completing the form because through the, um, the executive emergency order and the ruling, it didn't mandate that any way, shape or form that, that we would do that. But we were just doing it as a safeguard to be able to have, um, you know, a place, an indicator so that teachers and, and schools could know. But uh, we found ourselves for it not to be really a true reflection of the students who are opting out at scale. Okay, I appreciate you clarifying that just because um, I understand how principals, I'm sure, would uh, appreciate the opportunity to have as much time as possible to prepare. I'm sure after your recommendation clarifying that, I'm sure the chief of schools would probably also agree the more time uh, the principals have. So I can live with that mm -hmm. in the motion as long as there is a grace period for people so because just like you said there will be students that show up without masks tomorrow and I don't want to hear any type of disciplinary actions or um, shaming or bullying or treating any or treating any discriminatorily with uh, with that um, for that 24 hours or through the through Friday um, and I would really like if there were no zero, if there were zero necessary required opt out form that people have to find on a website and go fill out, even if they don't even have access to a website or or um, Wi-Fi, so because there are, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of challenges that people have in having access to that form, even knowing that the form exists, and there was a lot of, there were a lot of issues around the opt out form with. Um, suspicion of collecting data and util utilizing it in, not, in a not positive way for students. And at the end of the day, you heard some of the, the things that parents were saying what were happening in classrooms. That was disheartening to have a child separated from the rest of their class or moved to the back of a classroom or you know, pointed out 
um, that's disheartening. And, and I understand that, you know, there are concerns about for safety, but there are also mental health concerns. I mean, what that does to a child from an adult, when an adult says something to a child, that is taken very seriously by many students and sometimes has an impact that's la la lasting a much, much longer time than just that moment that it happens. They, I mean, I remember things that happened in my elementary school w when certain things were said to me by a teacher. I took, you know, I took it to heart for a very long time. So I just don't want that happening to our students. I don't want them to be ostracized. I don't want them treated differently. I just want masks to go away or just be optional without any of that administrative uh, um, bureaucracy. Bureauc thank you, bureaucracy. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Member Perez, Member Washington, Member Vaughn, and then uh, before that, uh, M Mr. Porter, remind us again, or do we have two motions on the floor? We have one motion. One motion, and there's been, there was discussion, but there was never an amended. An okay, motion. so right now we're looking at the 24-hour motion. Right. Okay, thank you. Just in case we lose track. Member Perez? Okay. So, um, and, and Member Snively, I appreciate your comments about shaming and bullying, but the shaming and bullying also went both ways. You know, there's shaming and bullying for um, not just students who wear and, and um, opt to wear masks, but also there's, you know, we've witnessed that here um, when adults came to speak at our board meetings and uh, um, the shaming that they uh, put some of the individuals through when they were wearing masks um, here. So, you know, it would be a, uh, an incredible lesson for adults also to remember that our children are watching and they are mimicking um, behaviors from adults and they take those behaviors to school and they um, use those behaviors in schools in not so nice ways, um, you know, with their peers. So we all need to get those lessons, not just only the students who decide to wear the mask, but also those who opt out. So I have a question um, for the superintendent. Um, as everyone knows, I work for the Tampa VA and I um, am a provider there. And every Friday we get information. And of course, this past Friday, uh, we were told that the infection rate, of course, in the hospitals right now is five times, um, has decreased five times. Um, hospital admission rates are down by 10, 10, per, 10 times and death rates also have decreased. So, which is great. Um, and this has um, been because vaccinated individuals um, have increased and mask individuals also um, have also, you know, people are a little bit more aware. And so everyone's cooperation has helped to serve to bring these numbers down. So how did putting the mask mandate into effect overnight previously um, affect our principles. That was 30 days ago. Yes, ma'am. So anytime that we make a, a short decision, it create it openly creates uh, frustrations with anyone. You know, when I gave short decisions to the board, you know that. But overarchingly, our with the grace period, our principals made the they do a good job making the adjustments. So you know, we gave them uh, 48 hours to you know to being able to make certain that. They were not going to hold students accountable with that 48-hour uh, period. We wanted to make certain that parents truly understood what the the opt-out uh, documentation was so that they can interact with it and uh, being able to submit it. So one thing our principals and our school-based leaders, they're remarkable. They make adjustments. They're going to make adjustments. They, they'll make adjustments tonight because that's what they always do, and they do it efficiently and effectively. And uh, if, they gave, if we gave 24 hours, they'll make that adjustment as well. So, But we will communicate. We are prepared for the communication protocols. We'll send it out tonight through parent link. We'll send it on social media and we'll have a media release ready to go in an email. But still, um, even tomorrow, the, um, the students can 
take something home or the announcements will be made or the, the parents will be made aware Absolutely. or whatever. Yes, ma'am. We'll continue on. this process probably from now until the end of the week to be able to make certain that, that all of our parents are informed of our decision. Okay. And men, Member Vaughn in the past has requested, and now myself I'm going to request, that a board workshop regarding our role here and the overreach of the Department of Education that we really need. Um, a, a workshop um, here regarding this because the Department of Education really definitely is um, stepping on our toes when it comes to what we're elected to do here in this district and so it needs to be um, you know we really need to um, have this um, as a board workshop a discussion something um, in the in the public because this is getting to be um, way beyond ridiculous at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. And uh, what we're looking at is getting on our way to consensus with the original motion from Member um, Combs with a grace period. Uh, if we can go ahead and commit to consensus, I'm happy to, well, I'm going to continue anyway. Member uh, Washington? Yeah, Superintendent, so you asked my question because I don't want uh, kids coming to school tomorrow and somebody penalized because they don't have on a mask. So if it would be very beneficial for you tonight if you would yes, just disseminate that information out so kids are not penalized, or penalized at all. Yes, sir. So we will have, as I said, a press release ready to go on both sides. It was pre-prepared uh, communication to all of our employees and information sent out to every one of our parents. And then we'll, we'll, we'll also post it on social media. So those four prongs will be are, are ready to go this evening. And we'll continue that over the next couple of days just to educate our community. And, and just for a note here, I'm not worried about penalizing me as a board member taking my money because they could use that money to help somebody else. My concern is... I want the district. We don't want to be in hard times with the district because we need to be successful and, and, and do the things it take. So I'm not worried about the money. If he penalizes me with the money, hey, so be it. I'm not here for the money. I'm here for students and what we think is best for Hillsborough County Public School System. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Member Washington. And are you also in favor of the 24-hour with a grace period? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Member Vaughn? Thank you. Um, to clarify, what the original motion was, was to go back to what you originally had, which was parents having to go on and fill out a form to opt out. I understand that Member Snively is concerned that maybe there's a digital divide or people can't access that form. However, if parents are that devoted to sending their child to school without a mask, simply completing a form online should not be completely out of the realm of keeping our schools safe and talking about having a, 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 a mandate. I mean, the way that Mr. Porter explained it, the way that we introduced this motion was we are going back to what you had originally formatted, which was parents went online and felt, filled out the form, which is a very simple process. It, completely supports parental choice. It doesn't stop that. We make the forms available, uh, paper copy if they can't, but it allows teachers to know who's opting out to say just because a kid shows up in a, without a mask that they have decided to opt out is not accurate. It's not responsible. It's not upholding a mask policy. There are lots of kids who don't have a mask, who drop it on the way to school, who don't know that it's in their backpack. Sometimes my son, I've put it an extra one on his backpack. The one popped on his face. He didn't know he had it in there. Unless he had asked for another one, he would have gone around maskless. And it's not my will for my child not to have a mask on at school. So to go from what we're talking about to having a full medical out policy to changing that to accommodate the Surgeon General's request to completely going to, well, now we're not even going to have a form and we're not going to, you know, we're just going to assume because a child it doesn't have a mask is not what I'm agreeing to. So I want clarity on this motion. Okay, uh, clarity, it's, that's not part of the motion, but you are asking for clarification, Superintendent Davis? 
Can you give the clarification about? Yes, Mr. Chair. We openly tried to implement the the form just to have clarity for parents to be able to fill out. When 15 percent of the of the parents filled out, and there's a larger percentage that didn't fill out, we just were chasing it. And this is another administrative, uh, you know, uh, ask on our staff and taxing to our staff to be able to capture. And uh, you know, so overall, when you look at the emergency rule, we we openly just asked them to do that out of good faith. We can't mandate do they do that or complete that form. And parents knew that majority of parents knew that and elected not to implement it. So you know, openly as we from lessons learned, being able to transition, either we're going to implement you know mandate masks with the opt out. The opt out is is a parent selection selection not to be able to to wear a mask. And it goes back to being able to if a parent feels in any way, shape, or form that they're harassed or intimidated, that goes into some of those conversations that we all got emails that that was a reality that was happening. I do agree with Ms. Perez that it happened on both sides, but it's just another administrative duty where we're not going to get a true reflection in, uh, of the students who are our parents who are electing to, to opt out in that process. So what you're saying is you're not going to require that, that form any longer? Moving forward, no ma'am. And I would also like to say that I completely emphasize with the parents who came here and spoke and, and Member Snively brought up several things they said, but we also got a plethora of emails where there were people who came who who did not come because one, they don't feel comfortable coming to this environment where there are several people not wearing masks. And also as Member Perez has spoken to, they've been harassed by people who haven't been wearing masks outside waiting to speak. In fact, I had someone today ask if they could come in and we were filled at capacity because they were so uncomfortable by the cheering and the all of the yelling every time someone spoke mass. So if we're going to have a conversation about reflecting our community and what parents want, I don't want it to just be reflective of the people who came and spoke today. We have several, several emails. I got way more emails asking to extend the mask mandate and from panic parents, especially for kids who can't get vaccinated, begging us to keep this mandate than parents we had show up to speak today. And some, we don't even know if many of those are parents, if they have children in our school district, or if they even live in this county. So let, I mean, I just want to be realistic as we're having this conversation about who we're representing as to what that looks like. <clears throat> okay, and we're about ready to um, to vote, and I'll have uh, Mr. Porter uh, rephrase, I, I know, uh, he'll rephrase the motion. Uh, Member Combs? Yeah, I, I just want to say that I agree with Member Vaughn. When you go to high schools, you see a lot of children wearing it underneath their nose. I mean, a lot of high school kids have ability to have a vaccination. You know, when I send my child to high school, I don't know what she's doing. But if my child is a, se a seven-year-old and I have a immunocompromised grandparent or whatever the case is, and I'm sending them to school thinking that they're wearing a mask and they can just take it off, then that doesn't make sense. I personally want to make sure that we continue to have the computer opt out or the form opt out available. I mean, that's that's what we want to do to make sure, because I don't want tomorrow to all of a sudden we're back to normal. There are a lot of um, communities, schools where having this is not going to change it. Tomorrow when you walk in, all those students are still going to be wearing them. But if we're going to have this idea of like, okay, well, wear it or not, if you're eight years old, you can make your own decision. That's not what a parent wants. So my motion was to, to continue to go back to it was the way it was initially with a parent opt out form by computer or paper and then to not and also have the medical opt out. So that was my intention for the motion. So I want to make sure that's very clear that I want to continue to require the parental opt out by computer or whatever. And that will still keep us in line, Mr. Porter, that will still keep us that we are still following the law. We will not receive any financial, um, you know, any financial repercussions from it. But the idea is to also keep you know, I think a lot of communities will continue keeping the masks. I know when I was at Hillsborough High School, most of those children, you know, said, you know, let us choose, um, but, you know, let's make sure that my younger brother or sister, that the parents can make that decision. So I want to make sure that's very clear. Okay, so we're going to make this motion crystal clear. We heard from Member Combs, um, and now we're going to go ahead and have that authored, Mr. Porter, and then we're going to vote. So the motion, as I understand it, is to remove the requirement for medical certificate um, and allow a mask mandate with a parental opt-out. The only issue seems to be what the parental opt-out looks like. 
So, and that goes to the superintendent's recommendation. It also goes to what the board's initial action was. Uh, the, the mask mandate in Hillsborough County for this school year was not authored by the board, it was by the superintendent. And you were not specific about what the parental opt-out looked at like. That You left that to him for his administrative duties as the superintendent. And he's explained to you how he did it previously and how he intends to do it going forward. So that wasn't something the board had voted on before. The only vote the board took was to require the medical certificate. So what the motion on the floor does is remove the medical certificate, allow, still maintain the superintendent's mask mandate with the parental opt-out, and then how that's implemented, unless the board directs otherwise, is it's up to the superintendent to decide. Okay. Uh, there is a... Okay, uh, Member Snively, and then we'll vote before we forget exactly what we're voting on. Okay. Here we go. Um, <laughs> right. Me Member Snively, go ahead. Sorry about that. So, um, so I just want to make sure I, I'm clear on what you're saying because um, I know the intention of your motion, but it didn't specifically originally say an opt-out form. And you're saying that there will be an opt-out there, there, because that's what the motion was, to have a parental opt-out, but then it is up to the superintendent on how to administrate the opt-out portion of this particular situation. Unless the board directs otherwise. Um, so that would be something that would require a separate motion because the only thing on the floor now is removing the medical uh, certificate. Okay. Um, well, I thought there was more than that, uh, Mr. No, Porter. are you able to amend my motion and add the parental opt-out? up to you. So, no, okay, so let's be clear. Let's, yes. We've got to, un this is layered. Before the board acted at all, the superintendent imposed a max mask mandate for this district that allowed a parental opt-out. The board did not vote on that, nor did the, vo the board dictate what the parental opt-out looked like. You heard him describe how he did that. When then you, you added the layer, the, the board's only action was adding the layer of a medical certificate. That's being removed today. So if you just, if, with a straight up vote, all that would happen would be you'd go back to what was happening before you voted, which was a mask mandate with a parental opt out. The board had never given any direction, from my understanding, or took no official vote on what the parental opt out looked like. So if you wanted, to do that, then you could do that with a subsequent motion, but I, you just need to listen to the superintendent's recommendation about what that means administratively. But that's, that's they're two separate issues, really. You're, you're voting to remove the medical certificate, and then if you want to get into the day-to-day -day operations of what that looks like, that's a separate discussion. It really is a separate discussion because that wasn't something you voted on previously. And, and, and through the chair, I would, sorry. No, go right yeah, through, through the chair. I mean, I'm only speaking through our experiences. I mean, with 15 percent of our of our parents only completing it, I'm just being honest about where we are and and what the requirements. Uh, you know, re the documents required from the from the from Tallahassee didn't point pinpoint or identify that we could even do that. We just did it to be able to have clarifications for issues that Ms. Combs and Ms. Vaughn spoke about, about whether a learner walked into a classroom, he or she was supposed to have a mask and they didn't so that we can make sure that we accommodated it. We just were openly, you know, unsuccessful at, you know, through our experiences with mandating that, with that document. I would do it at the will of the board. I mean, I, I openly uh, will continue to be for parental choice for parents to decide, and we're at a better situation than we were. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that, that I shared the experiences that we've had with that implementation. And I hear from uh, the member Combs' motion that that is inherently included in that, the electronic, however, however you wish, uh, but it's not, okay. That's so a, that's do that, but you need, we need to be clear. So yeah. okay, well, Member Avon, and then we'll go ahead and uh, uh, I, I would say this: let Member Combs restate her motion before we vote on it. Member Avon, I'm just going to um, see if we can amend the motion to include the superintendent to direct the superintendent to uh, require the parents to fill out the medical opt-out form online. Just amend. Member Combs motion. That would require a second. Okay, so you have a second from Member Combs. So what the board now needs to vote Not on. medical opt-out, you meant parental opt-out. Parental, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't, yeah. 
So, okay. No, it's, uh, it's clear. The record should reflect that uh, Member Vaughn's made a motion to amend the motion to further define parental opt-out as requiring um, a, a form online. So that's, that's an amendment that the board needs to vote on. So here's what you're voting on an amendment. So what she, if you're in favor of requiring a form, whether it's online or another way to be required for the parental opt out, you should vote yes. If you're not, if you're just in favor of allowing the parents to opt out without any form, you should vote no. And then this is not on the main motion. This is not whether, this is, this is an amendment. So if you want to go with what Ms. Vaughn, Ms. Ms. Vaughn and Ms. Combs suggested, which is requiring a form online, vote yes. If you want to go with what Ms. Snively is recommending, which is to just allow the parents to opt out, and that's the superintendent's recommendation as well, you need to vote no. Okay, so you should vote on the amendment. Unless there's, did you have further discussion on the amendment? Okay. Member Snively? Well, I think it's really important that we listen to the superintendent and the fact that, you know, no offense, but it, that the way that we did it was not working it it was kind of it kind of was a fail you know unfortunately but it, and, you know i know we tried to collect that information and uh, i i'm concerned about the teachers responsibilities every single day to patrol masks now if they're going to if parents are going to have to fill out a form and that information goes to teachers and then teachers get a list and it could change on a regular basis and um, then they're going to have to, you know, every day be mask police in their classroom all over again. And that takes away instructional time every day from students. So I understand what you're saying about the younger kids and making sure that they learn. But that is a, a parent's responsibility. Part of a parent's responsibility is also to instill those those um, rules or that discipline into that child if they're supposed to wear the mask all day. Um, and it shouldn't have to be on the shoulders of our teachers and our administrators every single day to police masks for our students and always keep up with who's supposed to wear one, who's not supposed to wear one. I have to look at my list every day. I have to memorize. And, you know, uh, you get, you know, then they start doing, well, sticky note here, sticky note there. And then you're delineating between kids and discriminating and separating. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very concerned about how this, one, the fact that we're telling you how to do your job, because that's a whole other issue that we're not supposed to do statutory and two that it didn't work and you're telling us it didn't work yet we're still trying to vote for it again so maybe we could come up with a different I don't know a different way a different method maybe we give you some time to figure out a different way of of managing it because that you told us that didn't work and so I'm just concerned that one we're telling you how to do your job and two you're t you're telling us that you, you can't do it um, maybe we should give you a different uh, an opportunity to do something different but we should trust you to do something different that would that find something that works yes, ma'am. So that's your job yes, so through the chair i think the biggest thing was uh, is ele in elementary um with uh being able to know who has opted out and who is in who is not and i think that's more because our our younger students don't have availability to the vaccination at the older age uh you know we uh we know that students have more accessibility to have additional uh, opportunities of vaccination but being able to implement it we, you know overarchingly this is going you know it, it can it will create additional stressors you know potentially for leaders and for teachers as well but i understand the the indication to be able to know within the elementary side of it so maybe it's elementary being able to make certain they fill it out especially for grades um, pre-k through fifth grade and then uh, you know for secondary for those just having that opt-out option all right so this is a whole another a process and procedure right now there's a motion on the floor for the recognition of a form electronic or not uh, so it's a yes or no. Member Washington, are you wanting to say something on it? Uh, yes. Okay, so if we don't have, how do we know kids opt out? We, you got to have some accountability, I would think. You know what I mean, Sue? Yes, sir, so to the chair, the, the requirements uh -huh. that the statutory emergency rule doesn't identify uh, or require any documentation. We only ask for it to be able to leverage and identify to give information to, to staff just in case someone did lose their mask or someone was in the classroom who did not, uh, who elected, a student elected not to wear it with their parent warned them to do that. 
the issue is, is the, you know, we pushed out, push this form, fill this form out. This is what we need. And I just became a, a lot of stress and a lot of focus on trying to chase that information uh, through fooling to get a, a true reflection of what was transpiring in schools. So, you know, you had some pockets of the community that did it, some pockets of the community that, that did not do it. So um, you're going to have that either way now. If we mandate it now, you're still going to have pockets of students yep. and parents that are not going to complete it. Right. And, uh, and from our side of it, per looking at the documentation and all of the, the emergency ruling of that, we cannot and will not discipline students based on whether or not they fill that document out. Right. That, that's a great answer. You, you're exactly right. Uh, the next one, how is the other counties? Are they using form for opt out? Or? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Through the chair, I'm going to ask staff if we. It's inconsistent. Anybody? Some are using a, an opt out form, some are, are not, and just using it as an you know as a learner shows up without a mask. Um, then they are reason, they're identifying that as an opt out option. But uh, you know what we could do is is go back and look at surrounding counties to see what they are doing and determine what more efficient way. But in, in, you know as as of right now. Um, it's you know it's going to be inconsistent either way you do it. Right. It's just going to be inconsistent. Right. I understand. I understand. I just wanted to get some clarification here because, you know, if you don't opt out, the parents because your kids could just come to school, take his mask off, the parent right. never know it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I know. see the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a valid point, um, but, you know, we don't want to run your, we don't want to want to run your daily operation because you're the suit. You know, you you operate the district, and and uh, that's your job. So. If we don't come to a conclusion tonight, we can always come back and you can think of something, get with your staff, y'all can come up with some type of solution to how we'll do it. And through the chair, we we will we can we've learned to make adjustments for the last eighteen months. If we need to make I adjustments bet, yeah. in, the, in the next week or two weeks right. after we implement, we will. We can do that. Um, you know, but uh, from from our side of it, we just saw the implementation last time when we pushed it we didn't really capture a true reflection of where we were. Okay, thank you. So I think we're starting to beat a dead horse, but probably we either need to revisit this particular part because right now we're not hearing. You don't have the preparation to make a process, uh, and we're just arguing from back and forth and back and forth. I'll hear two more comments uh, if we feel like we can vote at this at that particular motion, or we will shelve it because we're not getting anywhere. We're just going back and forth. Uh, Member Vaughn conclude and Member Combs conclude, and we're going to make the vote and the decision. Enough is enough. Go ahead. Yeah. Is it on? There we go. So what you're saying by saying it didn't work is you're saying that there were some parents who didn't fill out the form and sent their kids without a mask regardless. We've heard several parents tonight say it didn't matter if we had a medical opt out. They sent their kids in passive resistance and told them not to. We haven't really implemented the policy or found a way to implement it even when we had a harsher medical opt out the entire time. So to say that that one piece was a failure and that there were parents who, sh who filled it out or didn't fill it out and still had kids showing up isn't any different than any of our policy. We had lots of parents who said that they were going to do whatever they wanted and not go by our guidelines and not let us know that they were opting out. So I don't understand where is keeping this form if it adds one more layer and it gives parents who are on the fence the, the decision that they don't want to go through that extra step and they would rather put a mask on and creates one more layer of protection in our schools, why it matters. I, most of the teachers said they weren't getting a classroom list anyway. Most of the teachers I know weren't being mass police or overly implementing it. So I don't understand why we're acting like this one extra layer that may or may not put a few more masks in in class, especially when you're talking about our most vulnerable layer of students, our most vulnerable kids who don't have access to the vaccine. Why it's such a big deal to have this form. Duval has this form. Orange County has this form. When you talk about the surrounding and other counties, absolutely they have this form where parents have to go on. When we talk about opting out of sex education, is that a superintendent? Is that a board policy? There's all sorts of policies that we have where we talk about maybe how we're going to direct you to handle operations. So to act like all of a sudden this one time is something that we're overstepping and going into your, your purview of operations when we're completely removing an opt-out medical mask mandate to create one more layer is confusing to me. So I, I, I stand by my motion to amend and keep that one piece at the very least. Thank you, Member Vaughn, Member Combs, and then we'll vote. 
Um, yes, I also agree, especially keeping that layer for the elementary. Um, I think if, if a school or community gets that information and they don't want to use it, that's okay. But at least provide it because every community differs. Every We have such a large district. Some schools some principals, some assistant principals want that data. Some teachers want that data. Some of them are not going to be using it. We did it before. I don't understand why it's so difficult to do it now. And from the very beginning, I walk around high schools, kids are not wearing properly. I mean, nobody is going to be the mass police. That hasn't changed. But if it gives that parent and gives that community a, a little, makes them feel safer, or if I'm sending my child tomorrow and I'm concerned and my child is eight years old or seven years old and and sometimes is not a rule follower, and I want them to wear the mask, I think it's important to have that extra layer. I think we're going from zero to 100. Let's, let's at least move a little bit to 50 and have some kind of compromise. D do I feel bad that it's a lot of work? No, but we did it before very quickly. I know we can do it again. Thank you, Member Combs. Uh Whoops, okay, so, yeah, this is the amendment. This is the so, amendment. Go and ahead. I'll break it down for you. So if you're in favor of requiring a, the parents to fill out a form online, vote yes. If you're in favor of, if you're not in favor of that and just allowing the students or parents to opt out without any sort of form, vote no. Not the main motion. So however you vote, there's still another vote to follow. Okay. So, Please. Mr. Washington had a question. Yeah, th 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 we're not saying like fill out paper form, or we just saying on. No, it could be it could be either, could be either way. We did it either, either way. So either it'd be way. accessibility okay, either online, so or we did paper. Okay. Whether there's a formal, fo if you're in favor of a formal form, vote yes. If you're not, if you're in favor of no form, vote no. Okay, all right. Vote when your lights. There'll right. be another vote afterwards. And then we'll restate that. Okay, board members, we're voting. Uh, Member Hahn? Okay. Two no's, uh, Member Snively, Member Hahn, and uh, the remainder are yes. Okay, Thank you, so board now, members. So now the main motion on the floor has been amended. So the main motion now is to remove the medical certificate, allow the parental opt out, but there's a form required for the parental opt out. That's now the motion on the floor. Okay. Uh, please vote when your lights are on. And this is the original motion made by Member Combs. Okay. Member Hahn? I'm sorry, I did. It's, oh, there you, uh, I it's see a it. little delayed. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. We have uh, Member Vaughn, a no, and the re remainder of the board members saying yes. Okay, so just to, so the public's clear. So the board has voted to remove the requirement for a medical certificate. There's a mask mandate in place in Hillsborough County with a parental opt-out, and parents must provide a form that will be provided by the district to opt-out. This will take effect in 24 hours, so um, they will give time for the principals to notice. There'll be a grace period to allow people to come into compliance. Madam Chair, if we could request a five-minute continuance um, or five-minute recess so that a lot of the stuff can be settled and communicated out so that we can be on top of this. Excellent suggestion. Five minutes, and then we're going to get to the discussion items.
members, we're now going into the discussion <laughs> items, and um, hopefully it will flow. I want to thank the board members for their very um, careful remarks and their intentional um, thinking towards the last item. Uh, certainly, it, it, um, I think we all came out with an agreeable um, next steps <clears throat> to the best of our ability. Difficult decision. All right, agenda item 702, approve the final 2021 and 2022 facilities five-year work plan. Superintendent Davis, will you highlight? Yes, ma'am, to the chair. Uh, you know, Florida statutory requires school districts to develop and approve a five-year capital outlay work plan, and our job is to submit it to the Department of Education. This work plan will identify how we're going to leverage and address major repairs, renovations, add new plan construction, uh, address class size information, and also look at how we will implement uh, portable classrooms in our school district. This is a $2.2 billion expenditure related to capital funding, and then, uh, you know, which around $1 billion will be leveraged to be able to use and address maintenance and major uh, major issues or major repairs within our school district. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Um, I need a motion and a second to approve item 702. I have a motion by Member Combs, a second by Member Washington, and um, right now we have uh, Member Snively. Would you like to have discussion? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, one of the reasons I pulled this down to the discussion agenda was because it is such a big item, and um, I, I believe that um, we we w certainly want to be transparent about where we're spending our capital dollars, uh, our taxpayer dollars, our referendum dollars. And uh, since you made the um, presentation during your superintendent comments, uh, don't necessarily need to, to rehash everything that's on the five-year work plan, but I'm, I want to thank you for providing the slide that the public could see what we were voting on t tonight, and I know that, um, you know, our, I, unfortunately I had to drop out, a, drop off of our meeting towards the end with the, the joint Board of County Commissioners and School Board meeting the other day. Um, so I, I just wanted to get a quick update on where did we leave off at the end of that meeting. Um, what I understood was that we have to revise or the um, interlocal agreement is going to be revised. What's, a, what's the timeline on something like that and where did we kind of leave off with, with that so the public knows where we are as well in, a, as in addition to the board? Yes, ma'am, to the chair. It was really a productive meeting. I think a lot of pre-work that uh, our operations team and uh, that, Bonnie, that Bonnie Wise and myself have been involved with, with uh, Chris and his team and Amber, they've done a really good job with the BOC staff to really start moving the needle with a lot of these projects. Where we stand now is that we've asked the BOCC to really help us revise the interlocal agreement by December, in December. So when we transition to the new year, we have a, a better game plan and remove any potential barriers with transportation transportation methodologies and other elements so that we can be able to uh, you know be in concert with selecting the right sites what we own what we have to do related to um, all the, uh, the the elements mr. Farkas and just want to add I mean it sounds very easy to say we need to revise the interlocal agreement and uh, and it's going to solve all the problems I just want to point out that is a huge challenge to do um, Amber and her team and 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 that team on the other side of the half, Greg and his team will be working. Will be working in concert, as, as Mr. Uh, Davis said. But it is going to be a huge challenge. There are some big items, big tasks on that list of things that we're going to have not agree on. That we're not going to see eye to eye on. Um, so it is aggressive to be in December. That we're committed to that. Um, but we will obviously come back to the board with updates. So that we're going to um, send some information out to you because we know some of you have some very strong feelings about that and that's have a passion for that. So we're going to ask if you want to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with us. Uh, do share that before we start that process. We want to leave that up to the board to do that. Um, and then we'll go start having those conversations. We'll update you as those big items come in and, and in each one of those. But it is going to be a huge task, but that is our commitment we left. Short-term goal was to uh, make sure that the Westlake property, um, they couldn't talk too much about it because as you were there, because they're going to vote on it. But short-term to try to get that approved and long-term, meaning that that would solve the long-term problems would be done before December. So that is our goal. Um, thank you. I appreciate that information. And um, I think it's, you know, it's good to keep this out in, in front of us. Uh, thank you for offering to do one-to-ones. Uh, I think I think this is on 
Growth management is on our suspended agenda as well, so that it continues to come to us as changes are are made to the the five year um, the five year plan. So, uh, so thank you for for keeping that out in front of us and making sure that we are managing the growth as best as we can. You know, I I think we're also going to have to maybe even look at some alternative solutions for built bu building schools and places that we can't get the infrastructure so we're gonna to have to really start getting creative and innovative about coming up with solutions because we can't wait for however long it could possibly take for the interlocal agreement to be finalized before we, we have we kids we've got kids busting out of schools in South County and uh, there and when we talk about earlier today in our workshop why people leave and decide for their children to go to a charter school or home school or a private school or virtual school sometimes it's the overcrowding and they they are very concerned about how many kids are in the class and in the school and the cafeteria and they're the quality of education the quality of, of school life is diminished in an overcrowded school um, so uh, just thank you and we got to keep pushing forward pretty hard to get these schools built for and these stations built for our, for our students to avoid continuous overcrowding thank you and uh, to member Snively's point a one-on-one -on -one with every board member I think is very much needed and with a little bit of input about the uh, interlocal agreement because I think we all have a little bit of something to say so um, and and that, if that's okay uh, member Snively we'll, we will put a one-on-one -on -one together. Mr. Farkas, Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're gonna have a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Okay? Yep. All right. Yep, so, thank you, um, uh, Member Snobbly, for pulling this. Please vote when your lights are on. Member Hong? Ah, alas, okay. Unanimous. 605, invit oops. 605 invitation to bid custodial equipment superintendent davis will you highlight this item yes ma'am this is an invitation to bid for custodial equipment this is for us to be able to receive pricings on uh on goods services floor scrubbers uh carpet cleaners wet dry vacuums and um and hand trucks so we went out this is the reason we pulled this this is because this is seven hundred fifty thousand dollars used in general fund and board members have asked me to bring anything pull anything related to general fund for the community to be apprised and for transparency and uh <clears throat> i need a motion and a second I have a motion by Member Washington, a second by Member Snively. Member Snively, would you like to m make a comment? Uh, just to follow up on the superintendent's comment, I, I thought since this was um, three quarters of a million dollars of expenditure from our general fund, it would be a good item to pull up for any board discussion if we needed it or just to be transparent about the utilization. Uh, we're making us an assumption that these expenditures can't come from other any other place like capital funds or any other category it has to come out of general funds is that correct yes, okay thank you mm. thank you member snively uh, board members please vote when your lights are on okay um, it's unanimous with uh, member Han right alert as ever all right <laughs> um, 611 requests for proposals for waterproofing services Superintendent Davis, will you highlight this item? Yes, ma'am. 611 is proposal for waterproofing services. So, you know, anytime that we are, are going to a facility, one thing we want to do is be able to make certain that there's no accessibility for water to enter our buildings, whether that's uh, through windows, whether that's through flooding, window leaks. So this being able to have a request for proposal of $6 million to be able to use capital and referendum funds to be able to address our facilities. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs, a second by Member Snively. Um, and discussion, Member Vaughn? Thank you. Yeah, there were a few items I um, said could go back to the consent agenda, but it was too late. Um, originally, I pulled this one because even though it's not general funds, anytime we do have a $6 million purchase, uh, similar to Member Snively, um, you know, I like it to be highlighted and for people to see what we're spending our money on with a purchase is that large. Um, but like I said, I, it could go back to consent. So I don't have any questions on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board members, please vote when your lights are on.
Okay. Oops. <laughs> hey. Ah, oh, there's a reason. <laughs> Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, next is 612 Bond count, uh, Council. Uh, Superintendent Davis, uh, will you highlight this item? Yes, Mayor of the Chair. This is a bond council to utilize services for, uh, to provide bond council services for insurance of debt and along with certificates and COPS uh, within our uh, organization, so certificates of uh, participation. This provides con uh, continuous legal advice for us for relevant debt issues and uh, in current and prior years debt issues and also lets them look at our master lease program as well. The biggest reason that uh, this is being pulled as well because we're using general funds to be able to um, create and extend this purchase. Thank you. Um, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Washington, a second by Member Combs, and uh, Member Snively uh, is fine with this, so we're going to go ahead and vote when your lights are on. <coughs> okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, board members. Uh, 613, and uh, Member Vaughn, did you want me to put this back to the consent? Is this the one that talks about the testing our water to make sure yeah. it's safe? This one's coming right here. This wastewater. 613 will be. I want to discuss that yes, one. 613? Okay. Sorry. Um, this is the invitation to bid for water and wastewater laboratory. Superintendent Davis, will you highlight this item? Yes, ma'am. This is an invitation to bid, uh, you know, within our school district to be able to address water and uh, wastewater laboratory. So we always do assessments within our organization to determine whether or not we need to address our water to, sh to ensure it's safe for our students. We know that anything that's prior to 1978, we test annually. Anything after 1978, we test uh, on a three-year basis. And we just want to make certain that there's no lead or no contamination within our water. This is a $70,000 expenditure through capital funds. Uh, Mr. Farkas, anything else you want to add? No? That's it. <clears throat> Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Henry, uh, Member Washington and a second by Member Snively. Um, and uh, discussion, Member uh, Vaughn, you pulled this item. I just wanted to clarify because I've had several parents contact me and ask about the safety of our water. I guess there was an article written a while ago and I, and I just wanted to confirm that this is because we are testing our water and we've clarified that our drinking water is safe and that there's not lead in that and we've been responsive to it and just to be able to address parents who still have some concerns about that. So that's what this is in regards to as well, right? Yes, ma'am, through the chair, we are statutorily required to be with the Department of, of Health and also Environment and Protection to be able to assess our water often, so we do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Member Vaughn, are you satisfied with the answer? Okay, um, let's go ahead and vote when your lights are on, board members. It's unanimous. Thank you, board members. 614 agreement for the purchase of HCL portal server and connect software from Espante Technology. And Superintendent Davis, will you highlight this item? Yes, ma'am. This is a portal server and connect software that serves all of our applications with EdConnect uh, for that our teachers access and our uh, and our employees have access to. At the same token, this is also for our parents for student choice to be able to use and serves as software and other systems. So it's really required to be able to access our student information system. We do believe this will be a one-year additional purchase, and then this will can potentially be sunset. We'll keep the board apprised as we transition to new systems within our organization. The reason this is. Uh, uh, also brought for this is general funds of being able to use $119,000 for this expenditure. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs and a second by Member Washington. Uh, Member Snively, you pulled this item. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for pointing out that obviously we need this to continue the software in order to continue some of the existing programs. Um, I did have a question. It's a, it's kind it's regarding this item, but it's almost a general question when it comes to this. Uh, when 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 your uh, you and your team superintendent give us a cover sheet with an explanation of the um, details of the purchase. What would be um, very helpful for us is I'd like to know what did we pay 
last year. Okay. And what did we pay the year before that and the year before that? Like, if you could tell me for the last five years what we've been paying on this contract, for any contract that renews, um, we get the contract. Like, we know how much it's going to cost. I can go through the whole contract that we're going to approve. But I'd like to see Absolutely. the last contract or the differences even in the last contract this because say let's say this contract is more much more or less i'd like an explanation as to well why is this 15 percent more than it was last year are we getting more from it or are, are we getting an expansion of services um so that would be very helpful for board members i think to know if, if there's a, a if we could see a trend in what we're paying for these contracts and maybe an explanation of any variance that's more than say I don't know what would make sense 10 percent 15 percent whatever the threshold that makes sense would be um, I think it would be very helpful thank you yes ma'am I think that's a great idea and we can always use that financial history lesson uh, so I think uh, that that superintendent Davis is a great recommendation um, for us to make better decisions I would like to at this time uh, suggest that we vote when your lights are on And there she is. Okay, uh, it's unanimous. Thank you, board members. Uh, 615 approval of the professional development, the Big B method with optimal performance. Hmm. Superintendent Davis, will you highlight this item? Yes, ma'am. This is a request for transformation schools. We know that there's a definitely a need for us to continue to address uh, nine uh, nonviolent communication protocols within our schools. So every one of our transformation schools, we will be able to train up to 15 educators per school, and they will be able to address the trauma responsive environments. So here they'll be able to look at frameworks for, uh, you know, be, uh, with interaction between adults and students related to observations, uh, feelings, needs, requirement of judgment and communication effectively, and there to be a multi-stage process that uh, teachers will have to go through, and potentially a multi-year process, 15 educators for the first year, and then transition to the second year for uh, 20 educators to be able to close up potentially looking at all of their individuals uh, at their school to be trained. This is an individual that is locally um, a consultant that is, uh, has local uh, effectiveness, did a lot of work in Tallahassee related to Leon County Schools and being able to move uh, the needle related to decrease in student discipline data. And this is a, you know, a format to be able to increase support for teachers, their well-being, to be able to create that uh, you know, supportive and inclusive environment and at the same token being able to give them the you know to improve our confidence and problem solving skills with our students so they can be successful. Ms. McCray this is transformation anything you want to highlight? Um, so yes there is something I'd like to highlight so this is going to add to our restorative practices toolbox while restorative practices is a conversation that we've had for a very long time the additional layer that we're going to have that we have not had is that on the ground support for coaching and feedback in the moment when we have students that are experiencing trauma, we will be able to practice nonviolent communication with our support services staff. We'll have members of our district team that will be um, with our schools learning this process. Um, the Bigsby method is one that she focuses on a train the trainer. So this is not a forever. This is let's train people in our district so that we can then spread uh, this knowledge to other schools. So this nonviolent communication works both for the adult as well as the student and we will be getting weekly coaching on how to deal with students that are experiencing trauma and be able to think through nonviolent communicative strategies to really, number one, reduce um, the, um, the, the tension that, is, that the student is experiencing or and or the adult, um, but also learn some strategies to kind of change the focus in a more positive fashion so that we can address the behaviors in a more positive way. So this is something where that coaching aspect is something that's missing. Uh, we get training all the time, but that on the ground coaching and feedback around our response to students, that is gonna be key uh, with this particular training. So this is something that I look forward to having um, this school year it will be an additional layer to the work that we're doing in restorative practices mm. thank you uh, very much for that explanation I need a motion and a second I have a motion by member Washington a second by member Vaughn member Vaughn do you have further questions 
I do. Thank you for clarifying that this is considered restorative practices because that was one of my questions that I was going to ask is just to clarify that because, you know, I've been talking about more restorative practices training and supporting our staff and that. Also, does this fall under social emotional learning? So yes, this will fall under uh, social emotional learning. It is restorative uh, practices training. And so our student engagement team will be involved with this. Our student uh, support services team uh, will be involved uh, with this uh, as well. And so yes, this does kind of fill into that bucket. And you are recommending this, Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. And this is in addition to the National Dropout Prevention Trauma Model that we have at uh, Palm River Elementary. So training the teachers to handle trauma. It looks like we have a few comments. Member Perez? Is this going to be mandatory? Um, no. So what we're going to start with, the first round of training is really around the adults that are dealing with the students um, the most, and that is our support services staff, our administrators, and those people that are not assigned to kids, so like our success coaches, our guidance counselors. So that first round is getting the people that are touching the kids the most that are in that trauma state. So when, when will they... Um, have to take this course or when will this be available for them to given that there's like no time to take anything not even a break um you know to take lunch so yeah. when will they be taking this so this will be something that will be a, a rollout over the course of the year so again we're going to be focused on the support services staff that are not tied to um, students um, every day so that we can roll this out with our faculty during non-student uh, time and non-student hours so we have built in some uh, budget money for stipends and so again this will be something that could be um, after school saturday you know that kind of thing and they will get stipends to participate thank you member perez member snively Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. McCray, I see that you have um, on the detail sheet to the board uh, given us some information about Fairview Middle School in Tallahassee and the percentage of disciplinary referrals. So um, has Leon County implemented it in any other schools besides the Franklin I'm sorry, Fairview Middle School in Tallahassee? I don't know about Leon County's implementation of this. I just know about the, the research that was done at Fairview. So I, I'm, I'm not able to answer that for that's Okay. Do you, do you have any other um, research or data on other schools where this was implemented, where it was successful? So she's done a lot of work in our juvenile justice system in the state of Florida. She did move over to our public school system because she recognized the disconnect between the students that she was getting in the juvenile justice system, and we need to start early with that nonviolent communication. And so this work has been done in Florida, starting with juvenile justice system, but then realizing that we've got to get before that. We've got to get to them before they get into that pipeline. And so Fairview was just one of the schools where they actually track that data to really look at what's the impact of learning the strategies of nonviolent communication and what does that look like when it comes to data. So that's just some data that she marked that is actually research based, but we can find out if there are other districts, uh, I mean other schools in Leon County that have implemented this method. Are there other schools in Florida that have implemented this? No, not that I'm familiar with, no. But this, is this a pilot program? Through the chair, through transformation, yes. Yes, it will be. Okay, and how many schools will this impact? Our middle school. So we're focused on middle school. Middle schools. school. Yes. Okay. This is a middle school focused um, initiative because that's where our data is still really struggling with our students that are experiencing trauma. So this is a middle school um, initiative for our nine middle schools, which include our five middle schools and then our K-8s. Okay, and how often will we get reports back on the impact of this? So we'll be able to see impact uh, impacts quarterly. So once we get this thing started, we get our dates set up, we can look at getting, giving some quarterly data. I would really like to, to see, yes. And I, I think we have transformational schools on our suspended agenda already. But if we could add this particular initiative to see, um, it's 8 o'clock, um, <laughs> to see what kind of impact it's having uh, and really and measure that for the, the time that we're implementing it, I, I'm curious um, to see if it's, if it's going to work. So. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. And I'm curious, um, Superintendent Davis, Tracy Brown, when we had the pilot, uh, we still have from the National Dropout Prevention Center, and then I'm hearing another pilot, uh, and thank you, Member Snively, for bringing that out. I'm just curious as to why we have two pilots when we already have adopted, or almost, the National Dropout Prevention, which, by the way, is a data-proven system. Shay, I totally am for what you're doing. Don't don't get me wrong, but there is a, a little bit of inconsistency in my mind. Why are we reinventing another pilot when we already have a pilot? 
and that would maybe Tracy Brown, um, you need to comment on that because <laughs> I'm perplexed. But let's start out with Superintendent Davis. Are we talking about the Palm River implementation? Yeah, we we have, and that the, was a pilot. Yeah, it's Mr. been Jack. proven to be effective with COVID. I, I understand. But, you know, we're doing pilot this and pilot yes. that. I'm just curious. Yes, ma'am. So that was a more of a focus on elementary. So this is a transition to, to middle school. And I know that there's uh, best practices or best practices. But when we see a middle school implementing this implementation at Fairview, being able to take that model and implement it, not saying that we can't grow the mentality from Palm River in that implementation, but just different grade bands for uh, the, you know, conceptually. And, I, and, I, and we can go back and see whether I can get with the, uh, Mr. Daggett and, and his leadership team and to see if they transition up to middle school and K-8s uh, for that implementation. They do. Okay. But, uh, and actually, you answered the question, one's yes, elementary, one's middle school, but they do. Um, national dropout goes all the way to the uh, They do a good job. To the 12th. Well, so, Ms. Brown, are you um, committed to the national dropout prevention and spreading the results so such people as a wonderful Shea McRae would know that the data is successful? Yes, ma'am, I'm committed to that. That is no longer in my division. That is now in the Division of Innovation. So Ms. Bays has become the contact for that work, and she has already been in contact with Mr. Daggett, and they have already been in communication working out how we can continue to grow that work with um, trauma skill schools. The plot thickens. Thanks. Uh, actually, <laughs> Ms. Bays, I think I remembered that, and you were at your second day of the situation. I went through a litany. So I'll, I'll, I'll carry on with Ms. Bays. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, well, let's go ahead and vote it when our lights are on. Okay, it's unanimous. It is now unanimous. Okay, we're, we're crossing the uh, 8 o'clock uh, start line here, or finish line. We're not there yet. Um, let's go ahead in 616, purchase of the Penda Learning Student Subscription for all 45 Transformation Network schools. Superintendent Davis, will you highlight this item? Yes, ma'am. This is a uh, approval to implement PENDA Learning student subscriptions for 45 uh, schools in the Transformation Network. We all know that we continue to need additional assistance with science. Uh, we know that you know in grades in grades five and eight, both of those areas are tested areas <coughs> related to the state of uh, uh, the Florida Department of Education, which is the accountability areas. But in the fifth grade, students are required to be able to understand spiral curriculums all the way back to third grade and fourth grade. So what this does is have a greater exposure before, during, or after school for, for students to engage in science content. And the same thing when student takes an eighth grade assessment as well, their roles and responsibilities are to understand and revisit sixth and seventh grade standards. So being able to have that continuum of offerings within our schools. We saw that uh, students who implemented uh, PINDA last year um, in transformation, 27% uh, were proficient. When non -school, with non-append um, to schools, only 23% were proficient in the area of science. And I'll transition. This is 30 minutes a week. At, at, at all is needed for exposure and that's just to get really annually assessed standards in front of our students so they have better comfortability because we are in eighth grade get, getting taught eighth grade standards you know they have to be able to activate sixth and seventh grade standards science standards are embedded into that um, accountability and the same thing for fifth grade for third and fourth grade so miss mccray anything else you want to highlight yes. so this does not take away the place of teaching Absolutely. This is just abs uh, just an opportunity when students do not meet the standard, it gives them more opportunities to get exposed uh, to the standard um, over time. So again, th they are tested for three years worth of knowledge when it comes to science. It's a single cell, and we only see proficiency rates in transformation schools in the 20s and 30 percent. It's pretty low, and it's because kids have a hard time remembering three grade levels worth of science material. So PENDA just gives them an opportunity to get that spiral focus, um, and it's about 30 minutes a week. They're able to go back and look at standards for the prior year and work towards mastery so that that teacher can stay focused on the current grade level standards. So not substituting uh, teaching at all, just actually providing some extension opportunities. It can be used before school, after school, at home, host program. It can be used in ELP. And so it just allows us opportunities for kids to get exposed to that science. <clears throat> You're looking at every opportunity to help our high needs kids to become successful. Thank you. Uh, board members, I need a motion and a second 
I have a motion by Member Combs, second by Member Washington. Member Vaughn, you pulled this item. Do you have further questions? I do. Thank you. I'm glad that you clarified this isn't going to come from instructional time because, honestly, I had several people from transformation schools reach out to me about this item. And why, what I'm hearing is they absolutely appreciate the support. We have to focus on our transformation schools, that they're feeling overwhelmed with the amount of resources that they're getting, um, learning new technology that, you know, with the year that we have already, that honestly they felt overburdened by just seeing this on the agenda item or hearing that it was coming to schools. Um, I do know that we are testing horribly in science and that we absolutely need to support our students in science specifically, and I'm passionate about science. So this is a challenge for me between you know, understanding the need to support our students in science specifically, but also listening to the transformation schools and feeling a bit overwhelmed with all of the new resources that we're throwing out to them. Do, can you speak to, to the resistance that I've gotten about this and how we're going to make sure that if we use this as a resource, it's not something that these schools feel overwhelmed by? Yes, absolutely. So one of the great things about uh, Penn to Science, what they do a really good job of is coming to each individual school to provide some on the ground support. So this won't be like, hey, turn on com your computer, you have a new program, go figure it out. Um, they do try to meet schools where they are with their needs um, to try to make it as user friendly as possible and very easy to implement. So again, this is something that we hope can just be an extension of learning and not take the place of learning. But PENDA will be on the ground with every single school providing um, that side by side support with our teachers learning how to use the program so they won't be alone um, in trying to implement this and again this is only for students that need it and this is only something that's like 30 minutes a week so it's not taking up a lot of time for them to show success and this is a one-year contract yes ma'am so before we approve it again next year it will come before the board yes ma'am so if we get this again next year similar to member Snively wanting to know how effective the last program it is when it comes before the board will we be able to see if this has actually improved test scores and maybe have some feedback to, from the teachers in the transformation school about whether or not this is something that they enjoy using and it's, ha it's been impactful sure and yes, Panda yes. gives us great data reporting so we can be able to again we can add this to um, you know our agenda item and, and we'll be able to show data and through the chair so anything that's related to instructional movement uh, the vendor has to actually come in front of the cabinet and prove and demonstrate they've actually moved the needle and helped us in so many different ways and if they and if they haven't right then and there we will elect to either renegotiate the contract selectively abandon the contract or um, uh, or implement it again and bring it to the board so like achieve the 3,000 and uh, it was I ready they had to come in front of the cabinet and our in uh, mr. Connor and his team to talk about benefits exposure implementation all those things and they're held accountable so if they don't help us with that process to be able to help children and it doesn't prove to be beneficial then we will not bring it back to the board for implementation go ahead mr. Connor. Uh, to, to your point Ms. Vaughn we also have a research and evaluation uh, department that will at the end of the year, we'll do an evaluation on this product as well. I guess one of my questions is, is, is I would like the statistics of how much it's moving the needle, but also teacher feedback and, and people who are implementing it to understand whether that's a, the cost of, you know, the time and, and bandwidth of our teachers and staff. Sure. <clears throat> Point well said. Um, we have another comment from Member Perez. So, um, I, okay, so it's in the Transformation Network, and our transformation schools are lacking a lot of technology and the, and the access to technology. So when you, when we, when we speak about this, are, are they going to be providing technology or are we going to make sure that these classes are um, well equipped with technology? What do we, what, what's, what's that going to look like? Yes, ma'am. One of our priorities, this is to talk about equity. We've been unapologetic about being able to make certain that the transformation schools has the necessary devices to be successful and updated devices. Hence the reason, in, 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 I spoke tonight, with the additional uh, devices that we've ordered, 10,000 will go to Title I schools. The majority of those are in, in District 5 for implementation. So without a doubt, we made certain that, you know, last year that uh, the core classes had 
the necessary uh, units they need to be able to create small group instruction and, and have rotations. So if there's a, a need, you know, please, I would say that an educator can reach out to, to Ms. Ms. McRae, any principal to, to, to alert us so that we can make any adjustments necessary. Because you're right, without the necessary equipment, the software doesn't do any good for us to be able to create moments for students to continue to have that spiral learning. Especially if you have a student that is very challenged and needs this, you were saying 30 minutes a week? So at the 30 minute a week, um, the possibility that that child needs that technology a little bit more than another student, that that technology is available for that, for that child. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Combs? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to support this because I know you know, I appreciate all, all that you do, Ms. McCray, and everybody else for the calendar. The one thing I really would like to request at the end of December and also at the end of the school year, I'd like to see every computer program that we have in our district that, we're, that we have. I'd like to see the cost. And I also would like to see the usage of it and where it's being used because I think some programs are really being utilized and some are being underutilized. So that way, as we go to the new year, we can see what to approve, what not to approve. And there are some programs that schools are not even aware of. I know for me, when I go on my daughter's Canvas, I see so many programs there I mean, I see so much, and there's a lot of free there's a lot of free resources available as well um, that we can use. So I would just really would like to make sure at, at the end of December, let's look at the usage, let's look at the cost, let's look at what pockets are using that, and then at the end of the school year as well. I've mentioned that to superintendent, but I just wanted to make it formal at the meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Member Combs. I do remember that it's almost like a computer uh, usage audit um, and resources. Uh, board members, uh, seeing no more discussion, please vote when your lights are on. Ah, and Member Snively is quickly approaching. Da, 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 da. Ah, unanimous. <laughs> okay, thanks, board members, and uh, high rate of speed, Snively. <clears throat> Let's go into 621, the Global Positioning System Tracking System with Student ID Cards. Uh, Superintendent Davis, will you highlight? Yes, ma'am. This is an opportunity for us to update our global positioning system, our GPS tracking systems, in um, not only within our white fleet and our yellow fleet, but also being able to help identify the ridership of our students. Um, I don't say this in a funny manner. Right now, we have 2G GPS in all of our white fleet and yellow fleet, and what in that sunsets. The, the available to access that technology and that software sunsets in December. So what this allows us to do is to upgrade to 4G and it gives us better opportunity to route and be able to identify where our white and yellow fleet is. In addition in this contract, what this allows us to do is allow us to have ridership where students have individual cards when they get on the bus so we can have an indicator for our ridership and that brings money to our, to our school district. Uh, we know that some of our students may not have their card that particular day, so, so every one of our yellow fleets will have a keypad where they can enter into their student number. That way that we can be able to have a, a, you know, a, a concentration or validation of that student was in and on that bus that particular day. And the big thing is this is all about having Here Comes the Bus app as well for parents. So especially now that, you know, it's a, it's a statewide and national um, a trend not having bus drivers and our bus drivers thank you so very much are doing double routes and our parents cre it creates frustration when buses are are late and not on time so what this does allows us to launch here comes the bus app which gives immediate indicators to our parents to let them know that a bus may be late and it also gives them an opportunity to let them know that a bus may be within 1.5 miles of that bus route so they can make that adjustment and get into that bus route and be on time one thing we hear is from our from our parents is that our buses are late no one called us well here comes the bus app it gives them real-time information to let them know where that bus is and it just allows us to have better transparency and communication with our community and this will be used you know this is general fund expenditures of, of, of a total of eight hundred fifteen thousand dollars <throat> yeah keeping up with technology this is exciting uh, and this is very, good for our district yeah very well needed I need a motion and a second I have a motion by member Perez second by member Vaughn uh, <clears throat> and we have a discussion uh, by member Vaughn and member Washington would you like to member Washington 
No, I just wanted the superintendent to explain in specifics uh, about this new program. It sounds like a good program. And uh, I wanted the, the audience to know that we have something really good with tracking buses and students. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? I agree. I think it's really important. We've had so much frustration around exactly that you mentioned, you know, parents not knowing when buses are going to be late or even just wondering where your child is as you're waiting. It gives another peace of mind. So, you know, I know some people see agenda items and they're confusing. And I mean, this does look like, you know, a fair amount of money. So I just wanted parents to, and people to know what we are investing in because I think this is a great thing as well. So thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn and Member Combs. I'm going to be brief because I know it's getting to be a long night. But uh, the one thing is, is it does really keep children safe as well if they know that they don't have to wait as long for a bus. And even today, you know, we, we end up, you know, getting a great information about all the safety and all the things that we do in our in our schools to make sure all the protocols to keep our children safe. And this is not just thinking of children in the schools, but before they get to the school. So I think that's really, it's really remarkable. And I think I, I really appreciate that we have this item here. Thank you. Thank you, Member Combs. Member Snively. Thank you. I just had a quick question, question for clarification on, on the timeline for implementation. So if we go off 2G in December, but we don't have full implementation until August 2022, what's happening in between January and August? So what they'll be doing as soon as this gets passed, literally probably tomorrow morning, is mm -hmm. to start to put new devices. We have GPS on our buses in White Fleet right now. We'll start with only the buses, and they will do the new GPS system in each one of those buses. So before we get to December, the GPS will be replaced. It doesn't mean the functionality for we're going to have devices on buses, which is in the card distribution. So what will happen between January and August is card distribution, getting the website and the app out to parents, that part of it too. So we won't be fully functional with the app in January, but if we don't, we won't be able to find out where our buses are right now because we currently use them for GPS. And um, as many of you know, Mr. Davis loves to make the 2G joke whenever your phone starts to, to kick out. <laughs> and when I told him about this item, this literally is a 2G, <laughs> a 2G item that we, we have. So um, to answer your question, it's, commercial. it's the basics. The, the, the steel framework around it is, is the basics we'll do right before December. And then January to May will be the implementation, implementation for all the icing, all the other stuff that goes on top of it. So make a good T-Mobile commercial. <laughs> run over <laughs> buses <laughs> right <laughs> thank you okay member snively are we satisfied with that answer okay <laughs> all right board members vote vote when your lights are on <laughs> whoops oh, oh member combs did you get Is it going? Is it going to sleep? Hmm. All right, you know. CC. All right, <laughs> the good old-fashioned way. So our last item, um, and I think there's a drum roll after this one. Uh, approve the <laughs> 1102. Approve the Hillsborough County Public School Strategic Plan. And Superintendent Davis, we went over this, but I guess we're doing it again. So go ahead. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I'll be very brief because I went over it in my superintendent updates. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad we're bringing this to a landing. Thank you again to our staff. They did a really good job, Monica and Van. Van really brought it home with, with the communications. And now it's time, once this is approved, to really, truly to get on the road and start engaging our community about our priorities. And I look forward to doing it. We've already put kind of a, a skeleton schedule to, that we're going to go around to every school, every district, a school in every district and open it up to our parents to engage in the same token do some listen and learns at uh, at lo local civic centers at paneras in in order to you know to interact with our community about about this but also to listen how we continue to improve our practices for our students so um, this is really a, an opportunity for us to identify our priorities and be very direct about what we're trying to accomplish. There are some very aggressive key indicate performance indicators in this document. So look forward to implementing and uh, moving along the way. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member, Sni Member Snively and a second by Member Combs. Uh, in discussion, Member Snively. Finally. <laughs> 
Finally. Well, that Finally. Was- we've, well, we've been thwarted at the moat for like 18 months trying to get something together and, and enough time to spend together to talk about their strate- strategic plan. So um, I just want to say that I'm glad that we have one. Um, I know we talked about having a board member toolbox so that we can share a strategic plan to be ambassadors in the communities when we're out and about. Um, appreciate your hard work, Van. You're very talented in this area of strategic planning. So, <laughs> <laughs> he is, he is, he is. He is. And it's, oh, happy birthday, by the oh, way. Right, 39. Yeah. Again, uh, right. Um, I do, I did want to ask, um, uh, we, I know we're, we're approving the content tonight. Um, so if I, by chance, have a few extra recommendations for the, you know, not nothing content-wise, just the layout-wise, I can still meet with you on that. Okay. But what I really wanted to say is that for the last several weeks, members of our board have been working diligently together in conjunction with the Florida School Board Association leadership to, um, to earn a designation. Um, during our sessions, we've discussed various characteristics of effective board governance, and we reviewed our vision and our mission, our values, and one of our recent sessions, we talked about our moral imperative mm-hmm. and agreed on the specific values, um, which are the foundations of our strategic plan, and you will find those on page four. I would like to take a moment to highlight the important words of which the board has committed to work towards our ultimate purpose. Um, our vision and our mission and vision will sound familiar, but our values and moral imperative changed a little bit because we've changed a little bit too. So our mission is still to provide an education and the supports that enable each student to excel as a successful and responsible citizen. And our vision is still preparing students for life. Um, We work together to develop values and our moral imperative. And the values, we uh, created an acronym. And the acronym is TEACH, T-E-A-C-H, teamwork, equity, accountability, compassion, and honesty. I think we all feel very strongly about those values as we move towards our our purpose. Um, Our moral imperative, which is something new for us, is we believe all children can be empowered to learn and succeed. And that's the lens that we intend to use to look through when we're making our decisions for the school district in our school board roles. Um, In addition to the plan, um, Board Member Washington has a special presentation for each board member to honor and distinguish the values on which we want to exemplify. Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington, you are recognized. Okay, thank you. So I thought it would be unique because um, Member Snively came up with the word teach And I say, how can we put this out where people can see it and they know what we believe in our values? So I got with a young man and we decided to make up uh, T-shirts. And I have a T-shirt for each member along with the superintendent, the attorney, and Van. Now, Van knew about it. He kept a good secret. He He did. He did. He knew. He knew. He knew. Because we got together earlier and planned on it. So I'm going to pass out shirts. You want me to help me, Melon Chair? I shall. Man, man, you have to share your shirt. Do we all get to wear it? Yes. Yes. I don't think everybody's going to finish shooting them. Van gets an extra small because he runs a lot of miles. Well, I will. I will add uh, one clarification that the the teach acronym uh, came. I didn't just think of it myself. I promise. Uh, I listened to everybody's conversation when we sat around the table and we talked about the things that were important to us. Uh, so I didn't just you know make it up on my own. I promise. Uh, I listened to the other board members and heard the words that they were using when they were talking about what was important to them. And then I just kind of you know created the acronym based on some of those words that were important to them. This is the shirt, if you look. Oh, yeah. It's fine. Oh, come in. Here's your shape. Came out work. Van. You want to take a photo? You can. Folks. 
everybody, uh, board members, and even Van. And even Van. Van and superintendent, let's take a photo. So get the shirt out at least. And member Han, we have one here for you. So let's put the shirt kind of sort of on. In front of us, like this? Yeah. And these are our values. This is beautiful, by the way. Dan, can you stand in for Dr. Han? Yes, Dr. Han, I have one for you. Yeah, I have it right here. Let me put on my mask. Oh, we can squeeze in. Come on in. Bing. It's a, it's a super small. What did you say? What did you say? What did say? What say? We got to figure out a day when we should and, wear it together. And yeah, we we need to uh, we need to get together and find out when we're gonna wear it all at one time. Did I do the motions? I think so. I, did. I had a motion second. Van, that's your birthday present, okay? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. All right. Okay, Thank uh, you. board members, uh, Mr. Wash, uh, Member Washington, you. Are amazing. Would you like to have any thoughts to share uh, beyond uh, the other thoughts that were shared? No, I I really enjoyed the uh, the board uh, when we met um, as groups. Uh, I mean, we just met and and explained and talked about stuff. We really needed to be together as a team. And I thought about this because this is the first is teamwork up at the top, very first part of teaching, which is important because if we don't have a team. All the rest of this doesn't even come into existence. So we had a great discussion, and and uh, thank you, Member Snively, for bringing this up. And you put your put my mind with yours, and we came up with a pretty good looking shirt. Yes, right, along with Van, because Van knew. Uh, okay, but anyway, thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, but you know, we had heartfelt conversation. <clears throat> We had heartfelt conversations that drew us to these conclusions. And really, Snively doesn't give herself credit. She's an English major. So you came up with teach, which I was impressed. So, um, you know, this is, this is what collaboration does. That's what collaboration does. And, uh, and then the fruits of the labor um, come from great members, board members such as Shake Washington for giving us this emblematic uh, sign of collaborative uh, work workmanship. And uh, it's all going to benefit the children as our moral imperative. I think we have a comment from Member Vaughn, uh, and then we'll do a vote and comments. Go. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, that's right in my mouth. I have a question about page 14. Um, and I think I spoke with you about this, Van, um, when we were going over this. Um, there seems to be a disconnect. You know, we just had our policy meeting where I had asked um, to create a policy about implicit bias. And there were some concerns about making it a mandatory policy. And here in our strategic plan on page 14, it says train all employees in implicit bias and cultural responsiveness in order to provide student access to learning experiences. I understand that we're we're onboarding new employees. However, if we're not making it mandatory and going back to train all of our employees, <laughs> since we did not decide on that on a policy, I'm not sure why it says that on page 14 of our strategic plan, especially after we had we talked about that. Yes, Mayor Vaughn. And um, with that initiative, that is a goal in our strategic plan is to have all of our employees trained. So as we wrote that initiative, um, that is the ultimate goal of, of the district is to have all of our employees trained so can I can I get a clarification between having all employees trained and mandatory training 
So through the chair, this is a multi, this is a five-year strategic plan. So over the five years, work every single day to make certain that we train as many uh, educators as we can, whether that be during a school year, whether that be during the uh, during the summertime. So we'll work during, the, you know, during this five-year period to be able to make certain that this training continues to stay relevant. And we'll update that along the way. So if there are employees that don't want to take the training, does that, how does that work into our strategic plan? I would just say, I mean, it, with, it, within our strategic plan, it is our goal to have yep. all of our employees. Yep. We're going we're to work every single day to make certain we have exposure to that. To our, our teachers have exposure to this type of training, and we'll embed that into into our uh, refresh as we launch the school year. We embed that throughout as we talk about, uh, you know, being able to connect when gaining access to our students. So along the way, we'll make certain that uh, we provide this opportunity. So can we say our goal is to train, or it's a goal? Because when, if I'm a parent or anyone, and I'm looking at our strategic plan, and I see key initiatives, train all employees, uh, and implicit bias training, I make the assumption that that is a directive of the district, not a goal. So can we clarify if that's a goal of some way, since per our policy workshop, we weren't ready to commit to mandatory training? Absolutely. OK, yep. thank you. OK, done. Oh, oh. Uh, Member Snively, not, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm glad, thank you. Um, Ms. Vaughn for bringing that up because actually I uh, recommended that we change the words from implicit bias to something else to diversity or something not so specific because I felt like since we didn't get um, since that policy has not been approved by the board yet and we didn't want to have to reprint however many thousands of copies of the strategic plan that we could uh, potentially have to, to make copies of that maybe we change the language to, to read diversity and, um, and cultural responsiveness as opposed to being so specific about implicit bias. So I don't know if that's something that we would would uh, consider that the board would consider. Um, that way if it does pass then obviously you know that that's going to, if that's mandatory then that's going to if the board cho so chooses to make it mandatory that's fine but if it doesn't then we don't have to reprint how many thousands of copies of this. So perhaps we amend that to diversity and cultural responsiveness just to be, uh, you know, to, to be a little safe around the verbiage. Through the chair, we can we can look at that. Uh, Monica, any feedback from, from that uh, related to our, in Mr. Connor related to our training? No, okay, good. Yeah. I. I Oh, sorry, members. Not, I think of this as a living document which will grow and need editing because we're not done with our policy workshop and the continuance. There's a few other little loose ends here that we still have to finish, such as implicit bias. So I think, um, and, and I'm very happy to see that you're all saying okay and ban. You know, we'll change a word or two because it's going to be necessary. It's inevitable. Uh, and, um, you know, the flexibility is very appreciated by this board. Uh, hard work went into this. A lot of synergy, and uh, we thank you. Board members, let's go ahead and vote when your lights are on so you can go ahead and do your comments. Hmm? Oh. Well, we're voting, sorry. As is? Yeah, we're voting as is, with the exceptions of those two corrections that we just had that you had. Okay. Okay, is that satisfied? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, very good. All right, so we're all in favor. And uh, board members, yeah, feel free to call up, uh, to run down, literally, uh, Van Ayers, or call Addison Davis for changes. So, okay, uh, comment time? Member Perez in the queue first. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, I, I know that we have a lot of, um, of our staff, teachers, employees that are very stressed out right now. Um, and I just wanted to bring out that um, the, there was an email that was sent out through the um, employee benefits. Um, send out an email regarding um, the well-being well-being of our um, employees. Um, it, it 
it attached like um, the 21 days of mindful med med mindfulness program um, starting October 4th through the, 20 through the 25th of October. And also um, EAP um, mental health awareness, providing you information on how to access your EAP services and, um, and benefits. And um, the 21 days of, of mindfulness, it's, the benefits are it's going to reduce stress, um, creates a harmonious school environment, enhancing relaxation, improving sleep quality, strengthens immunity, and increasing anti-aging hormones. I might add, I might jump in on that one. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but um, you know, it's, the um, employee um, EAP benefits are there for our employees, especially during this time. And I have um, another question. When are we going to be discussing mascots? When this, is this going to be addressed again? So right now we are uh, <clears throat> we're in the process of uh, engaging the community from um, a part of last – about two weeks ago we engaged a community – that uh, wanted us to keep the mascots as they are. So being able to really recognize the rich history for the implementation uh, in the, of the current mascots and the way they sit. And there's a certification process. So openly what we want to do is, is we really want the community, and I talk about community, we want the students and we want our our, our current uh, community to be able to bring this to the uh, to administration to be able to talk about whether or not this is a priority within their community. So as of right now, we are uh, we are working with um, uh, different pockets of our community to determine if there's a need. And overarchingly, we haven't heard from uh, students at, at scale. We haven't heard from the community at scale in those particular community wanting to change these mascots. So uh, we want that to be a community-led project versus administrative-led project, just to be open and transparent. Okay. Um, but just remember, you know, as a social worker, um, I have to honor um, diversity and honor um, the and respect um, um, the representation of different um, members of this community as well. So, you know, um, I think I just feel that this is a conversation that we need to have, um, you know, and not just leave it up to community members, but also um, um, respect the, the viewpoints of the community that these mascot rep represents. Um, and also, you know, we had a conversation about the um, finance committee. And, and I'm going to leave my comments here with regard to the uh, finance committee. But, you know, um, Superintendent, the, the finance committee um, is there to help you align yourself with a, with a community that you um, are getting to know. You've been here for 16 months. And um, you, you're getting to know and forming an alliance with Hillsborough County. Hillsborough County is a large community. We're the sixth largest in the nation. And to receive advice on what has worked for other superintendents, what hasn't. Um, from the viewpoint of this community, is so imperative, especially when you came into a district when we were already in a financial, um, financially in the red. And right now we're doing really well, but only because of ESSER funding. To be able to get out of that, that or stay in the black where we are, um, you know, it takes a whole, the whole village. It takes all of us to work together. So, um, you know, working side by side with this community, um, you know, for the benefit of the students, for the benefit of the teachers, is going to be um, imperative. So I feel that, you know, taking the advice and listening to that, that um, committee is going to be a benefit for you. Thank you, and I agree.
Thank you, Member Perez. Member Hahn? Hello. Hey. Yeah, did you just, uh, okay, you sound like you're uh -huh. alive and awake, so go ahead. I'm here. All right. <laughs> so this month is Booktober, <laughs> and it's also Stemtober. So it's my favorite month of the year, because those are two things I feel very passionate about. Um, I wanted, if Pablo could share the... Um, uh, there we go. I wanted to share some of the numbers for um, our students who are reading with Mayan. And let me go back to my first page. We have, if you see the first slide, we had over a half a million books accessed during the month of September and over 57,000 hours of reading books. I'm so excited to see those numbers. And Maya has been a great partner in providing uh, access to books electronically, which has been great for our students. They also have um, going on right now some great activities for Hispanic Heritage Month. Not only do they have books that um, are on their website, that you can read or you can have them read to. Their books are in both English and Spanish. Um, so that's really been exciting. They have lots of activities for teachers to do with the books on their website as well. And during the month of October, like I said, it's STEMtober. Um, it, it, we're gonna ramp up our reading this month between it being STEMtober and Booktober. And on Mayan, families and teachers can access book of the day calendars for STEMtober that are linked to different science projects that teachers can do in the classrooms or families can do at home if you're, um, if you want to. And they also have some um, reading challenges between October 25th and November 28th. They'll be giving out prizes to the top readers um, and host offering uh, host is offering six scholarships to the top readers via a raffle. So lots of great things happening during Booktober and Stemtober. Also, quickly, just want to announce our next literacy fair is on November sixth. Again, it will be a drive-through format. I'll be giving away my home libraries to all the children who attend the fair, and I have all of the wonderful community partners that participate in our previous fairs, joining us November 6th. It'll be at the parking lot between the Lanier Elementary and Monroe Middle School. And we hope to see you out at the fair. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Stacy Hahn, Dr. Hahn, Co-Chair Hahn. Uh, we appreciate your, your wonderful work. Uh, Member Washington. Okay, uh, thank you. But, but before I start on my presentation, I just wanted to uh, to let people know I have to get a shout out to Gerald Vickers because he's the young man that made the shirts for us and he works with Workman Designs. You should have a tag inside of your, your package there. So thank you, Gerald, for all that you do for us in Hillsborough County. Um, let's start out with I, I had opportunity to go to Chamberlain High School uh, during the last two weeks and uh, I met with the yearbook staff. It was quite interesting. They wanted to know uh, I gave them questions. I gave them answers. They they had all these questions for me, being a former principal of Chamber. Why did I want to be a principal? How did the school go? Uh, we had some great questions. Uh, they wanted to know how was discipline, how was our, a disciplinarian, how long I had been there. So I, I had a conversation telling them about the years that I was at Chamberlain High School and I was the chief, and we had a great time. They uh, they enjoyed it. In fact, one guy said, why don't you come back and be the principal? I said, not in this lifetime. Maybe another, but not in this one. Uh, but I really had a great time. Then I moved on. We went to, uh, and that's the pictures of the students from Chamberlain High School. As I like to say, go Chambo. Um, those are some great students there. And then we moved on. I went to the, uh, I volunteered at the Hillsborough Education and Foundation with teaching tools and resources. And, and, you know, teachers have an opportunity to go, and they have a lot of materials and supplies for teachers. They should take advantage of that. That's hard work now, 
I mean, I volunteer, but we loaded baskets up and I, I escorted the uh, teachers out and put the uh, supplies in their cars. They, I mean, they have all kind of supplies for students. And and uh, teachers, you need to take advantage of that. You really need to take advantage of that. And I want to thank Angelica uh, Lombardo because she taught me everything in a little time I was there about uh, the the education and foundation uh, teaching resource tools. And then I changed and I went to Seminole. I went to Seminole Elementary School. I had opportunity again to work in the food service. But I tell you, they work. They work hard at preparing food for students there. Um, and they are out. Hey, look, we get that food out for the next class. You're constantly on your feet. I mean, like three, three and a half hours. And, uh, you know, we got to start getting, giving, uh, the lunchroom service people also, um, uh, recognition for what they do because they really do a great job. And I enjoyed, and I want to tell Seminole, you, you got a great staff. You did an excellent job. Then, uh, and that's, that's the staff there. Um, and one of the supervisors was there. And then I had an opportunity. I went to the Lions Eye Institute with the Glazer Foundation where they gave out free eyeglasses to Philip Shore, the Shore uh, Community School. They gave exams and they also gave out free glasses to the students. It was really good. And I, and I, and that's what we need to do in the community. They really did a great job there. The little kids were so excited. Uh, some had blue glasses, some had red, green, they had all colored glasses. But they, um, we enjoyed, we had a, we had a good time. We had a good time and I enjoyed those kids feeling like, like somebody really cared for them, about them. See the little girl, she was so cute. I said, what color glasses? She said, I don't know, I might get red. I don't know if that's red or not, but, and, and that's one of the guys that does the eye examination and so forth and fit them for the glasses. So we really had a good time. And those was, those was quite a few of the students there. And they all have glasses. Of course, the little girl said, I ain't get no glasses. I said, well, why? She said, because I can see real good. I said, well, you're doing great, sweetheart. You are really doing great. And and then I moved on to, um, we went to, uh, Nadia and I had, remember Combs and I had an opportunity to go to uh, the Gentleman's Quest um, with the CDC. And we had um, Mr. Travis Tavis Meyer was a coordinator. He's in charge, the executive director. And I tell you what, those kids had a we had a great time, right, Miss Combs? And they, this the book that they publish. It said, "I'm a young black man," and it had and it had in there at least poems that they made up. Those kids were smart. And any time, that's what bothers me sometimes. People say, well, you know, these kids, they bad, they don't do. We have successful students. These guys publish a, a book with great poems in it. And they did a great job, too. And they read it and they signed the book. I think, Ms. Combs, you have one, too, don't you? Yeah, she has one, too. So we had a great time. We spoke to the kids, gave them accolades, you know, because we want every kid to know that they can be successful if they work hard. And... I, I had an opportunity also to go to Ellison. And we had the transformation team there. Ms. Mike Ray and her, her team was there. And we gave, uh, and we had Caspers there. And Caspers gave 50, what, $50,000? $50,000 to the network at Ellison. And I just want to say, and we were out there, and I just wanted to say on, on that part of it, it was really nice. Uh, they gave away a lot of gifts because they, we have a attendance incentive for that they are working on, they are doing there. And those kids, like some kids want an iPad and so forth. So I want to say congratulations to the transformation team. Ms. Mike Ray, y'all do a great job because you're bringing stuff in the community that we have not had before. Your team is a hard-working team, and, 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 and it's, it's, it pays off. And also, Dr. Toronto, your face team there. And, you know, we have to have those people in the neighborhood. And it was really fantastic. And I want to give a shout out to Dustin Patillo because he's over it. He's the person that's over it uh, for Casper. Bob wasn't there. And we had a great time. You know, you know, boy, this is. Oh yeah, they were really, we had, we really did have a good time.
but, but again, thank you for that. And thank Cassius for all that they do in the Hillsborough County Public School System. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Washington, for a very positive update. You've been a busy man, uh, and we're very fortunate to have you uh, in that district for sure. Next will be Member Snively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I get to some of the fun stuff, I wanted to address some of the comments that were made today by the public who came in, took the time to, to, to speak, and a couple of things that just keep some of them keep recurring and so I just wanted to see if you could address some of them and if you don't have answers this evening Mr. Superintendent maybe you could bring them back to um, the next board meeting but we keep hearing about our lobbyist registration process and so you know where are we I know we've got a policy on the docket for registration so oh, there is a current uh, lobbying registry in place uh, the board asks that it be updated to uh, more closely reflect the Board of County Commissioners and that's um, in your policy cycle right now but there is an existing lobbying registry in place for the school district you're just beefing it up with um, additional language that more closely mirrors Hillsborough County and that will be done when you uh, finally adopt your policies okay so I was pretty sure we had one in place I didn't know a lot of the details around it October but 19th I'm sorry Ms. Davis advises me that will be done on October 19th uh, oh well the new policy okay but we still have a current registration process in place it's just changing a little bit on the, the 19th Correct. okay fantastic um, we hear we hear a lot about community schools and um, are we moving in that space or yes ma'am we currently have six community schools in, in place and there is a uh, an appetite to expand but this is a it's a financial obligation so being able to have startup money and being able to to identify the right partner and then also it's about putting it in the right locations community schools you know we've got to make certain that there's accessibility for partners may, making certain we're hiring the right director to lead that process it, there's been successes with with that initiative so we're looking at expanding where that would go to be able to look at what Gibsonson is doing within our school district so the answer to that is yes okay so I think you're gonna hear more and more from yes. our constituents our taxpayers our stakeholders about the potential for community schools how they've been working for our school district and what potential they have to continue to be successful in other parts of our school district computer-based excessive testing you remember that one Yes, ma'am. So that was brought up this, this evening from a constituent. The, the issue is, is that we want to mirror what the state assessment um, format is. I would love to go to pencil and paper, and I do believe it's, it's the best way for our students to really be able to, to process, to annotate, to engage. The issue becomes is when the, the majority of our students are engaged on computer state, uh, computer uh, based assessments at the state level, we want to make certain we mirror that same interactions and so that students are prepared and ready. Now, I don't know the forecastability of what the what will happen with a new progress monitoring assessment. I do believe it will be computer based as well. But we you know, I'm an advocate of paper and pencil. However, this is just not the realities of, of where we sit with the state. Okay. Thank you for addressing yeah. that. Apple track for the application process and for an organization who is trying desperately to recruit new employees I can't find anything on our home page that pulls me in as a potential employee to apply for a job here and what's wrong what's the what's the issue with Apple track there is a, it, there's really not it's user um, accessibility and we recommend that it be done on a desktop not on a phone it's not as easy to apply on a phone so at the job fair we had a whole table for people that wanted to work on their applications but we have to have a system that merges we can't do paper and pencil applications so we have to have a system that um, integrates all of our employee information and potential employees and communications did have all of those linkage links on our website when we were doing the job fair for last week and highlighting those jobs so I can show you the steps on the website it's employment and then the vacancies are there and they apply directly to the vacancies okay I just think we could make it a little more obvious 
Sure. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is there a way to transition, Dr. Whalen, to allow it to have easier access to smartphones? Because I think that would be a, a quicker way to get to improve a, a smaller percentage of applications if they had accessibility to smartphones. I don't know if that platform can do that or not. We'll know more when we know the integration <laughs> of the other right, Dr. Weeks. processes that we're trying to wait to find out about the accessibility for that. Okay. We, want, we don't want to have to have a separate standalone. That's another contract right. that we also purchase. Okay. Well, that yes, okay, that that's a concern for sure because there are a lot of people who don't even use um, a laptop or desktop as much anymore. They're solely on their phone or their iPad, so it really does need to be um, accessible that way as well for people. We need to make it as easy as possible for people not to have to jump through so many hoops to get just to get their application in for consideration. So, okay, and then. Um, I know the CAC had a really good conversation yesterday, from what I understand about um, what you know some of the issues that are going on in the schools, and it sounds like they got a, they had a really good conversation about um, kind of coming up with a way to get more adult volunteers into the schools to help out, because as you could hear from some of the stress from our teachers who spoke today, they are tapped, they're really tapped out, and and I and I'm concerned about. You know, people are talking about, oh, it's, it's you know, all-time low morale. Well, I don't know. I've, I've, I, it is low, yes. I don't know if all-time, but it's low. I've seen, I think I've seen, aside from the pandemic, of course, the pandemic has kind of yep, they're exhausted. changed everything, right? So I want them, I want the employees, or I think we would want the employees to feel obviously appreciated and know that they're not, they're not in this alone and that all the school districts are, uh, certainly having challenges with morale right now. It's not just Hillsborough County, it's every school district across the nation. But um, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I do feel like we should be doing something to make the um, environment more conducive to them feeling appreciated and, um, and whatever we can do to create the supports for them so that they're not having to skip lunch because right. now they have to work this part of the school or that part of the school. They're getting pulled in so many different directions and they're just probably really getting burnt out fast. Yes, um, so um, so I, I, that is, I think that's probably a concern for most of the sure. board members. I'm sure they're all hearing from mm -hmm. teachers about how tired they are and how they don't feel very loved right now. And I don't know, I, like I said, I don't have the answer to that, but I figured there's enough people in the school district who can figure out a way to make it better. Yes, ma'am, and I think that's a, it definitely is a priority. And, and I spoke to uh, Mrs. Vaughn the other day related to that and leveraging our stack committee, maybe having an open forums with, with different uh, with different committees, uh, subsets of employees, whether it be support staff, custodial, maintenance, teachers, leaders, to figure out what we can do to be able to address morale. I know it's hard to ask them to do one more thing, but oh, no. boy, would we like some feedback, right? We, because really, the only way I think we can solve that is if we, if they talk, tell us what they want and tell us what they need, or tell us what would help their situation become better. And that sample size allows us to do that. And I, and I talked to Rob Crete, and we meet every Monday, and he's uh, put out a survey as well, and he, and it's a positive manner what can we do to help morale versus current location we, we know where, where individuals are right now we know that I've talked to many superintendents throughout the state and being able to figure out what we can do to help and um, you know Dr. Wade another day that one of the things is is we heard tonight about uh, Kelly subs that with their fill rate so what we had to do is go out to uh, indirectly another vendor to be able to bring to uh, to be able to fill positions that Kelly's not able to fill. So I think being able to take proactive steps like that will re we'll really release time for teachers so they can have their planning, have their lunch, and not have to take additional students in elementary or cover additional classes in the secondary, which it really gets exhausting. And it's okay, and I know we, there's obviously precautions to, to take, but it's okay for volunteers, especially critical volunteers like PTA, uh, parents who, who want to come in and volunteer, whether it's helping in a classroom or helping lunch duty or helping with 
um, receiving children in the morning and the at, and and seeing them off in the afternoon, that's okay still for 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 us to have people on campus doing those things, helping our staff. Is that am I understanding yeah. that correctly? Yes, Madam the Chair, they definitely can come and help with that process. We just got to have uh, credentialed employees there for supervision, but absolutely all hands on deck will yeah. be able to alleviate those stressors and uh, put them in common areas to be able to accept and interact with them. And they just have to, if they haven't filled out a volunteer services form, they just have to go to our website and fill out that form and get, you know, their information into the system to get processed yes, to be approved for that, right? Okay. Yes, okay. Okay. So things to obviously continue to consider. Okay. Real quick then, I want to say thank you to Dr. Dames at Reddick Elementary School for allowing me to participate in Hispanic Heritage Month by reading to her students. That was really fun. Um, it was a wonderful experience and we got to sing together on, and um, have a great time. I wanted to thank real quickly also Josephine Amato and Danielle Waymeyer for their six years of tireless work around student safe pathways to school, bus and transportation solutions. And um, for, for folks who have concerns about safety and transportation, they're really great public advocates for that work and we're trying to put our heads together to come up with some solutions um, for our, some of our transportation challenges. I wanted to, um, I think Pablo has a screen to put up for uh, a particular event that just recently took place last Friday. Um, we will see what comes up. Um, anyway, it's um, a, the sixth annual event that um, I've been honored to be a part of. You deserve to be loved. Um, it was virtual this year, which was the first time it was virtual. Um, some board members, I think, have attended in the past. But um, does does he have the? He's looking. He's looking. Okay. So I wanted to shout out to, we had 21 schools that engaged with approximately 600 students participating. High schools were Armwood, Brandon, Hillsborough, Robinson, Sickles, Simmons Career, South County Career, Tampa Bay Tech, and Waters Career. And then middle schools were Adams, Burnett, um, Farrell, Gunta, Junta, sorry, Liberty, Madison, Mann, Shields, Smith, Tomlin, Turkey Creek, and Young. And thank you to Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, who is the organizer for all six years. Thank you to Anne Marie Courtney for the help um, in coordinating it. We partnered with Pinellas for the last couple of years. We've been partnering with Pinellas County. And I want to also thank Dr. Felita Lewis and Ray Paget for delivering um, T-shirts to all the participating schools. And I don't know what happened to the slides, but you can continue to show, continue to look for them. There, oh, there they go. Okay, so that was. Awesome speakers, really good speakers, very inspirational. You know, the whole concept is these these students. Um, we ha we have to make sure as adults that we in we continue to try and inspire them to make them feel loved, to make them, to make sure they understand they deserve it. They deserve to be loved no matter where who they are, where they come from, what color they are, what ethnicity they are, what their family situation is that um, they can all um, succeed, whatever their definition of success is, and we should love all love on all of them to make sure that that we inspire them. So that's that's that. Okay. And then um, wanted to promote one day of change, CEOs in the schools, CEOs in schools. I know my time's up. I'm so sorry. But I had other stuff. So um, not just the fun stuff. Um, CEOs in the schools, November the 5th. Mark your calendar. CEOs in the schools uh, is collaboration between HEF and Vistra, and it happens every year. And it's your opportunity as leaders in the community to go spend a day with us an elementary school principal um, in the schools. If you go to one, the number one, dayofchange.com, you can go register. Now, board members, I got a little challenge for you because there are still schools in all of our districts that do not have volunteers assigned to them for, for leadership in the community. So whether it's a business leader, um, political leader, um, a manager, somebody in management, we need people volunteering in the schools and you can see the list at that website you'll see the list of schools and i'm talking about anywhere from alifaya elementary to alexander elementary to anderson apollo beach bt washington uh, bailey ballast point baycrest those you know a lot of schools still need leaders 
So get on it and get your community involved. October 13th is the kickoff reception at Pepin Center, and November 5th is the actual day in the school. And then the Great American Teach-In, if you missed this, you can go to the Great American Teach-In, which is November the 18th. And that's an all, another awesome place to highlight and inspire kids about careers for their future. And so thank you for allowing me to go over time a little bit. I apologize, but I had a lot of comments this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Member Snively. And just so you know about the community schools, we are having a workshop, and Dr. Amy Ellis will be there. Uh, so we will get a lot of information on the uh, community schools. Member Combs. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate um, so many people talking about morale and how we can improve morale and what we need to do. I know even on a personal note, you know, this weekend my daughter came home and just was so upset because one of our favorite teachers left, decided to leave teaching, you know, and that is happening and, you know, and it does impact so many children. So how do we recruit teachers and how do we retain teachers and how do we make teachers realize how impactful and how they're appreciated so much. Um, and the other things I wanted to talk about is really, you know, as we talk about testing, the kind of impact that is having on our libraries. I know that many of our libraries have really not been opened all, all year when we talk about, you know, a push and we're doing so many things. If, if we could really focus on, you know, literacy and reading and keeping our libraries open, that would be really important. I also had a great Zoom this week with a counselor who is really trying to get some, some type of writing because, you know, it's, we are, we are really, really, our counselors are now really testing coordinators and they don't mind assisting, but they're sharpening pencils. They're doing a lot of things that we could have, you know, um, our secretaries or, or paraprofessionals or people helping because as we are more and more thinned out, you know, and the counselors, and we know that mental health is a huge issue. It was a huge issue prior to COVID and we're seeing more and more of that. So I would like to see a little bit off, more off the plates of counselors so that way they can work with children. And how do we have things that are just like counting booklets and things like that? We need to alleviate some of that to allow our counselors to have more time for that. Um, I want to thank, um, you know, I had a great Hispanic heritage going to Deer Park Elementary and reading to the kindergartners and first graders. Um, the book, you know, the time that Mr. Washington and I went and, and to the Gentleman's Quest, what a powerful organization that is. That book is now available to purchase on Amazon, and I will send a link. Um, they are, that organization is trying to have all those young men go to Washington, D.C., and each of them is trying to raise $545 to do that. Um, so that is so great to see so many people, so many children, and not not just the children, but all the support that they're having from the community to be able to do that, to impact that. And finally, you know, the highlight of my last couple of weeks and the highlight of being on the board is being out in the schools. Um, I'm really trying to either sub or co-teach at least once a month um, to give the teachers a little bit of a break and also to really experience what school is like. Um, I was able to experience a monthly lockdown drill at Hillsborough High School. I'd never been to Hillsborough High School to see that beautiful school and then to actually experience and co-teach uh, with Audrey Lewis. You saw her here this evening with her students. The one thing that you didn't see is the culture that is in that classroom. You know, it's it's about teaching kids, but it's also the entire time children were coming by to see her between classes and to check on her, the love and the commitment that she has. Just like so many other teachers, it's, it's something that when you see it and you experience it, you know that teachers aren't there for the money. They're dealing with so much, but they're impacting these children. So I did have a few pictures. Our, um, our uh, question was, how do businesses and people help make decisions. So what we did as a lesson was how do school board maker, school board members make decisions? So they made the decision about the mass mandate and believe it or not, 85% of them wanted to 
remove the mask mandate. We, we talked about policy with TikToks. We talked about lots of difficult decisions that we make as, as school board members, and they came up with some uh, really, some really creative decisions. So, um, Pablo, I know you have a few pictures of the class and the way they work together and, 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 and also Miss Lewis and her wonderful class, and I want to thank Miss King for allowing me out there as well. And lastly, just how amazing the 3DE program is. It was great to experience that. And also the AVID program, to see that the 3DE and AVID, and to see that kids are excited about learning, that it's hands-on, it's about decision-making. That is what's going to excite children, it's especially our young children who, you know, or maybe sometimes aren't motivated during these times. We need to have more hands-on activities, things that they can reflect. And I just want to thank Ms. Lewis and her class for a wonderful experience. Thank you, Member Combs. Uh, you've been very busy, that I know as well, in the classrooms. Thanks. Uh, Member Vaughn? Thank you, Member Gray. Um, as Member Snively mentioned, many of us were invited to go speak for Hispanic Heritage Month, read a book in different schools. I want to thank Mrs. Morgado um, for kind of uh, putting that all together. I was able to go to River Hills um, and participate in their dual language, one of their dual language classes, and read a great book. It was a wonderful experience, and I really appreciate that. Um, also, I want to talk about this being Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Um, that gives us an opportunity to celebrate people with Down syndrome and make others aware of their abilities and accomplishments. Um, I also want to talk about, I know we were just talking about the morale in our schools and, and um, Superintendent Davis mentioned that there is a survey out from CTA. Um, so if you are a teacher and you're able to access that, please go and um, access that survey that's open now. Um, also today is International Teachers Day, so <laughs> I know I know that it's hard right now, um, and our teachers uh, are dealing with a lot. Um, and you know, shout outs and and coffee isn't always you know the answer to to meet the problems and challenges that they have. But thank you so much for the work that you do um, in celebrating International Teachers Day. All of you know that you know education is my heart, and teachers and our school staff are, are the hearts of our schools. Um, and finally, I just kind of wanted to reflect on some of the conversation we had at our workshop this morning. Um, I kind of processed it throughout the day, and I know that we closed our workshop in talking about how, you know, we really need to attract uh, people to our schools and how are we going to be competitive and talking about asking our community for money when, you know, we haven't made ourselves competitive. But I just wanted to, to kind of recenter that conversation back to the fact that, you know, if we're being intentionally starved out by Tallahassee, if we don't have competing funds, if schools get PICO dollars that we don't, if there's advantages and legislations to charter schools, it's not really an honest conversation about how we can be competitive when there's an unfair advantage aimed at, you know, privatizing education, giving an advantage to charter schools, and, you know, starving out and destroying public education. So I would just appreciate if we go forward and have a conversation about being competitive to be realistic about kind of the the rules of the game that we're playing in that conversation because it's kind of you know it's kind of reciprocal if, if we don't get funding we can't be as competitive we can't offer as much support in our schools we can't have that technology people leave it, it's just reciprocal so I think we need to really start addressing and having a realistic conversation about one of the reasons why we can't be competitive um, but that's all and I appreciate all of it um, and uh, I cut it out at two minutes left with my time, so on to the next. Yeah. Okay, I'll be. Uh, nah, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna talk fast. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Well, we had the Black Male Leadership Organization, uh, led by Just Principal Kevin McDonald, 
Uh, the idea is to promote blacks into leadership positions. Um, this was our first meeting. We've been wanting this for a while, and Superintendent Davis did uh, take part, and we're, we're very thrilled. Uh, Shake Washington, board member of Washington, also has committed to this uh, improvement of more black leaders being involved in a leadership capacity, uh, females and males. So, and we had community folks there as well. Uh, and uh, big thanks to uh, Member Washington and uh, Superintendent Davis. Also, we had uh, Melissa Morgado, all of those wonderful school visits that we had during Hispanic uh, Heritage. Well, did we know that she was selected by Latino Times as one of Florida's top Latino le Latina leaders and will be recognized at an event which I haven't, I don't know yet, Monica, you may know, on October 17th. And she's saying, I am extremely proud to represent Hillsborough County Public Schools at the state level. So we, you know, we're moving the needles. Uh, we're moving the needle, and I say we, with the help of uh, Monica Vera Torado and the backing of our superintendent. Also, uh, my first walk to run clinic in preparation for the 5K, Gasparilla, and uh, all heels on women's shoes, such as who's next to me, have to be replaced by running shoes. But anyway, we're going to have the clinics, eight clinics, and it starts at Sly Middle this Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you, Dina Marshall from Humana. Thank you, Ashley Capucci, who is our athletic, uh, know everything about athletics and helps in every way. So that's happening this Saturday at Sly Middle School, and I hope the board members, I know you're all so busy, but just to give you a heads up, you'll, you'll get more stopwatch, or stopwatch uh, pressure soon. Mm -hmm. And then what else? Oh, we had one more. Da -da -da -da. So uh, a media specialist at Leto High School, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember her name, said to me to read this. Our football team won their first home game last Friday night in 10 years. <laughs> and it just happened to be, it happened to also be homecoming night. And because of this, our head football coach, Robert Spann, is up for the Buccaneers Coach of the Week. Right. And this week is unique because he is the only coach from Hillsborough County to be in the running. And it would be amazing if the district could help show him some love. So there, there we have it. Board members, I can't think of anything more to say. Thank you for your thoughts and all of your actions. Adjourn.